We'd been going to a local pool for six plus weeks for swimming lessons. This was the last week, and as soon as I had my 16th month old son dressed up, an old 70 plus year old lady walked in. She immediately, almost before turning the corner, said, How old is he? I love showing off my baby boy, but she was immediately creeping me out. She was standing less than a foot and a half from my face, and I couldn't back up. I was in a corner. In a monotone and low voice, she began asking all sorts of questions about him and how old he was. I answered vaguely and only gave as much information as I'd give any other stranger, his age and name. She then asked me when he was born, and I said August. She then said, I'm born in February, my mom in October, my dad in July, my brother in December. She continued with another brother and some grandkids as well, but I was frozen as those are the exact same birth months as my family, right down to each family member. She continued to ask me the same questions and tell me the same information over and over. At one point looking at my son and then me, she says in a dull and creepy voice, I'm sorry, I just want to take him and go. I don't respond to this. At this point I was starting to get my son's clothes wet because I'm in my bathing suit holding him freshly dressed. I'm getting a bit antsy and also freaked out. She looks at me and says in a monotone, slightly annoyed voice, I'm bothering you, aren't I? I say, no, I just need to get dressed. And she cuts me off. She begins to ask about my son's eye color. I start to say that they're blue and she cuts me off again. She asks what color am I? I then again start to say blue and she reaches to my face and uses her fingers to open my eye. She agrees that they are blue and looks back at my son. Thankfully she doesn't touch him but says, they are blue, just be happy they're not black. And then she gives a monotone laugh. All in all, she made me extremely uncomfortable. My son wasn't in danger and I'm the most passive person in the world. I just wasn't sure what to make of her at the time, so I remained as friendly as possible. But I stopped adding anything to the conversation after she listed off her family's birthdays that were the exact same as my family's. I don't know what to make of any of this. When I was 18, I moved to live with my dad. He lived in a basement level apartment in a pretty rundown small city. It's kind of notorious for being a dangerous place. I'd heard gunshots on occasion and passed by used syringes like they were cigarette butts. A lot of weird and creepy things happened to me and around me while I lived out there, but I'll stick to the one story that came to mind. I'd gotten into the habit of walking around town aimlessly. It was a means of occupying myself and exploring the sights. I could get cool pictures of graffiti, and since I wasn't in school or working at the time, it was its own means to an end, but there was one night where I strayed a bit too far and was coming up on the train tracks. There was a group of three of what I assumed were homeless looking individuals walking towards me. I meant to pass them trying to avoid eye contact, but when I looked up, I noticed the older woman in the middle of the two unkept looking men staring at me, looking at me dead in the eyes. This woman stopped and said my name. It was clear and almost friendly, but just creepy as hell. I kept walking instinctively, but I couldn't get it out of my head. I tried to make sense of it. Like maybe she said a word that sounds like my name, but I have a pretty unique name to begin with. The fact that she was staring at me. I don't know. It was like she knew me. It didn't help that the railroad was right next to the town cemetery. I'm a want to believe type of person, even though I usually don't. But that experience, as minor as it was, has chilled me to this day. Strange things were happening to me a lot when I lived in that city, and now that I'm removed from it, it is easier to write off. But a big part of me thinks there's something about that place that isn't entirely normal. A few years back, when I was 17 years old, I went to a party. Everything was alright until the host started getting really intense and creepy. By that point, it was around 3am and I was pretty drunk. 
I decided to call an Uber in order to avoid any advances from the insistent guy. The Uber shows up and I try to sober up when I get in. The driver starts making small talk with me, and in the state I was in, I failed to see the red flags. He starts to ask me about the party I was at. I told him about the creep, and he told me it was because I was short and cute. He then asked my age, and sensing a weird vibe from him, I told him I was a minor, thinking that would deter any further advances. But it turns out that that was a horrible idea. He was driving pretty recklessly on the highway, and I snapped out of my drunken stupor real fast. He then asked me to get drinks with him that same night. He told me he really liked me. I told him I'd be grounded if I stayed out any later than I was, that my mother was awake and waiting for me to get home. When we got to my address, I noticed that the doors were locked. He kept on insisting on us getting a drink, even though by now it was almost 4am. I tried to act as nice as possible when I told him I couldn't that night. He then asked for my phone number and said we could go out the next day. So not being the first time that some creep had asked for my number, I gave him my number but changed the last digit so he couldn't actually contact me. But then he actually dialed my phone as I was getting out of the car. Of course my phone didn't ring and he started getting agitated. He said I gave him the wrong number. I played drunk and stupid and recited my number again, but actually said it correctly in order for him to think he heard the last number wrong. He chuckled and said it was his bad. He said we'd see each other the next day. I made my way into my house and immediately woke my mom up because I was terrified. She managed to calm me down and told me to go to sleep, so I went into my bedroom and started putting my pajamas on when I heard my phone ringing. The Uber driver was trying to video call me, and I lost my shit when I saw that on my screen. I immediately declined the call, and I noticed he'd sent me 15 messages asking me what time he could pick me up, and why I wasn't replying. Of course I blocked him right away and thought that would be the end of it. The next day I get a text from an unknown number. I checked the picture and saw it was the driver. He asked me why I'd blocked him and started spamming me. I immediately blocked him again. Over the course of the next month, I get messages from random phone numbers. It became obvious that it was the driver. I would always block him, but eventually I reported him to the Uber app. I also changed my number. There is only one problem though. He knows where I live. In 2001, I was living with my dad and two brothers. We were in a small house my dad just purchased. One night, I heard glass breaking outside. So I jumped up and went out in the hallway to investigate. I looked out the bathroom window first. I didn't see anything. I didn't see anything out of our front door either. So I went to the kitchen to get a drink. None of the glasses were clean. So while I was washing one up, I looked out the back. And there he was. Some guy all in black and his hood was up, staring at the house. I froze up. I began crawling through the house, making sure everything was locked up. When I made it to the front window, there he was, face planted against the glass, peering inside. I was terrified. I screamed. My dad and older brother came barreling down the stairs with baseball bats. I told them what happened. When we looked out the front, our name plaque was on the porch, shattered. My dad called the police and they said this happened to the previous family several times. As far as I know, he never returned and my dad moved out in 2009. So I'm on Instagram pretty regularly. I mostly just post pictures of me or stuff related to me or what I'm doing. Anyway, a few months ago, this random guy I've never met before starts following me. Usually I don't care who follows me because my account is public. I'm a 17-year-old male, and this is a man roughly in his 50s, so it's obviously going to make me uncomfortable when he comments on every post. I looked at his account, and it's pretty normal. It was just pictures of him and other people. It started when he commented on one of my posts with a meme of a celebrity in it, and he said something like, I met that guy one time. I replied like I usually do with, Whoa, that's cool. Or something like that. He replied to that comment, talking about the same stuff. 
He continued to comment on my posts, and I don't post all that often. He wouldn't say weird stuff, it was just friendly. But it was recently I began to feel uncomfortable, and now it just won't stop. I don't remember when exactly, but he commented on a post saying, Hey, I replied to your story, but you don't follow me, so you can't see my DM. It's nothing creepy though. Now of course this looks creepy. I don't have any DMs from him as far as I can see. It's weird what he said though, because I get DMs from people who I don't know all the time. I didn't really want to be chatting with an older man that I don't know anything about because it just made me uncomfortable, so I didn't answer. I screenshotted the comment and sent it to my mom. She just said to delete it. So I did and went on with my life. It happened again on my next post. He said something like, You still can't see my DM because you don't follow me. Follow me and we can chat. I deleted this too because it was weird. I talked to my parents about it. They said I could block him, but to me, he doesn't seem to have done anything that bad yet. So I didn't. His next comment said something similar to the last, but also said something along the lines of, and you know by now it's nothing creepy. He continued to ask me to follow him. I didn't. I deleted this comment as well. Again he comments on an older post where I'd already deleted his previous comment. He was talking about my story I'd posted where I said for people to DM me if they wanted to help me out with something. He said, Regarding your story, people can't DM you unless you follow them. You know I'm not being creepy. Saying you're not being creepy and begging me to follow you so you can talk to me is creepy. It just is. It just gets worse from here. Every single post I make, he'll comment something like this. And every time I'll delete it. Then he comments again. He knows I'm deleting his comments and he's getting angry about it. I hesitated at first because I was scared he'd freak out and harass me more. I was worried about any new accounts he may make, but I blocked him. While I don't think him to be dangerous, it's always good to be safe. And so far, I have not heard from him since. About eight years ago, I stayed downtown. Back then, if you remember, Craigslist had a personal section. I never really dabbled in that, but being curious, I did. So I made an ad, nothing spectacular, and I waited. Not much went down, just some scammers and bots, married people, that kind of thing. I get this one message from a young woman, telling me how I sound interesting and would love to get to know me more. We exchanged photos. She exchanged an older picture, but she looked pretty cute in it. She had a bright smile and big blue eyes. She was nice. I just wasn't feeling her like that. She was 18, and I was 24 at the time. But also, she was 7 months pregnant. We enjoyed conversations for a few days, and we decided to link. She wasn't that far away from me. She was more on the northeast side, just on the edge of downtown. This day, there was a festival going on. I asked if she wanted to go, but she couldn't because her legs were tired and kind of sore. I agreed to meet her at her place. She stayed in a northern slum. Not ghetto, but slum. The house was big, but you could tell off the bat it used to be an apartment. It wasn't an appealing house, but then again, there weren't many other appealing ones either. When I told her I was outside, I see her come to the front porch. She was such a small thing, all of about five foot tall. White with dark hair, couldn't be any more than 90 to 110 pounds, and that was because of the pregnancy. Her baby bump was very noticeable. She had a small chocolate Labrador puppy with her. They both were happy to see me. When I got close to her, I was surprised. She didn't have the same bright smile I saw in her pictures. Her teeth were gray and her face looked like someone who was into heavy drugs. Her eyes still had light to them though, but overall she looked like a tired human being. I gave her a hug and made sure to watch my strength, and then we went into her place. There wasn't anything sketchy about it, but it did stink like animals and weed. We went upstairs and I saw a black couple up there. They shut their door and it seemed like they were arguing. All the rooms upstairs seemed to be small and the ceilings were slanted. Her room was fitted pretty nice. She was a smoker and I smelled the ashtray stench. 
We decided to watch the movie Pineapple Express. That was my first time seeing that movie. She complained about her legs a lot, and I did see some swelling on them, so I decided to give her legs a rub. I used her body lotion. She seemed pretty happy and appreciated it big time. We talked, and it was getting late. I wanted to catch some of the celebrations down in downtown. She looked like she enjoyed my company a lot, and as we were waving goodbye, for some reason I said to myself, Man, that chick seems troubled. I thought of burning sage when I got home. Two days later, she hit me up saying her ex-boyfriend got kicked out of his place. He needed somewhere to stay. She said that me and her hanging out couldn't happen again. I didn't really care. I just told her I understood. I wished her well, and that was that. I left to Chicago to spend time with family. I came back a week later, and after getting my hair retwisted, I saw a realty sign with her last name on it when I was out for a walk. She had a unique last name. I decided to check on her. I sent her an email. No response. About five minutes later, I opened up Facebook. As I scrolled, I immediately stopped. I saw the very picture she first sent me. Next to it was a link saying there was a triple homicide. I sat on the curb and was shocked. I couldn't believe it. I read the details and was shocked. She had met a guy on Craigslist for sex. Her ex met up with him too, supposedly. That man killed the ex-boyfriend and removed his head. He left his body at a park I was familiar with. He took her and held her captive in his basement. He tortured her for a week. What got me so pissed off was that he went to a sports bar down the street from me. He told the bartenders how he has someone locked up in his basement. Nobody took it seriously. No one called the police. That probably could have saved her. Her body was found in a suitcase. By then the police figured out it was him. He'd already made his escape by then and was on the run. When they stopped his car, he decided to take himself out. They probably found him because of the emails from Craigslist. I know they investigated my email. I deleted it immediately once I took all this in. About a month later, I was on Craigslist. I saw in the miscellaneous section about meeting scammers and such. I posted a reply about people being careful, and I posted her story. Also, around then, I had a guy I went to high school with who got caught robbing people for money on there. When I summarized her story, I got a reply. It was from a woman demanding to know what I know, and I came to find out it was her aunt. When I told her, she wanted to talk on the phone, so I did. I gave her my condolences and told her about the time we spent together. She told me her ex was pimping her out. Her life was never always like that. That her parents were good people and confused that she took that path in life. That girl was just a baby. I've been around death before, but nothing like that. Because what if I kept hanging out with her? The crazy part is, the guy had another woman in his place, but she escaped. She was living with him, and he made her some sort of a slave. He was supposed to fly to Vegas to meet a lady from a fetish site, but fortunately for her, there were complications on his end. The day he committed the murder, he contacted the lady and told her he wanted to meet ASAP. He was paying for the travel and everything, but she needed his info. She didn't go through with it, but she did look him up and happened to see his connection with a triple homicide. What's even more dark is that they didn't find her ex-boyfriend's head at the park, just the body. They found it up north of the city in 2019, 25 miles away. Why did this man take it so far? The awkward thing is, there was a lady who lived with me a year after that. Things were complicated and I had to kick her out. She moved into the exact room that woman was in. I know because I had to come over to give her some stuff she left. I used Craigslist for business and some social events. But after that, my approach became entirely different. And I became very cautious on who I met. In 2016, I just returned from my home state from college. I had gotten an awesome job as a store manager for a local boutique. I loved my job, and even though I had a really young crew 90% of the time, they worked hard. The store was inside of a mall, and we were on the top level. Lots of people used the mall for whatever. Walking, window shopping, hanging out, real shopping. I loved meeting new people, so I honestly enjoyed it. 
The night it started, I had my favorite two girls with me, who were 17 and 18. We will call them A and M. They only worked a few hours at night throughout the week, but they were so sweet and fun to be around. So the night started like any other. A was putting out new stock, M was helping a customer, and I was fixing up the denim wall. My phone rang and it was my mom, which was weird. She never bugs me during work hours. So I answered and asked what was going on. She replied and told me about how she just watched this news story about human trafficking and that it was taking place around the area of the mall. They'd caught a bunch of guys trying to force two girls into their trucks and that led them to finding four more girls at a house. She was just telling me she felt like she had to tell me right away so that I could keep an eye out but also watch out for my younger girls. I remember telling her thank you and I'll call her on my way to my car later. Not two hours later, A walks up to me and starts folding pants silently. She is never so silent, so I asked what's up. I thought maybe she didn't feel well. She looked at me and very quietly said, They won't quit staring. It's creeping me out. I looked in the direction she tipped her head to find a group of young men, likely late twenties, just standing outside the shop windows, staring, pointing, and talking to each other. I told her I'd keep an eye on them and thank you for telling me. To get both girls out of their eyesight, I sent them to clean up the stock and crew rooms in the back. I started doing nightly closing paperwork when one man came in. He looked around for a minute and came up to the checkout and asked me why I hadn't greeted him. I simply said I hadn't heard him come in and apologized. I then asked how I could help him. He ignored my question and asked where the other two girls were. I lied and said I sent one home and the other one was doing infantry in the back, that I'd be happy to help him with whatever he needed. He just stared at me for a minute before simply smiling. Never one to back down, I smiled back and told him if there wasn't anything he needed, I was going to have to ask him to leave as the time was now 9pm and I was closing up shop. He didn't move to leave, he instead looked down at my name tag. Now my name is Ren, pronounced like Ren the Bird. And what he did next creeped me out. It nearly made me sick. He looked me dead in the eyes, smiled and said, Aren't birds usually kept in cages? And then he said he would see me later, winked, and then left. I texted the girls to stay in the back and I called them all security. Luckily I knew one of the officers they sent and he was a good friend of mine. He came in the back door and I explained everything. I had him walk them out to their cars immediately, one at a time, and then he came back to get me. I was finishing paperwork. He was standing next to me when he told me not to look up. I asked why, not once stopping my work. He told me they were walking outside by the shop front again, and then they waved to the security officer. He told me to just finish up and he'd get me to my car. We were one of the last shops open, so I finished around 10pm. After I finished, the security officer walked me back out to my car. He told me to get in and lock my doors. He actually followed me out to the highway to make sure I wasn't followed. I learned later that two other officers had done the same for my girls. I talked to my mom the entire drive home. I got home safe and immediately called A&M. They were also safe and sound at home. I felt so much better knowing that. I told them they were going to take the next few days off that I'd sort something out at our sister store town over for the next few weeks. Next, I called my district manager and the other store manager. I explained to them what happened. I was sent to a different store as well, and it ended there luckily, but I have never been so creeped out and worried for my co-workers' lives as that night. It still makes me ill to think about it. I'd never disliked my name until then. So for a bit of backstory, I live in Sydney, Australia, and I was 15 at the time. I went to a local beach by myself and was just sitting on the sand tanning. I had a podcast going and Sony's on. The beach is probably about a kilometer long and I was in a quiet area. There was a group of two boys about 50 meters away from me, but that was about it. So as I'm lying there, this man walks over to me. He seems to be about 30 years old. He starts talking about how I look beautiful in my red bikini. He had a very thick accent. I said oh thanks and he sat down next to me. I had an immediate feeling that something was wrong. 
He starts talking about how he's a tourist and kept on trying to get to know me. I gave him some advice on bars around the area, but then he said, How do you know? Aren't you still in high school? So he obviously knew I was young. Anyway, this went on for about 20 minutes, and then he started asking, well, practically begging me to come over to his house for a few drinks. I kept saying no, I was looking for a way out. Suddenly this group of girls around 20 years old walks near me. I say to the man, Oh, that's my cousin Lisa. I immediately ran up to them and said, I'm only 15 and I don't know this man. I said you're my cousin. Immediately they gave me hugs and saying they haven't seen me in so long. They tell me to come sit with them and grab my bag and towel. The man immediately walks off. Honestly, I'm so thankful for the girls that caught on. The man was just extremely creepy constantly commenting on my looks whilst knowing I was young. Several years ago, I had just graduated from high school. I spent most of my time just running around with friends. My good friend Monica had moved to Columbus, Ohio, which was about a three-hour drive from my hometown in eastern Kentucky. My friends Mary, Carolyn and I decided late one night to make the trip to visit Monica. Mary had a 1990 Crown Victoria with the bench seat in front. This thing was a boat. We were all sitting up front together for the ride, just listening to music and being silly 18-year-old girls. About an hour and a half into the drive, we decided to stop at an all-night gas station to get coffee, cigarettes, and some gas. I got one of those gas station cappuccinos that comes out of the dispenser. We got back into the car and pulled out of the parking lot. The road we were traveling on was a four-lane highway with a grass median divider, so when we pulled out, we had to stop in the middle to wait for traffic to pass. It was while we were stopped there that I took my first sip of the most vile, disgusting cappuccino I'd ever tasted. I opened the door to pour it out. Suddenly Carolyn starts screaming for me to close the door. I look to my right. There's a guy who looks to be in his mid-twenties running as fast as he can towards my side of the car. I slam the door shut just as Mary peels out into traffic, leaving the guy standing there in the middle of the highway. We were terrified. We kept talking about it for several miles up the road. It was probably around 5.30am, so it was still pretty dark, and then we noticed headlights coming up fast behind us. We just knew it was the guy from the gas station. We tried speeding up, slowing down. He stayed right on our tail all the way into the next town. By this time, the sun was starting to come up. We stopped at a red light when this red Chevy S10 pickup pulls up next to us. Sure enough, it was the gas station creeper himself. He was a rather nice looking guy who looked like he was maybe going to work. He was wearing a white button up, looked really clean cut, but he had a crazy look in his eyes. Suddenly, he throws open his driver's side door. The white button-up was all he was wearing. This guy was bare-ass naked, messing around with himself in the truck at 6am in the morning on the highway. Well, being young girls, we were totally creeped out beyond measure. So we did what any young girls would do. We screamed, pointed, and started laughing at him. Then we made hand gestures to emphasize how small it was. That infuriated him. The light changed and we sped off. He turned at the light, and I don't know if he was embarrassed, or maybe he just really had to get to work. Either way, it was totally creepy. I'm a female. Back in 2013, I was 20 years old. I had recently moved to Australia with a friend. About a week after we moved over, we decided to go out in the city for some drinks. It got to like 1 or 2 a.m. and I had lost my friend, so I decided to leave. I left the club and went outside to look for a taxi. The man approached me and said his car was parked up the road and he could give me a lift home. He was around 30 years old with dark hair. Because I was young and dumb and had been drinking all night, I said, Sounds good, thanks. So we set off down the road to find his car. As we were walking, he was talking the whole time about his wife, work, and some other nonsense I can't really remember. 
At this point, we'd been walking for over 20 minutes, and he kept saying he wasn't entirely sure where he parked his car, but he was sure it was just up the road. He then mentions that his wife was at home waiting for him, but he mentioned earlier that he said she'd gone away for work. I suddenly sobered up and became aware I was with a strange man, someone that had been randomly waiting outside a club by himself. His stories weren't adding up. We had walked well away from the busy area, and now there was no one inside. I had no idea where I was and I was starting to freak out. He kept looking around us, checking to see where he parked his car, but I was starting to think that he was making sure we were alone. I was starting to panic. My heart was racing and I was getting some mad creepy vibes from this guy. What's about to happen? I start to pump myself up to make a run for it, and lo and behold a taxi turns down the street. I don't even say goodbye, I just run across the road. Thankfully, it slows down and lets me inside. As I was getting into the taxi, the man yells out that he can see his car down the road. I just slam the door and wave goodbye, telling the taxi driver to get out of there. So thankfully, I get home in one piece, still unsure if this man was a nice guy or not. But what normal married man hangs around clubs and offers intoxicated girls a ride home? It was a bit suspicious. I'm so grateful for the taxi arriving when it did because who knows what would have happened if it didn't. Okay, so this happened to my dad. When he was a teenager, he used to work at a mom and pop pharmacy that would deliver prescriptions to people that couldn't get out of the house. He normally had a route and saw the same people regularly. One day, at the end of his shift, he had a delivery kind of far out from where he would normally travel. At almost dark, he pulls up to a house and the screen door is open. There was one light on in the back of the house, so he knocks and hears someone yell from the back of the house to come in. He's already really creeped out because he says there's no furniture in the house, but the house is filled with deep freezers, wall to wall, but there was a tiny pathway to the back of the house which was to the kitchen. So he walks into the house and he said the carpet was so gross that his feet were sticking to it. He goes down the hallway to the kitchen and he doesn't see anyone. The money was on the table and he dropped the bag of medicine next to it. He went to nope out of there and when he turned around, he heard a loud raspy voice yell, Don't look in the freezers. So he ran out and told his boss he never wanted to go there again. He's told me this story since I was little and I've always wanted to know what was in those freezers. It was always really creepy to me growing up. He's even taken me by that house before. I'm a female. I used to go to a small university in my city where I worked as a bartender at the university bar. I also lived about five minutes away from campus, which was really convenient most of the time for naps between classes, but it lost its touch after this encounter. I usually worked day shifts on days I didn't have any classes, and my best friend, Dan, also worked with me there. We're really close, so he would hang out during my shift before relieving me most nights. I've known Dan for years, and although a sweetheart, he is often quite oblivious. One day, while Dan was sitting at the bar entertaining me during my shift, a guy sat next to him. The guy seemed normal, around my age, and wasn't bad looking either. He had blonde disheveled hair and pretty sculpted muscles. He had also clearly come from a construction site because he had work boots and a hard helmet hanging from his belt. This wasn't unusual because we did have a lot of construction near us, and most construction workers in the area were also students at the university. I struck up a conversation with him, going through all the customer service chit-chat that I was used to saying. When I was busy with another customer, he turned to Dan and started chatting with them. They seemed to get on quite well. However, I could tell every now and again that the guy kept sneaking glances at me, which was flattering the first couple of times and not uncommon as a female bartender. But the longer he did it, I realized there was something about him that was off when he looked at me. Rather than flirtatious, it was like he was watching me, watching exactly what I was doing, where I was going, how I walked, how I greeted people. It was like he was surveilling me, 
sizing me up even. This really set me off for obvious reasons, but also because I've dated a couple of abusive, controlling guys in the past, and their behavior seemed all too familiar. This is when he started to loop me in on him and Dan's conversation. He asked if we knew each other. Obvious answer, yes. We'd been joking with each other when he arrived. He then asked how we met, and kept asking personal questions about the two of us. I already saw his ramp up coming a mile away before he asked if we were dating. Dan left because we get that all the time. We're really close and comfortable with each other platonically. Dan, being his oblivious self, said no and that he was dating his girlfriend, but that I was single. I immediately saw a shift in demeanor from the guy, who then turned to me with a smile. Although a pretty ordinary response, it sent chills down my spine. Many people would just think he was happy to be able to flirt with me freely, but the look in his eyes was telling me he was pleased because he wanted me to himself. Now to take a step back. I know that seems like a slight overreaction, but trust me, I know that type of look. It was frightening as hell. After that, he started asking me personal questions specifically. I tried to go to other customers and act busy to avoid them. Sometimes Dan would answer for me, and I swear the dumb kid thought he was wingmanning for me. But God, was he wrong. So wrong. The guy asked me how old I was, what I was studying at school, where I was from, and all other kinds of normal but slightly invading questions as a stranger. Finally Dan got up to get on shift, which meant that mine was almost over. Because the guy didn't really do anything out of the norm, I didn't pull Dan aside. I just patiently waited until I could go have a beer far away from this guy. As Dan went to the back, the guy turned his sole attention to me. He asked me what kind of shows I liked to watch. I answered half-heartedly as I cleared behind the bar near him. Then suddenly I look up and saw that his face was inches from mine. He had leaned up onto the bar. I could literally smell him, that's how close he was to me. He then asked me if I lived alone. I did at that time, but there was no way in hell I was telling this creep that. So I gulped, shook my head, and said I lived with two roommates. I thought adding two bodies would deter him. He leaned back down onto his seat and hummed. I saw a gleam in his eye that left me convinced he knew I was lying. At this point I was shaking, which is really frustrating and unusual for me, because I often kept up a rather stoic appearance when it comes to creeps. He seemed to notice and smiled. Then, with a nod, he got up and put his jacket on. See you later, Gemma, he said, and then he left just in time for Dan to come out from the back. The bastard. Dan saw immediately how shaken I was and asked what was wrong. I could barely respond because the thing was, I never introduced myself to the guy. I'd forgotten to, and no one around had said my name. I know because I asked Dan if anyone had, but the guy knew my name. Unfortunately, this is not the end of the story. After that encounter, I was on high alert for about four days. Then I got busy with studying and life stuff. It went to the back of my mind, but that wasn't for long. Suddenly, I started seeing this guy everywhere. In the halls, near my classes, and at the bar. Coincident turned into obvious intent, and I was freaked out. My university was small, and there was very little for me to do to avoid it. My biggest worry was that he had seen the way I walked home, so I started to ask people to drive me even though I lived five minutes away. None of my friends minded because they're very solid, which I'm very thankful for. After about three weeks of this, I had started to tell my friends, who then started a sort of barrier around me. I was never alone outside of class, and I was always taken home by someone. I started to feel safer, and I had some other shit to deal with so the guy sort of left my mind for a bit again. During that time, I bought a pair of old school yellow vans because I'm a huge fan of retail therapy when I'm depressed or anxious. About four days later, I got the notice saying that they were out for delivery. I was pretty excited. I don't usually buzz delivery guys into my building and often just let them leave a notice so I can pick the package up, but I decided to buzz the guy in this one time. Immediate gratification or whatever. Anyway... I had work late and was dropped off home by a friend around 10pm. I was exhausted but still stoked to get my vans and have a small positive in my life. 
but when I rounded the corner to my door, my package was not there waiting for me. This was weird because they always bring your box to your door when it's a private courier. I shrugged it off, thinking maybe the delivery guy hadn't found my door number, or maybe delivered it to the wrong apartment. I unlocked my door, which seemed to stick a little, which was also weird, but I shrugged that off too. But when I opened my door, something immediately felt off. Nothing was out of place, but it did feel like it. I cautiously stepped into my apartment, gripping my keys between my fingers. My other hand was holding my phone tight just on the verge of pressing down my emergency call button. That's when I turned to the one thing that wasn't there when I left that morning. My package. It was sitting on my kitchen counter with a note next to it. I started to panic. I raced through my apartment, wielding my keys like a pair of claws. My apartment was small, so it was rather easy to sweep. No one was there. Just me, my vans, and the note. Going into survivor mode, I slammed my door, locked and bolted it. I stuck a chair under the handle for good measure. I checked every window to make sure they were locked, and that my patio door was as well, which was a sliding glass door. That's when I found the second thing out of place. The security bar I stick behind my patio door was under my couch. You would have had to have been crawling to find it. It was most definitely stuck behind my patio door when I left that morning. As you can imagine, this freaked me out even more. I was just glad the bar wasn't broken. I placed it back as tight as possible, and then went straight towards my kitchen counter, where the bastard had left my package. My package was open, and my first thought was, Hey, that's illegal. Right before I had reminded myself that the guy had literally broken into my home. My shoes were intact, basically untouched. Next to the box was a handwritten note on one of the sticky pads from my desk in the other room. It read, Small apartment for three people. Enjoy your vans. Now, I'd like to tell you that I called the police and that I got everything sorted out, but that's not how this story ends. In fact, all I did was cry the whole night and have around five panic attacks. The police really can't do much when the guy hasn't done anything malicious and there was no way for me to trace all this back to one guy I didn't even know and haven't seen since. However, the school term ended right after this. I didn't have to go to campus until September. I immediately moved in with my two sisters and brother-in-law, so he had very little ways to bother me after that. I honestly forgot this happened until just now. I remember that it did happen every so often, but I think for the most part that it happened long enough ago that my brain just doesn't actively remember it anymore. This happened when I was about 8, so mid-2000s. For context, I was a tall kid, always almost the tallest in my class, but I was very obviously young and definitely dressed like a kid. My usual go-to outfit was brightly colored t-shirts and a pair of neon orange shorts. In fact, I'm almost certain I was wearing some kind of variation of this outfit in this story. I also grew up in an upper middle class neighborhood in a fairly large city in the middle of America. The kind that has organic markets and coffee shops on the corner, where kids would roam the streets during the summer until almost dusk. I was, as a child. Very confident in going out by myself, I would often walk across town to visit my friends or down the street to the local Mickey D's by myself. So one afternoon, I decided to run down the street to grab some nuggets and fries on the way to visit a friend. I was walking down one of the main roads with my favorite plastic purple backpack, singing to myself and stopping occasionally to treat the parking spots of businesses as balance beams. I was passing by the neighborhood radio shack when I heard someone calling after me. I didn't even realize he was talking to me at first, but he was calling. Miss, excuse me, young lady. And even then, I didn't consider myself a lady by any stretch of the word. Finally, I turned around when I saw someone in the corner of my eye. There was a grown man approaching me. I knew he was a grown man. He was a mailman. I had never seen him before, nor did I ever see him again. His truck was parked nearby and he was in uniform. He walked up to me and 
too polite to walk away from a grown-up who'd address me specifically, and also feeling nervous I'd done something wrong without realizing, that I stopped to speak to him. Excuse me, miss, but I saw you a few streets over, and I thought you were just about the most beautiful young lady I'd ever seen in my life. I was wondering if I could take you to dinner sometime. Now keep in mind, to me, I was very clearly a child, not a grown-up. I was standing there with my long, messy hair and baby face, wearing brightly colored clothes, carrying a plastic purple backpack, trying to process what he just said to me. I don't remember exactly what I said, or if the conversation was longer, but I know it was somewhere along the lines of squeaking. No thanks. And then I hurried away as quickly as I could. He just stood there and watched me go. As I said previously, I never saw him again. I'm not sure why he decided to follow me like that, but I'm certainly glad he didn't carry on following me. I remember this event so often, even 15 years later, and to be honest, that was weird. He saw me a few streets away and followed me in his mail truck to ask me out. Even under normal circumstances, that's a little strange. So I work at a multi-billion dollar retail chain, and besides my main other department, which is also in the back room, there's a second department I'm cross-trained in that I work for a couple of hours each morning, and every Saturday accepting deliveries. Now I'm of average build, not overweight, but not as slender as I used to be. I have kids, so I have a bit of a mommy tummy that I've fought to get rid of for years. I think I look average, but I used to get a lot of attention back in the day from young men. That was around when I was in my 20s. I'm now in my mid-30s, and although I look a little younger, it's not by as much as it used to be. These days, the only guys eyeing me up are 10 plus years older than me. And yeah, usually not attractive either. I'm married and not looking for a replacement either. I love my husband. There's a good variety of delivery drivers who deliver to my store, and I know many of the regulars by name. Every now and then there's a new driver or a substitute driver for one of the companies, but for the most part it's the same people. So there's a regular driver who comes in every Saturday to deliver milk. We'll call him Mike. He's mid-fifties and nearing retirement age for the company he works for. He's friendly and cheerful and always greets everyone happily. He also loves making jokes. He even does the shave and a haircut two bits knock on our bay door when he arrives. I've always thought he was pretty cool and even said he was my favorite delivery driver since he's so nice. I think he may have gotten the wrong idea though. When I first started here, the other lady who used to substitute in the department warned me that Mike was a terrible flirt, that he'd like to try to get with all the ladies. I kind of shrugged it off. I didn't think it was a big deal. Over the past year, he said that I'm his favorite receiving person and that I'm beautiful. He has been very flirty and even asked me out on lunch dates. I have always declined and told him I'm married, but this hasn't deterred him in the least. He could care less about that. Mike has gotten friendly enough to even show me pictures and videos of trips he's been on and whatnot. Last week he showed me a video of the drive up his driveway and the views around his 300 acres of land. I thought that was rather odd. I mean, why show someone your driveway all of a sudden and then show off your land? What's his goal in this? He started calling me a nickname recently too, which no one had ever really called me, as it was something only my creeper dad had ever called me. Even my husband knows to steer clear of that nickname because it triggers me. It's an obvious nickname for my name, but no one uses it. Kinda like Mike is a nickname for Michael, or Kate for Caitlin. Well, yesterday, just before he left, he said something I wasn't expecting. Mike asked me if he could shrink wrap me and take me with him. I gave him a firm and immediate no. This immediately made me think of a murder that happened in my area before I moved out here, where a woman was saran wrapped by her boyfriend and dumped naked and saran wrapped on the side of the highway. The police were never able to connect the guy for the murder, though the locals knew he had done it. I was told he left the area after that. The more I think of his question, the more creeped out I get. I wonder if I should report it to management, or just tell him to cut the shit out next time I see him as a warning. My company prefers to tell harassers to stop before reporting an issue, 
but I'm not sure if this falls into that category, or is even creepy enough to be something I should report straight away. I took my manager aside and told her the situation. She agreed that it definitely wasn't appropriate. She wanted a written statement from me on the matter. Later on, I was told by my assistant manager that it was being handled by ethics, so not at the store level. I told her I was thinking of having my supervisor shadow me while the guy was there at the next delivery. Saturday morning came, though. I felt like shit and really didn't want to have to deal with him on top of already feeling tired, so I just called out. Some poor support manager had to deal with him instead. So later on, I did a statement and answered questions and whatnot, as my case is being investigated at store level again. I asked for any guarantee that they could keep me safe. None were given. The next Saturday rolls over, and I was anxious to get to work as I knew it was the day that the creepy guy delivers milk. The closer it got to 7.30am, the more nervous I got. Just before 7.30, I went down to my other work area on the opposite side of the back room. When I got down there, I discovered my supervisor wasn't there as I'd feared. My anxiety only grew. When I got back to my area, there were only a few merchandisers milling about. They were loading up their products onto carts and whatnot. I didn't see any other managers, including the one I'd spoken to earlier in the day. He confirmed to me he would be present and nearby to give me a sense of security. In a moment of desperation, I thought back to what a co-worker had told me previously, and that was to ask a female co-worker to stay with me and look out for me. So I asked one, and she said yes. We waited in the back room, distracting ourselves with meaningless tasks to pass the time. Before I knew it, half an hour went by, then an hour, then another half hour, no milk. I went to lunch and thanked my co-worker for humoring me and staying nearby. After lunch, I checked to see if the milk ever came, but it hadn't. I was pretty happy I didn't have to see him for another week at least. Then later, I was pulled into the office at the end of my shift. The manager told me that as of today, that man, Mike, is no longer permitted into our store. He can't deliver there or even shop there, so now they have to rearrange our delivery schedule for milk. I was just so relieved. I told the manager I felt good about that and thanked him for letting me know. It was like a weight had finally been lifted off of my chest. So my sister and I decided to order pizza tonight. We used the Domino's app that my sister has on her phone. She went to pick up her boyfriend while the pizza was going to be delivered, and I was to just get it once it was delivered and then pay the guy. About ten minutes later, I'm on my laptop doing homework, and then the doorbell rings. I get up, go to the door, pay for the pizza, and set it on the counter. I go back to working on the homework I had from my professor the next morning. Later that evening, I was having a bath. I finished up and started to dry my hair when my sister knocks on the door and asks to talk to me for a moment. I put on some new pajamas and go down to her room once my hair was dry. I ask her what's up. She then showed me a message that the pizza delivery boy sent her. It said, Hey, I delivered your pizza. I just wanted to say you looked really cute. I wish we could have chatted more. Now you may not understand why this is creepy on my end. This guy went out of his way to get the phone number of somebody he was delivering pizza to from an app order, and then sent them a text without the go from the person he was texting. He thought my sister, who ordered the pizza, was me. I stand at 4 foot 7 and I have a baby face. Yes, I am 18, but I still look like a child to people who don't know that. This guy who delivered the pizza was nearly an entire foot taller than me. He looked to be in his mid to late 20s. That was really creepy on my end. I just wanted some pizza. I was not looking for a porno-style hooker. When I was 16, I would nanny for two boys, Brandon and Randy. Randy had mental health problems because he was born with liquid in his brain or something. Either way, he was a sweetheart, but you could tell something was off by the way he walked and moved his hands. They had a dog, Gunner, and it was Nikita and Yellow Lab Mix. This dog was huge and protective. I watched the kids every other week all day Monday to Friday, 
Gunnar watched everything I did for the first week. I had to gain this dog's trust. The first week the dog made me uneasy, because if I was with the kids and they'd start being loud and rambunctious, he would get between me and the boys and start growling. Even if I wasn't playing with them and happened to be near them, Gunnar learned to trust me really quickly though. There were two times that Gunnar saved our lives. So the first time he did, the boys lived in a rough neighborhood. Not scary, just rough around the edges. We went for a walk to the playground a couple of blocks away and a white van slows down by us. There was a bunch of ghetto guys yelling at us from the window, saying inappropriate things to me and calling Randy horrible names about his condition. Just ignore them guys. I said in a hushed voice as I shifted to put myself and Gunner between the kids. Gunner didn't take his eyes off of the van. The tension put the fur on his back straight up, signaling to us that he was in protective mode. As the men kept yelling at us, I pulled my phone out and started dialing 911, but I couldn't hit send before Brandon started yelling back, defending his brother. And then everything happened so fast. The sliding back door to the van opened, and two men jumped out. Run, I remember screaming at the boys, just as Gunner ripped himself free from my grip on his leash. Everyone started running but me. The boys sprinted home, the dog sprinted towards the van. I frantically tried dialing 911. Gunner chased the men back in the van, nearly grabbing the leg of one man, and they sped off. Gunner received a lot of treats and praises when we returned home. And now for the second story. This one really freaks me out. I was allowed to have friends stop by since I practically lived there, and the boys liked hanging out with my wholesome teenage friends. If it was a male though, I'd have to go outside and hug them where Gunnar couldn't see, and then talk to them for a few minutes on the porch. Gunnar would assess them. Normally he let them inside without any trouble after that, but there was one friend he wouldn't let inside without coaxing. One day, a man came to the door, knocked and said he had something to drop off for their mom, who was supposedly expecting it. We could see through the window that he seemed like a gentleman and was very nice, but as I approached the door, Gunner cut me off. He started barking at the door insanely. His back stood higher than my hips and the dog just forced me back. Gunner literally prevented me from being able to reach the doorknob. He was gentle with me but forceful. I yelled back to the guy to leave whatever it was on the porch, but he seemed insistent, saying things like, Can you really not just unlock the door for a minute? Come on, Randy knows me. But I had to tell him I couldn't physically get past the door, so I could call the mom for him. The man got weird and was like, No, that's not necessary. I'll come back another time. And he rushed off. Anyway, the guy had some distinct features. And when I described him to the mother later, she informed me that she had no idea who he was. She wasn't expecting anything. We never found out who he was, and he never came back. So thanks, Gunner. So I'm watching my twin nieces, and the doorbell rings. There's a ring camera I can look through. And it's a man with his hood up. He had flowers in his hands. I call my sister because it seems weird. There's no company truck, nor is there a company label on his hoodie. He's driving around in a white jeep with tinted windows. My sister looks through the camera and is immediately uncomfortable. She tells me not to open the door. Of course I don't, but he rings the doorbell multiple times and knocks for several minutes. I can see him through the window but he's hunched over so I can't see his face. After five minutes of knocking and waiting, he starts to walk away, but then he sees me in the window. He walks across the street, still with the flowers, and then he knocks on my neighbor's door. He's there for only a moment before trying another door. He keeps looking back at my house and only spends a moment at the other houses. When he gets back to the car, he opens the back door and is obviously speaking with someone. He doesn't put the flowers inside, but keeps holding them. He talks to that person and keeps looking up at my house. After a minute or so, he gets back in his car, but instead of pulling forward to leave, he backs up. I can't see his license plate. He parks in front of a different house, maybe five houses back, 
and for another 10 minutes he's not moving. He then continues to back up until I can no longer see him. I don't know what that was, but it was super creepy. It obviously wasn't a flower delivery company. The fact that he was hooded the whole time, it wasn't a company car or uniform, that he had a second person waiting in the back seat, didn't leave the flowers like they would if it was a delivery guy, and then backed up to avoid showing his license plate tells me that something weird was up with this. A year ago, there were several attempted child kidnappings on the same street as well. So back when I was 16, my father and I used to live in the Hungarian Canadian Culture Center in Toronto, Canada. He was a live-in maintenance man. We lived in a two-bedroom apartment on the third floor. His job entailed opening, closing, setting up, and cleaning after events. This evening, however, they asked him to work security for a dance competition that was happening in our biggest function room. So here's what happened from my point of view. I was in the living room playing some game on my PC when this kid, 17 to 18 years old, just rips open the front door and barges into the living room, locking the door behind him. I was a pretty apathetic teen, so my brain went to logic immediately. I asked him who he was and what he was doing here. He stammers out, somebody's shooting down there. A cold flush went down my entire body because even though it's highly unlikely someone would shoot my father, He's still down there, and obviously I would worry about him most in the situation. Snapping back to reality, I'm thinking first I'll worry about my safety, and then my dad's. I look at the kid's hands. Nothing in them. Good. He runs off towards my room, no doubt looking for a way out. I already know there isn't any, so he opens a window, rips out the mosquito screen, and tries to climb out. I hear other people banging on the front door this kid locked, but I can't let him jump from the third floor either. I pull his ass back in and tell him something along the lines of, it's more likely that you'll survive the shooter in here than jumping out from the third floor. That finally calms him down a bit. I open the front door where there's 20 people that rush in panicking. After a few of them noticing that this is actually a residence, they herd everyone into the kitchen where everyone is on their phone crying, just shaken up calling the police, relatives, and any friends. A minute later, they come up and ask me where the nearest exit is. I told them, unfortunately, it's right where they came from, on the ground floor, just beside the function room. Things have died down by now, enough that they all make a break for it. I lock the doors with my keys and follow them down to go looking for my dad. I don't remember much from then on, but what I do remember is that the ambulance was already there trying to save the guy that got shot. My father was fine. He just got trampled by the panicking mob of people when he opened the emergency doors. I later heard what happened from him. Apparently they were announcing the winner for some competition when someone from the crowd fired three shots. They shot the winner in the head. I'm not sure what happened with the other two shots, but I know police were looking for the bullet in the attic the next day. For the next two weeks, there were police securing the function room day and night. I had to explain who I was every day so they would let me into my house. The guy who was shot died the next day in hospital. It's been more than 10 years, but I still look back every now and then, trying to find out if they found the shooter. And to the best of my knowledge, so far, they haven't. My dad's job requires him to go into people's houses. He's been in thousands of apartments and houses, so I asked him what was the weirdest or creepiest thing he ever saw or experienced. My dad arrived early at this apartment complex around 7am because he had to go through every apartment. He was doing some maintenance starting from the basement. He entered a laundry room located in the basement where there was a man around 50ish wearing a nice white shirt with a tie, suit pants but no shoes. He had a green tarp in his hands. He thought it was kind of weird, but ignored it since it's none of his business. Later that day, he left to a local coffee shop to spend his break, and when he went back to work, there were police cars surrounding the area. Out of curiosity, he asked one of the police officers what was going on. 
It turns out there was a murder. My dad then asked if what he saw was related to this crime, and yes, it was. After the police interrogation, they told him that the man without shoes stabbed his mother to death in his bathtub. He then wrapped her up in a tarp and dragged her outside. The police caught him dragging his dead mother in the backyard. Of course, they didn't let my dad do his job in the murderer's apartment until after a proper investigation. A while goes by and dad gets to go there. He finally finishes what he was doing. He felt really uncomfortable doing plumbing and other maintenance in a house where someone got brutally murdered, especially in a bathroom with a bathtub full of dried up blood. This happened one night at 2am. I lived in an apartment complex downtown that's also filled with lots of university students. The building also houses many of the non-university students on the top floor, where the penthouses are. For a bit of background information, I'm sort of a manager slash resident advisor for the university students that live in the building. There are three of us, and someone is on call every night with a central on-call phone to deal with any issues that students may have. I woke up at 2.20am to someone knocking on my door. I use knocking loosely here, as the person was kicking pounding and body slamming my door while trying to use the keypad to key in over and over. I quietly looked out of my people. I saw a man who seemed under the influence. At the time I was terrified things would get worse if he knew I was home, so I tried to be as quiet as possible. I grabbed a kitchen knife, went to my room and started calling the person on a call to help me, but he wasn't picking up. I called the person above him and told them the situation. They weren't sure what to do. They thought that maybe we had to call the city's police, but said she would call around and then call me back. I would have immediately called the police already, but the last three times I've called them for other issues as an RA here, I've had to go down and batch them into the building. I was terrified of having to unlock my door and go out, so I started calling everyone else I knew in the building. I called my friends, the other community managers and RAs, my supervisor, but no one was picking up. The person on area duty finally calls me back. She says the higher up just want to have an extra set of eyes on the situation, but she doesn't have a car. She wants me to wait until she can call an Uber. I'm terrified at this point and go back to my living room. I see that the bottom left corner of my door has been kicked in. The only thing keeping it from opening is the deadbolt. It's now 2.52 a.m. The guy pounding and trying to key in stops. So I look out my people and see one of the residents down the hall talking to this guy five minutes before leaving in the elevator. I wait a minute or two, and then come out of my apartment to knock on the resident's door. He told me he was just about to write me a note, because he thought I was probably inside, terrified. He apparently came out because the pounding was so loud and reverberating that he thought someone was at his door. The guy was trying to get into his girlfriend's apartment, and he didn't have his phone on him. Additionally, the passcode his girlfriend gave him wasn't working. My resident let him borrow his phone to call his girlfriend, and it turns out, she's directly a floor above me. The resident was always such a nice guy, he gave me his number in case anything happens in the future. The RA manager on duty finally comes over to my apartment at 3am, after duty finally got in touch with them. They saw the damage. I filled them in and we went upstairs to talk to the guy. The girlfriend opens the door and asks what we want. After asking to talk to her boyfriend, She's pretty adamant about not wanting to wake him up because he's exhausted. Okay. I show her the photos of the damage. She seems pretty upset. She tries waking him up to no avail, but we were pretty clear that we weren't leaving until we could talk to him. He finally gets up and says sorry because he had the wrong door. I showed him the photos and he denies that he caused damage. He said he only knocked pretty softly. His girlfriend in the back seemed pretty upset and disappointed in him. He snapped at her, saying, Well, what was I supposed to do? I didn't have my phone, and you didn't pick up earlier. Apparently, they just moved in on Sunday, and he didn't remember where the room was. The person on duty and I asked to see his ID, and we asked if we could take a picture. He agreed to it. We left, and I filed a maintenance request for the door. I wrote an email to my boss and the leasing manager. I also called the police to file a report. The police came 
I led them into the building and showed them the damage. I explained everything. They said it was probably an honest mistake. They gave me a case number to give to my leasing manager so they can bill for potential charges. They then went upstairs to talk to the boyfriend and girlfriend. I asked them if they could give me an update afterwards, but they told me it wasn't necessary and there wasn't anything else I needed to know. It was a terrifying experience, and I'm glad I'm alive. I thought I was honestly going to die. This had me pretty shaken up. In retrospect, I'm pretty worried for the girlfriend upstairs. This guy wasn't exhibiting normal behavior, even for someone intoxicated. I'm going to be extra cognizant of noises from upstairs. I'll be sure to call someone if it sounds like there's any instances of violence. This happened back in 2013 my first year of college. I had set up all afternoon classes, so I got to sleep in all of my first semester. I had been moved in for maybe three months or so, and I slept with earplugs in and my bedroom door closed, because I'm the lightest sleeper ever, and that trait in the city don't mix well. One morning I woke up. I noticed that the door to the hallway right across from my bed was open, and there was a scraggly man staring at me from the hall. Looking back, I'm not sure how I wasn't more scared. I was eerily emotionless, but that could have been due to me being half asleep. I took out my earplugs and the first thing the man asked was, Why are you here? Shouldn't you be in school? Then he started explaining to me that he was the maintenance man here to change the air vent filter. I was surprised because we never put in a request for this or anything. Still in bed and confused how my door had opened, I looked to my right and saw the dog cowering in the corner of my room. He was curled up in a ball and violently shaking. I've never seen an animal so scared in my life. I assumed that the dog had bursted into my room, and that's why my door was open. The maintenance man kept saying that he didn't hurt the dog, and that he didn't know why he was so scared, that he's just here to clean the vent. The dog was a medium-sized, very friendly Akita breed, but he also wasn't just scared of anyone. This seemed like bullshit to me. I was freaking out because I didn't know what he did to the dog at this point. The maintenance man kept insisting that he should get dog treats, asking where they were. I told him the dog didn't have any because I wanted him to leave. I should have just asked him to leave, but I was 18 and didn't know what to do. I was also a little creeped out. Despite my discouragement, he went away and came back with a treat. I don't know how he knew where they were because they were hidden under my kitchen sink. He tried to get the dog to eat the treat, which he didn't and eventually left. I tried to comfort the dog and then went into the rest of the house. I noticed in the hallway a puddle of dog pee and a baseball bat just laying there. Putting two and two together, I realized that the man must have used our baseball bat on the dog. That caused the dog to pee and that's when it proceeded to bust into my room. We took the dog to the vet and he showed some bruising on his back. My roommates and I reported the maintenance man to the apartment complex, and he did work there, but he was written up and not fired. He didn't come back to the apartment that year, however he did two years later after I moved out and tried to hit on my roommate. Classy. The dog ended up being fine, but he did have pretty bad behavioral problems after that incident. Well, it finally happened. As a side job, I refinish bathtubs for apartment complexes. It's great money and I pretty much make my own schedule. I get a list of units that need done and when, and I do them at my own leisure. I always feared early on that one day I would walk into an apartment with people just living their lives, embarrassing myself and scaring them. But after a while, you don't fear it anymore because it never happens until today. So after work for my full-time job, I have a unit that needs done. I was given the unit number, and I have a turnkey for the complex. It's not a master key, as the apartment complex changes the locks whenever someone moves out to a turnkey. So I get to the unit, and I'm working the turnkey. Now 80% of the time, I have to work to get the key to unlock the deadbolt. You know, the pull the key out just slightly deal. Well, it's not working. I'm really going at it with no luck. 
I can hear the neighbor's dog at the door, growling. Also, I figured maybe the maintenance guy didn't put the turnkey on, as it has happened before. So I call him. No answer. Because I'm not jiggling the key, it's really quiet. Just then I hear movement behind the door. Now I know what you're thinking because it's obvious. But dumb me says, Oh, it's probably the cleaning person who has her headphones in. As I make a habit of locking the door when I'm working, as I have my headphones in and don't want to be surprised, I go ahead and knock. The most scared young woman just cracks the door. Only then did it hit me. I couldn't apologize enough. But I realized the longer I stood there apologizing, the more uncomfortable she was. The entire time she didn't say a word, while I'm spewing word vomit about the wrong unit and that I'm so sorry. I believe I even said, I'm sorry, I bet you were really freaked out, but that makes sense why the key wasn't working. Looking back, I want to facepalm the entire situation, but I don't think there's anything I could have said to redeem myself in that moment. Even though it's not my fault. I still feel bad for how she must have felt. In the off chance she hears this, I really am sorry. I called the maintenance guy who apologized. It was Unit 20, not 22. There's a maintenance guy at the office building I work at. He was hired through the landlord of the building, not our company. We'll call him Bob. Bob is an older guy, maybe late 50s and a former heroin addict. But I say that because we're all pretty sure Bob still occasionally indulges in the habit. He is very socially awkward, and his mannerisms and way of speaking are strange. He talks really slow, pauses in places where pauses don't make sense, or trails off mid-sentence. He also gets really close when he talks to you and makes intense eye contact or he stares at me through our huge front window that happens to be in front of my desk. So overall, Bob is a mildly creepy guy. He has done some weird things in the past, like give me his personal number, bought a co-worker a $200 wedding gift and had it delivered to her. The staring at people through the window, and he gave me a toy riding horse thing for my son, the kind that's on springs and rocks back and forth. He also asks me personal questions about my marriage and he tried to ask me to go on a date with him. I also found my car door open and a bunch of my stuff, like paperwork and some perfume, and makeup I keep in my center console, all moved around once he was here. Today, he comes in the front office and just kind of stands there after saying hi. I ask my coworker if I can go out and have a smoke, and she says yes. I go and get in my car and kept the door cracked so I could smoke. I was parked under a covered carport outside the back door, across from the utility room. All of a sudden, Bob is standing there and kind of grabs the door and opens it a bit. I don't know where it came from, but I was listening to music so I wasn't really paying attention. I took my earphones out and looked at him like, what? He doesn't answer right away, and then he asks me if I can take him to the store. So A, he has a big white truck that he knows I know he has. B. He knows damn well I just can't up and leave while I'm working. I tell him that, and he goes, No, no, it's okay. I already asked your coworker, and she said okay. I ask him why he can't just drive himself. He sits there for a second, looking at me, and then he asks me to come help him with something in the utility room. I say no, and I need to get back before I get yelled at. He stared for a minute, and then smiles the creepiest smile. He says, No, you won't. They think you took me to the store. We have plenty of time. I don't know if I'm accurately conveying the creepy scary vibe he was putting off, but I was scared at this point. I didn't know what he wanted or what he was trying to accomplish, but it wasn't anything good. And on top of that, he wasn't moving out of my way. He was about six inches away from me. I tell him to move. He stands there for a few seconds and finally moves. I dialed 911 on my cell phone and jumped out of the car and ran inside. I thought he was going to grab me and push me into the utility room or something. I'm still shaken up about it. Oh, and he didn't ask my coworker anything about the store. He made that up. And then he left right after that whole thing.
Earlier today, about a minute after I just locked the door from bringing in groceries, I heard a very faint knock on our front door for a few seconds. I approached it to see who was there. I then heard the bottom lock unlock itself and the knob twist, but the deadlock kept the door in place. I had my hand on my concealed pistol while my heart was racing really fast. I looked outside and he just stood there, backed away, and then relocked the door and walked off. The person I saw was the same maintenance man who's been coming to our place the past month to do work, but every time he showed up it would be uninvited. He would never stop knocking as well as stand outside of our apartment for 15 minutes until confronted. When I told him he couldn't show up uninvited with zero notice, he smirked. Yesterday my mom caught him staring at her for an uncomfortable length of time while she was doing some car cleaning. Just why? This guy's been giving me massive creep vibes from day one, and now, unshockingly, he's trying to break in uninvited. I had just moved into an apartment complex. I only had a bed, a TV, a rocking chair, and an Xbox One. I work in a town that's an hour away, and they didn't have anything available that I could move into, so this big city that was the next closest place that was also in my price range. The first few weeks play out the same. I get up, shower, go to work for 10 hours, come home, eat, watch a bit of Netflix, go to sleep and repeat. On my days off, I travel three hours away to see my wife and kids. Now, we aren't divorced or separated. I had to relocate from the town we lived to start my career in asset protection as an APM. One night, as I was going through my evening routine, someone knocks on my door. It was a woman, maybe five foot seven, brown hair and skinny. She looked like she was methed out of her skull. Her eyes were barely even open. She asked to talk to someone named Jared. I told her no one lived here by that name. She said he did, that she was here last Thursday and he was here. She wanted to buy drugs from him and this was the address she was given. I, once again, told her no one named Jareth lived here and shut the door on her. She started banging on the door, crying how she needed a fix. I told her to fuck off. After a few moments, I heard someone yell at her to shut up or that they would call the cops. The banging stopped. I never saw her again. I sat back down to continue watching the movie I had on. I started thinking about what the woman had said. There's no way she could have been here last Thursday. I was off of work that day and Friday with my wife and kids. I started to look around more closely. Nothing seemed out of place. I checked all the windows. Nothing was cracked or broken. All the security bars were locked in their places. There were no upper attic spaces or crawl spaces. Nothing. I felt a bit more secure and went on about my night as usual. My next days off, I made sure everything was locked and nothing was out of place. I went to see my wife as usual. I told her what had happened. She suggested I take the pellet gun. Now I know. What would a pellet gun do? Well, in her thinking, it looked like a real gun. In the dark, no one can really tell the difference. Same for at a distance. Plus, it had a CO2 cartridge in it and 10 pallets, so I took it. When I got back, I looked around. Nothing was out of place. Nothing was missing. I put my stuff up as usual and turned my Xbox on. This is where I noticed something was off. When it powers on, it takes you to the home screen. On this screen, you can see the last things you were on, plus the previous things you've done. When I left at last, the Netflix app should have been the first one there, but it wasn't. Instead, it was Battlefield 1. The one before that was Mortal Kombat X. Someone had been using my Xbox. I once again did a thorough search of the apartment. Nothing. It was a couple of days after that that the guy across from me approached me while I was getting out of my vehicle. He said a lot of people were coming by the apartment on certain nights and making a lot of noise and that it kept his daughter up. He asked if I could keep it down or just stop doing whatever it was on those nights. I was confused. I must have shown it because his expression changed. He asked me if I was the one having people over at odd hours of the night. I told him no. I proceeded to tell him the things that were happening. I said I'm 200 miles away on my days off. We both came to the same conclusion. 
that someone was getting into my apartment when I wasn't there. I made the decision to not go see my family one week, to see if the person using my apartment would show up. Of course no one came that week or the week after. It dawned at me at work one day during a conversation about how shoplifters would try to see what vehicle you drove to know if you'd be there. That's when it hit me. Whoever was using my apartment knew what I drove. With that in mind, I waited till my next couple of days off to set my trap. On the said day, I parked my vehicle three complexes down and walked back. I unscrewed all of my light bulbs and waited in the corner of my living room. I let my neighbor know what I was doing in case of any trouble. I put my phone to its lowest brightness and had my camera ready, flash and all. I waited for six hours, which felt like forever, before it happened. I heard the front door knob jiggle. I got up, phone in hand and a pellet gun in the other. The door opened and someone entered. They shut the door behind them, and then I heard a click, and then another. They were trying to switch the lights on. I then saw a light from the doorway. They had their phone out and was making their way into the room I was in. As soon as they entered the doorway, I snapped a picture. The brightness of the flash caught him completely off guard. He was momentarily stunned, cursing at me, trying to make his way back to the front door. I yelled at him to get out and never return. He had reached into his pocket, dropping something as he pulled out a small pocket knife. I immediately raised a pallet gun and cocked the hammer. That stopped him completely. He dropped the knife opened the door and ran out. My neighbor, who had heard me yelling, was outside of his place when the man ran out. He saw me run out of my apartment, gun and all. He asked if I shot him. I told him no and it was a pallet gun, but the man didn't know. I went back to the door and retrieved the pocket knife, and what he dropped was a key, a key to my door. I don't know how he got it, but he had it. I showed the picture to my neighbor, he thought he recognized him, but wasn't sure. I stayed up late that night, calling my wife and telling her what happened. The next day, I went over to the complex office and told them what happened. I brought up the fact that he had a key to my door, and I wanted to know why he did. They weren't sure, and then I showed them the picture of the man. They knew right then how he had a key. Turns out that the person who was going into my apartment complex was a maintenance worker for them. He had been one of the ones renovating my apartment before I moved in. They are given keys and he must have made a copy of one. Then for nights at a time, he would use it to do whatever he did. I must have put a hamper in his nightly business when I moved in. That is, until he figured out my routine. The man was, of course, fired from his job. He was prohibited from entering the grounds again. I was given three months rent free. I never pressed charges and let it go. I have a real gun now, just in case. My neighbor and I struck up a friendship. We now watch each other's places when we're out of town. Hopefully this never happens again to anyone else. And yes, I had the locks changed, in case you're wondering. I grew up in a third world country in South America, Peru. Living in places like these means constantly fearing for your life each second you're outside of your home, and sometimes even when you're inside of it. It must have been 10 at the time, and they were doing a maintenance check on my apartment building. One night, a man knocked on my door dressed in workers' clothes, no different from the men working on the rest of the building, but it was after the usual work hours. My father opened the door without thinking much of it, and then the man came in. He said his name was Jose. I'll never forget the feeling of uneasiness he gave me, but I brushed it off because my parents are always right. He went into the kitchen with both of my parents while I played on my Nintendo in the living room. The man came into the living room alone and started trying to tie me up with some rope. I knew immediately what was happening and started kicking, screaming, and fighting back, but it was no use. The man was a burglar in disguise, preferring deception over stealth. He then knocked me out and tied my parents up before doing it to me. He stole all of our valuables to his heart's content. He couldn't take large things that would make him look suspicious as he left, so he took jewelry, decorations, small paintings, and my Nintendo with all my games. 
My dad was the first to wake up the next morning. He freed himself before untying my mother and I. We called the police, but being the useless Peruvian police, nothing came of it. They never caught him. We moved away soon after and haven't thought of going back for over 10 years. I was involved in two encounters that scared the life out of me. The first one is pretty short. In 2011, I had graduated from university and I fell into light depression. Naturally, I would wake up later than the rest of the household, and given that my room was the loft conversion, any morning noise did not interfere with my sleep. One such morning at around 10 a.m., I lightly awoke to some shuffling. I thought it was probably the birds perched on the roof. I went back to sleep. However, 20 minutes or so later, some light noise disrupted my sleep again. When I looked in the direction of the noise, I saw two blurry faces in the distance, holding the bathroom door ajar. I realized they saw me too. I couldn't do anything but freeze. Before I knew it, I heard hurried shuffling followed by two bangs, which means they jumped onto the extension in the garden. I remained frozen in bed like a popsicle until it all died down. Ten minutes later, I checked the ensuite and saw footprints all over the toilet seat, which is just below the windowsill. Bear in mind the window is so tiny and you really need to be a contortionist to fit in there, so how they got in is a mystery to me. Since then, that window remains closed. Several years later in 2017, I saw one of my neighbors walking her dog. I had never spoken to her before, so I expected an awkward situation until we moved directions. But it came to pass that she was taking the same route that I was. We got to talking and she started telling me how she loves art house movies. This delighted me because I never got to meet people like that in real life. So we exchanged numbers in order that we can recommend movies to each other. For a whole week, we were texting about our favorite movies, scenes, and directors. Then one night, she called me. I thought it was unusual since we're not cordial enough for a phone call. I answered, hello, but I heard nothing other than static. I repeated a few times and heard nothing but static and shuffling. After about two minutes, I put the phone down and thought she had pocket dialed me. Then she called me again. This time she was whispering. I told her I couldn't hear a few times. This happened at least four times within five minutes. I really didn't think anything of it. On the fifth try, I finally heard her, but it was not something anyone wants to hear. There are people in the house. I'm alone under my bed. Call the police. I thought she was joking, but quickly realized we aren't that close for her to think she can play such pranks on me. I told her to remain on the phone, my heart racing. I rushed to the window so I can see her house. To my shock, I saw two flailings like two lightsabers on the bottom floor. She was breathing heavily over the phone. I asked her what room she was in. She said it was the one facing the street, just above the front door. She reached for the tall curtains from underneath the bed and started to lightly shake them. I got her signal. She stayed on the phone. I immediately called the police and explained the situation. They said a few units were on their way post-haste. I knew the cops would make it in time. For the last few months, I took up a casual delivery role with Just Eat. Just Eat's a food delivery service like Uber Eats. So knowing that knocking on the door to spook the intruders could put me at risk, given that they may see my face, I put on my earphones, some stuff in a bag to make it look like a package, my helmet, and then I hopped on the motorcycle located in the garage behind my house. I also covered the number plates with black tape. I made it look like I was delivering something. I went all around the street and accelerated towards the property. In the meantime, I told my neighbor not to speak and that I will walk her through everything I'm doing. I'm gonna ring the buzzer, I said to her. My heart was beating so fast that I felt faint when my hand touched the buzzer. I cannot describe how difficult it was for me to press it. It was as if I was lifting double my body weight. Now, I'm thinking any real criminal would run away but not these guys. I didn't hear anything, but I saw the torches turn off. I rang again. Nothing. 
No noise, no shuffling, nothing that would make one think someone was trying to escape. All I heard was her breathing. I saw a half-broken brick on top of the bin, so I pushed the brick next to my feet, just in case I had to use it. Then, suddenly, I became brave. I pressed the buzzer again, but this time I yelled, Delivery for number 22. I heard some footsteps, so I repeated it. A husky voice from the other side of the door said, Number 22 is next door. My heart almost stopped. My brain began to scatter and I stammered, uh, Sorry, sir. Then I heard the most beautiful noise in the world. Sirens. I'm not the greatest fan of cops, but that sound made me feel safe for the first time ever. It was like hearing Frank Ocean's nights for the first time. That is when the fear which the criminals in my house had the courtesy of possessing became vocal. Hurrying movements and shuffling radiated from the house. I heard a door from a distance swing open, followed by rushing footsteps implicative of running. As the footsteps joined into the unified sound of a whole city, sirens flushed out all the noise. I had to remain silent and alert. With the cops in front of the house now, I took off my helmet. The cop asked me if I was the one who called, and I said yes. Is she still in there? Yes, I replied. They surrounded the house and knocked on the door. Nobody answered. The cops told me to ask her to remain in the house. Another cop then radioed in, saying the back door was open. The garden window smashed. They said they were going in. After searching the house, they found her underneath the bed, safe. A few cops went on to search for the suspect. But because my area is full of lakes, ponds, rivers, thickets, and marshes, and intertwined with residential properties, it was difficult to find them. I went back to put my bike in the garage. When I came back, she looked visibly shaken, but also happy. She thanked me, and I was happy she was fine. They didn't take anything, as a bag and some valuables were found scattered in the garden. They probably felt the infantry was too heavy for them to make a swift escape. This whole ordeal lasted longer than the time it took me to write this, but I'm happy I finally put it on the proverbial paper. Why now? I was reminded when two police officers knocked on the door to inform me that the suspects had finally been caught. They had used the footprints from my bathroom and DNA from hers to identify them. The robbers were caught in the act and charged with two previous attempted break-ins, for the one at mine and hers. I guess the thieves were still laymen when they had attempted to break into my room and were easily irked. Not so much the second time around. This happened in late 2015. I was working as a graphic designer for a very small startup company in rural New York State. There were just four of us in a rented building the owner shared with a computer repair shop. I'd been there maybe a month and worked closely with the web programmer. He was a young fella, around 23 and the gentle giant type. Tall, husky and muscular with tattoos and a shaved head, but super sweet and laid back. We'd often take smoke breaks and shoot the shit. I didn't know much about his home life other than he just moved in with his new girlfriend. She usually picked him up after work. But if she worked late, he had to walk home by himself along the highway in the dark. When we found this out, the boss immediately started offering him lifts. I wondered what his situation was. Lost car or license or something. But I didn't want to put him on the spot to ask. He was kind of shy. Anyway, time passes and one day the boss wasn't in to offer to drive him home. His rental is a small house behind a boarded up car wash in the boonies. You had to drive down a short dark, private road to get to it. You would never have known the place existed were you just driving by it. We shoot the shit for a minute in the car and finish our smokes. I tell him I'll see him tomorrow, and that's when it got weird. He looked at the house for several seconds, quiet, not moving to open the door at all. He said, yeah, in this strange, resigned voice, then slowly turned his head to look at me. Now you have to realize, in real life, people almost never slowly turn their heads to look at you. You can't imagine how creepy it is until someone actually does it to you. And the fact that you're a 120 pound woman and he's a huge guy, in a parked car behind an abandoned car wash, 
in the pitch black with no other house in sight. This was not the look a guy gives you, say, after a first date when he wants to kiss. It was so off, and not an awkward or shy kind of off. He looked at me in the kind of way you look in your cupboard when you can't decide what to eat, or if you should be eating anything at all. His mouth was slightly open. He was staring me straight in the face with a slight squint, as if struggling hard to figure something out. Yet it was me who was the thing. That sudden shift of being looked at like a thing, and not the amiable co-worker he'd been laughing, bullshitting with, and getting to know over the past month, that scared the shit out of me. In less than a minute, he'd gone from his normal self into a state of tense, disassociated slow motion. He actually looked bigger to me as well. I asked if he was okay, and after maybe 15 long seconds, he looked back at the house. Either sighed or gave another resigned, yeah, and he finally got out of the car. Needless to say, I did not plan on giving him any more rides, but a week later, it didn't matter. He used a shotgun to kill himself on the front porch of that rental house. His poor girlfriend was inside, waiting for him to finish his cigarette. It was then, from his family, that we finally got the backstory. He'd been a newly sobered alcoholic, with DUIs from earlier in the year that explained the no-car situation. He'd also had several serious injuries from car wrecks and blackouts over the years, the last actually resulting in two small permanent dents in his skull. The buildup of brain injuries had done far more damage than sobriety could reverse. His girlfriend admitted that ever since his last accident, He'd had intrusive, violent fantasies and impulses of hurting others and himself. You can imagine where my mind went after hearing that. It's certainly my creepiest personal experience, though when I think of it today, all I can feel is sorrow for this poor kid who barely started his life, in the end strong enough to fight the demons demanding others' lives, but not his own. News about child abductions have become more frequent in my country, so this has led to an old encounter my mom reminded me of from when I was a wee lass. This happened when I was about five or six years old. My mother was a dealer for Coca-Cola at the time in the rural regions of my city, so that meant she and her fellow employees would be delivering crates of Coke to little villages in the boonies regularly. On this particular day, no deliveries were scheduled. Anything that was to be delivered was done so we were all hanging out at the warehouse. My mom figured since it was the end of the week, let's all go on a little road trip with the crew. Everyone agreed, and one of the crew suggested we go see this new inland resort a couple of towns over. It was nothing fancy, just a large area with a few ponds. A pond where you can catch your own catfish for meals and bamboo huts along the side. We all get in the truck and off we go. We arrive sometime in the early afternoon, and my mom is telling members of the crew what to do. One books a hut, one gets our stuff in order, and someone to keep an eye on me. While I look around, but never wandering too far, I see this older lady, maybe 40s to 50s, looking at me. I was a friendly kid, so I waved and smiled. She just stared at me, so I told the crew member who was looking after me, who in turn told my mom. She informed everyone to watch out for her, and to make sure someone always had eyes on me. We proceeded on merrymaking. I'm swimming in the pool, my mom and crew having a few drinks and eating catfish. This dragged on till maybe 6 or 7 p.m. I stayed in the pool the majority of the time and would just come up for a bite or a drink of soda. But on my last attempt to jump in, I see at the far end of the pool the same old lady. I immediately tell my mom who looks in her direction and tells everyone we're packing up and going back to the warehouse. We get back and my mom requested that three of the guys stay the night at the old house, and if they could stay up one at a time just to be safe. Sometime in the middle of the night, I get woken up by my mom telling me to be quiet and follow her to one of the bedrooms. She said to leave my slippers so we don't make any noise. I ask why, and she pointed outside onto the other side of the gate, and there was the same lady. She insisted I go to one of the rooms in the back of the house and stay there till she gets me. I follow her, and then I hear her wake up the crew. I hear them leave the house and confront the lady by the gate. 
asking questions like, who are you? What do you want? Why did you follow us? But my mom just said she glared at them while mumbling, and every now and then she would crane her neck, looking past them as if to look out for someone. She eventually leaves, and in the morning I'm taken back to the city to my actual house, while my mom went back to the town to continue a job. She informed the local authorities of the lady. I never saw that woman again, and it's been 20 years. Seventeen or so years ago, I worked IT for the large local hospital in my city. We also provided IT services to seven other smaller hospitals in towns across the whole of our county and the neighboring county. My job was to build, install, and fix computers, and provide support to 6,000 users. It was an incredibly stressful job, made even worse because I was the only person on the IT staff who lived in the city where the main hospital was, so I was often on call after business hours too. When I began there, I was straight out of university and very, very young. I had graduated high school much younger than most kids do. I was also very shy and rather anxious. While I was unquestionably geeky and awkward, I was still young and reasonably cute. I would never have been called beautiful, as I was plain and a bit overweight, but I was cute. I dress in loose, baggy masculine clothing, and I never wear makeup at all despite being female, as I have sensory problems that make fitted clothing and the oily feel and scent of cosmetics very hard to tolerate. So yeah, not exactly a runway model. I was in my very early 20s when this happened, but my shyness and immature social skills made me seem more like a young teen than an adult. I'm also asexual, so I choose not to date. The hospital where I worked was going through some repairs and upgrades, one of these being the replacement of the antiquated HVAC system in the main building on the hospital campus. They brought in a major company to assess the hospital's needs, choose an appropriate system, and install it. This meant that one of the representatives from that company would be present at the hospital daily. He was given an office beside the one that belonged to the head of hospital maintenance, and I was directed to get him a computer and set him up on the network. When I got to this office and began installing the computer, things started getting weird. This was the first time I'd ever met the man, and we'll call him Andrew. This guy was at least 20 years older than I was, rather reedy looking due to being very tall and quite thin and average in appearance. Your typical, forgettable middle-aged man, but he would not take his eyes off of me. Being autistic, I'm naturally very uncomfortable with eye contact, especially the prolonged sort. This man was just openly staring at me as I worked. He introduced himself and began asking me innocent work-related questions, but these soon morphed into very personal inquiries that had nothing to do with work, like asking where I lived, whether I had a boyfriend, that sort of thing. I told him that I lived in the same city as the hospital, but not exactly where. I actually lived right across the road from the hospital, but I did not want him knowing that. I lied and told him I had a long-term boyfriend too. Any questions that veered in the direction of dating or romance got a curt, uninviting, bald-faced lie as an answer. I was getting very uncomfortable at this point, but I didn't react as I would now. Nowadays, I would tell a guy asking that sort of questions that it was none of his damn business, and then inform him that he was being inappropriate, that I wanted it to stop or I would complain to HR. But back then, I was very uncertain, petrified of confrontation. I was afraid to make any sort of complaint about anything, so I just kept working. I ended up having to sit down at his desk to install the correct software access, and while I was seated, he walked up right behind me, I thought to myself, he's just watching what I'm doing to access the program he needs. No. He put his hands on my shoulders and began to massage them. I froze, stiffening up. You're stiff as a board, he said, as he kept kneading my shoulders, all full of knots. Yeah, well, if I hadn't already been tense and bothered by his intrusive questions, I most certainly was after he began touching me. It's very common for autistic people to deeply dislike being touched. I tried to squirm out of his grasp, afraid to tell him to stop directly, 
As we were in a rather secluded, untraveled part of the hospital's basement, I was afraid to make a scene and anger him. I hurried through getting everything done, told him to call our help desk if he needed any other help, and practically ran out of his office. I should have told HR right then and there, but I didn't. It was creepy, yeah, but I didn't think HR would be any help. It was so borderline, I thought. It was just treading the edge of inappropriate. I did tell my boss that Andrew made me uncomfortable, but my boss forgot about it nearly immediately. Now fast forward a couple of weeks. I was working in the medical imaging department, installing some terminals in the CT scan suite. I was visible from the hallway. Andrew passed, walking with two men from building maintenance. As soon as he saw me, he began loudly telling his companions that I was cute, pretty, sexy, smart, that kind of thing. He was laying it on thick. He walked past again and again, loudly praising me and saying he wanted to date me every time he went by. Ugh. The two men he was walking with knew me a bit and I could tell they were bothered and embarrassed by this guy's inappropriate behavior. Finally, I finished up and ran back to the safety of my own department. Another week passed by, and I was heading home late. I was using the underground tunnel between the main building and the smaller one, used solely for administrative offices. It's a long tunnel passing below a busy road, and I often took this route going home, as the smaller building was very close to my apartment complex. I heard someone call my name and turned to find Andrew hurrying up to catch me. It was after hours. The corridor was otherwise totally empty. I did not want him to find out that I lived right beside the hospital. I turned and ran, hearing him call my name over and over again. Being younger, I was faster, and I'd managed to find a good hiding spot inside the administrative building without him knowing where I'd gone. I'd hidden myself in a network hub closet behind the tall rack of networking equipment. I locked the door behind me, thankfully, as I heard him walk up the hallway trying the doorknobs of locked offices, calling my name as he proceeded. He jiggled the doorknob of the room I was in as he went by. I remained there, silent and still, long after I heard his last yell. After I was sure he had gone, I snuck out and raced home. Things calmed down for a bit after that. A few months went by without me having any contact with him, though I did still see him around the halls of the hospital more often than I thought. I vaguely wondered if he was trying to follow me, but there was nothing conclusive enough to prove it one way or the other. Then came the scariest part. I was working in a part of the hospital that had patient rooms, but they were being remade into offices. I had to pull network drops into these offices to allow computers to access the network. I lost track of time while I worked and the other people working there with me, the painters and the men setting up the new desks. They all went home without me noticing. Eventually, I was completely alone. When I had happened to glance at my watch, it was almost 6.30 in the evening. I usually left at 5.30. I packed up my tools and left the room where I'd been working. I stepped out into the long hallway, tired and thinking about what I would make for supper. I hadn't gone very far when I heard footsteps approaching and looked up. There was Andrew, hurriedly walking towards me. I hoped that if I switched to the other side of the hallway, he'd rush past as he did seem to be hurrying up. No such luck. He veered over to me, grabbed me hard by my biceps, and forced me up against the wall. He then proceeded to pin me there with his whole body while he touched me, easily pushing away my hands as I punched and slapped trying to get him off me. For a thin man, he was surprisingly strong. He leaned down so that his face was close to mine, and I thought in horror, oh god no, he's gonna kiss me. So I twisted my neck, turned my face as far from his fetid breath as possible. Instead he growled into my ear. Normal girls like it when a guy wants them. Normal girls let guys date them. All the while I was yelling, no. Finally, my brain got itself out of freeze mode and I became angry. I shoved him hard, and once I had enough space to make the move, I kneed him hard in the groin. He doubled over, wheezing and moaning. I ran and locked myself into one of the rooms I'd been working in. The doors were solid hardwood and the locks were strong, so I knew I would be safe. 
Despite him starting to pound and kick at the door, only one problem, I had no way to call for help. I didn't carry the on-call phone during the day. I didn't own my own mobile phone, and none of the rooms that were being renovated into offices had telephones installed yet. I was trapped. My only way to call for help would be opening the window and yelling out. Meanwhile, Andrew continued pounding and kicking the locked door, screaming insults and entreaties. Five minutes passed, then ten, and he was still beating and battering the door, slamming hard against it with his full weight. I began to fear I might be trapped there all night, with him on the other side of the door, trying to break in. I don't know what finally made him give up. Maybe he heard someone approaching or something. Suddenly, the yelling and banging at the door stopped completely, and I was left in breathless silence. I remained there, listening at the door, trying to detect the telltale rustle of clothing or squeak of a shoe. Something or anything that would tell me that he was still waiting there for me to open the door. But it was nothing. Just sweet, lovely, safe silence. I slowly undid the lock, and then inched the door open and peered out. No one. He was gone. I knew he might be hiding out of my view in another office, but I had to do something. I couldn't just hole up in an office for the next 14 hours or so. Knowing it was a risk, I bolted for the stairwell and raced down to my department. I felt safe there, as my workspace was in the code access controlled server room, and only my co-workers and I knew the combination needed to get in. Only one person was still in the department, the woman who handled the help desk calls. I began to cry the second I saw her. She frantically asked what was wrong. She held my hands as I told her what happened. She was the one who convinced me to report Andrew to HR. I knew HR would be empty at that hour, so I sent an email rather than calling. I then went home and became a little ball of tears, worry, anxiety, and horrified nausea. I called sick the next day. The HR staff called me at home that afternoon. I reiterated all I told them in my email, how he'd been kind of inappropriate from day one, and about how things escalated so horribly. The HR director asked me to come in and write out a formal complaint for him. I did. Because Andrew didn't work directly for the hospital itself, it was difficult for HR to handle this, I guess. They did contact the company he worked for, but he was not fired or even transferred to some other client site. He was given a tiny slap on the wrist and told never to come near me or attempt to communicate with me in any way. I still had to see that bastard at work every day. I felt very unsafe when my tasks took me away from busy areas. This added to the stress of the job and I began to suffer from stress-related medical problems like migraines, depression and anxiety. I felt very unsupported and unprotected by HR too. About 18 months after that event, I quit that job. So Andrew, I hope your nasty ass is in jail. The creepiest thing just happened to me. I'm a 20 year old female. I was laying in bed scrolling through TikTok after a long day of work. As I was scrolling, I noticed breakthrough sounds that were not part of the original audio. I confirmed this by scrolling away and scrolling back to the videos and realizing the sound wasn't there anymore. It started as little blips that I assumed were caused by our shitty download speeds. As I kept scrolling, I started hearing more and more until one entire video's audio was completely covered by what sounded like listening to TV over the phone. I got creeped out and paused the video, but the sound continued. I could hear someone breathing and eating what sounded like potato chips through my phone. I immediately covered my camera. The TV and eating sound stopped. I was left with that static you can hear when someone's silent on the other side of the phone. When I uncovered my camera, the chips quietly returned. I covered my camera again, and after sitting in two full minutes of phone static, I asked, Hello? There was a short, low sound that I assumed to be a grunt and the phone static ended. I panicked, closed all my apps and turned my phone off. Now I have tape covering my camera and I just bought a VPN. I know it's virtually impossible for the iPhone camera to be hacked, but I'm still freaked out. 
This is probably the scariest event of my life. So when I was nine years old, I lived in Mexico, and let's just say it wasn't a particularly peaceful year when it came to crime. At that point I was living just with my mom and my child at home up the mountains near a forest, which, full disclosure, I absolutely loved my home since I was a big fan of nature. One night I woke up from an absolutely horrible nightmare. I quickly made my way to my mom's room to wake her up because I was so panicked. After I stopped crying, I got into bed with her, and as we were falling asleep, I told her I didn't want to live in the house anymore. All my mom said was, I promise this is the last night you have to sleep in this house, and that was a haunting promise that was kept. We were woken up while it was still dark by my dog barking non-stop outside. My mom got out of bed, grumbling about him being so loud that early, and made her way to the front door that led to the front garden where my dog was yapping away. We had an alarm system on the doors and windows, so I just heard my mom deactivate it in order to check out what was going on with my dog. I was still laying in bed because I was cold, and it was still too early to get up, when suddenly... I heard my mom scream, which caused me to stand up and call for her. Not even 30 seconds later, a man dressed fully in black and wearing a balaclava came into my room. He told me to get dressed. I quickly did as I was told. They took me into the living room where two men, dressed exactly the same as the one who got me, had my mom with bandage over her eyes. I just remember her begging the three men to leave us alone, telling them where her wallet and valuables were. But one of them just said, that's not why we're here. They proceeded to put pillowcases over our heads and shoved us into the trunk of our car. After this, the rest of the events were a bit fuzzy since it was hard to tell time, and our sight was so limited. They hid us somewhere in the forest, between a rock wall and a bed mattress. I can't really say how long we were there. And I have vague memories of one of the men's back that I caught a glimpse of when I peeked under the pillowcase. All my mother did was pray non-stop, because number one, she truly believed in God, and number two, Mexicans are extremely religious and it might dissuade them from killing a mother and child. After being moved to another location, they called my family to ask for a ransom. We couldn't really hear most of the conversations, but the man nicknamed, the mean one, felt the need to tell me that my father didn't love me, and that they were going to send him a few of my fingers if he didn't pay up. Shortly, we were loaded into another car when my mom started begging one of the men not to kill us. They drove around for what felt like hours until they suddenly stopped and dragged us out. They told us to get down on our knees. At this point, my mother was certain that we were going to get shot, so she asked if they did, shoot me first in order for me not to hear my own mother die. The men said nothing. We abruptly heard the car peel out and my mother just screamed at me to run as fast as I could. We ran for a few minutes and then saw a residential area where we started frantically knocking on the doors, hoping that the kidnappers didn't plan on coming back for us. To our desperation, nobody in the first two houses opened up their doors, when suddenly, an old man opened up at door number three. After trying to explain to him and seeing the state we were in, he let us come in and call my father. After he picked up the phone, all I could do is cry after hearing his voice. He came to get us, and that night was the first and last time I ever saw my father cry. So this happened over a year ago. Our oldest son, Caden, was three at the time, and our youngest son, Connor, was about five months old. It still gives me chills and still makes me uncomfortable even walking by it. It was late January evening in Pennsylvania. We had just finished eating dinner and I planned on giving our little one a bath. My husband drives a truck for work, so he isn't home very often. It's just me and the boys during the week. Caden was playing in his toy room that has a door leading to the side deck. A little detail. We don't have a sensor light or even a porch light on that whole side of the house. At this time, we didn't use the deck at all. It was only to use our grill during the summer months. It's not close to the sidewalk or the next street over. It's basically an open space of yard off of the deck. Anyway, Caden was playing in the toy room waiting for his turn to take a bath while I brought Connor into the bathroom. 
We were just about done with bath time when I heard Caden's little feet running towards the bathroom. He stands in the doorway and says, Mommy, there's a man looking in the side door. I think it's the mailman. My heart skipped a beat because number one, no mailman is coming at 7pm. Two, this side door, as he called it, we never used, especially not in the winter. And number three, I didn't hear anyone knock. I began to sketch myself out more, thinking about how there's no light on the deck. This person would have to walk through our yard, in the snow, walk up the back stairs of the deck, and go to that door when the front porch light was on and attached to the shoveled sidewalk. I took Connor out of the bath, put him in a towel in his little chair, and then told Caden to sit with his brother and not to come out until I said it was okay. He was confused but listened, just kept asking what was wrong. I grabbed the biggest kitchen knife I could find, had 911 ready to call and got my mama bear face on. When I walked to the side door, I shined the flashlight on my phone through the window of the door at a distance, just walking up to it hopefully to scare someone away. The worst thought with this as a mother is that as I reached for the handle, I realized it was unlocked. Someone could have walked right in. I flung the door open and shined my light. I held up my knife and yelled, Hey, in the most threatening voice a 5 foot 4, 120 pound woman could make. There were footprints in the snow up the deck, and they went back down into the field and woods behind our house. I slammed the door, thoroughly freaked out, and locked it. I called the police and waited in the bathroom with the boys. While I was in there, I asked Caden, do we know who the man was? He said, no, but he smiled and waved at me for a long time. I asked him what he was wearing. He told me a hat that looked like a mailman's hat, and he wasn't wearing a coat. The police officers came and searched the property with flashlights before coming inside. He asked me and Caden questions and then informed me that not only did he see footprints leading up to the side deck, but to the outside door to our basement and kitchen window on the other side of the house as well. He suggested I have someone come and stay with us for the night, that they would continue to follow the footprints that were left in the snow back to the field and wood line. My father-in-law slept on the couch that night with his gun, being the closest relative to our house. My mother was a nervous wreck, and I got very little sleep that night. I never heard back from the police. I'm guessing tracks were loose through the bit of woods. Caden still mentions it from time to time randomly, and we got a blackout curtain for that door. I'd still very much like to get better locks to be safe. My husband and my father think it might have been a man who saw me home alone while passing, and that maybe he wanted to sneak a peek. Why just stand there and watch my child, and then go around the whole back of the house, not even by the front door or street. I hope to never see that creep's face, and I hope he never smiles or waves to my child again. I'm a male. I was 11 at the time and living in a nice suburban area. We had recently moved into this house my parents had built, and it was our first home versus rented house in a sketchy area. It was a very nice neighborhood. The whole family made friends quickly with lots of neighbors, but especially the ones three doors down. They had a daughter my age and another one five years younger, who was also the same age as my sister. Our parents got along well and we began hanging out quite a bit for barbecues at their house, or parties at their house and that kind of thing. Friendships were formed quickly and seemed to be very strong. After a year or so, I started to realize things weren't what they seemed. I remember seeing police cars at the house a few times in the evening. When I'd ask my parents what was going on, it was always nothing. That the police were just checking up on them type of answers. I was no genius, but at 11, that didn't add up. Why didn't the cops just check up on us? One day I'm at their house, playing and hanging out, and the daughter goes across the street to get another mutual friend. That left myself and the father alone in the house. This was really no big deal as it has happened before, but then he approached me and just seemed off. I still don't know what made me feel this way, but I was very uncomfortable and started thinking about leaving. About five minutes later, he tells me he has something cool to show me. I don't remember what it was, 
but I think it was something about baseball cards, which I was very fond of. I excitedly started following him. He pulled the attic ladder down and asked me to follow him, which I did without hesitation at first. Then something happened, and I still can't process what it was. He was ahead of me on the ladder, and when he looked back to help me into the attic, there was something off, something about his eyes. His face, his grin, it wasn't right. It looked evil. I can still see it clear as day. I can't recognize exactly what it was that set my alarms off. Whatever it was, was plenty, because I jumped off the ladder and ran out the door. I sprinted all the way home and was choking back tears when I burst through my front door. My mom was there when I came through. She could see I was obviously out of sorts and immediately started calming me down. As I came to my senses, I explained what happened. My mom was concerned with how scared I was, but she mostly brushed it off to me being scared, young and silly. I shit you not, that same exact night I was woken up at around 3am. It was my mom sitting on my bed. As I awoke, she held me like a baby. I remember how she smelled, how tightly she held me, and I remember her tears hitting my cheek. Eventually I saw at the window the neighbor's house surrounded by police and fire trucks. The neighbor's dad had killed himself and his daughter in the attic after a standoff with the police. There isn't any doubt in my mind, nor my mother's, that that would have been me had I made the decision to go into the attic. I still get chills thinking about it. When I was way younger, I had gone into my bedroom alone to change into my pajamas. My mom said I'd come back and asked her why Peter Pan was at my window and if we could let him in. She, of course, ran to my bedroom, and sure enough, someone had pulled the screen off my window. They opened it slightly. Needless to say, we moved shortly after that. I was oblivious as to what was wrong because, hey, I got to meet Peter Pan. My family struggles regularly with money, and during this particular summer, we had stopped paying our phone bill in order to make the money we had stretch farther. My mom made up for this by taking our three siblings and I to the library regularly, though I was arguably more interested in being there than my brothers and sister. We were all at the library one day, and I was in a snug little corner with two fluffy chairs that faced one another that were separated with a coffee table. I was watching YouTube on my phone and generally minding my own business. Thank God for the library's free Wi-Fi. After an hour of us being there, a man came into the building and sat in the chair opposite me. He was heavily overweight and wore glasses that were too small for his face. It was common for people to sit where he was, so I paid him no mind. That is, until we started to talk. I had to pull out my earphones to hear him. He had this friendly smile on his face as he tried to strike up conversation with me about the weather. I was a young teen and obviously had no interest in talking to him, so I made sure to keep my answers short. Then he asked a question that set off alarm bells in my head. Are you alone? I immediately told him I was there with my mother and siblings, and even mentioned that my older brother was on the wrestling team and pretty strong. Almost immediately after that, this man got a really disappointed look on his face and left. I felt really uneasy about the whole situation. I told my mom about it once we left. But guess what? That isn't the end. About a month after this, when school was underway, just my mom and I were back at the library. I was in the same chair and reading a book I found on one of the shelves. Things were going fine until that same man walked in and sat down across from me. I remembered feeling my heart rate pick up when I saw him. Now it became pretty clear that this guy wasn't trying to be discreet. He picked up a book upside down and used it as an ineffective shield as he stared at me. I felt really uncomfortable, but I didn't know what else to do besides ignore him. The guy left maybe 20 minutes later, and I let out a sigh of relief. My mom came to get me maybe half an hour after that 
and by then I had calmed down considerably. We walked out of the library together, and there, parked in the spot closest to the entrance, was the man. He made eye contact with me and then quickly drove off. I could tell that he'd been waiting to see if I'd come out alone or not. I don't know what would have happened to me if my mom wasn't with me. I told her what happened as we drove away. She seemed really upset that someone would act the way the man did. I'm just glad nothing bad happened to me. Really. I hope that man hasn't gone after anyone else. I was around 10 or 11 when this happened. I was home alone. The doorbell rang while I was watching TV, so I hastily moved my bowl of cereal and got up to answer the door. It was the mailman who said we'd gotten a package. He said it was so big he needed help carrying it. Something felt off about him. He wasn't wearing a uniform. He was wearing a dirty white shirt and jeans. I asked him where his truck was because I didn't see it parked out front. He said it was around the corner, that I should just follow him out to grab my parcel. He kept telling me to go with him, but I said politely I wasn't feeling well, and that we would just get our mail from the post office. He said how much of a hassle that would be, and just to get it right then and there. I said I had to get my shoes from upstairs, and he waited outside. I locked the door and bolted upstairs, closing all the windows. I called my mom to come home and explained everything. The man was still outside and he shouted at me, asking if I'd gotten my shoes. I replied to him that my mom was coming because she was much stronger than me and she could help carry the package. Once I said that, he was quick to run and I never saw him again. He was never caught. I hope that he never allowed any kids and tricked them to going near that van. When I was seven or eight, my family went to the beach and rented a room. We had the kind of rooms where you rent out both and they connect through a door. There's one door to leave the room and the other to the other room. In the room connected to ours, there was this army family. There was a military dad, some kids and a wife. My older sister was supposed to be watching me as we were down at the jacuzzi that evening. As we were playing and hanging out and just having a good time, this mom literally sits in the jacuzzi with us. She starts talking to us and is just making herself real comfortable. I was very naive as a kid. Eventually we started talking about books. And then she starts talking about her kids. We were just having a good conversation. Really in depth I felt. My sister decides she wants to go back to the room. But I don't. I wanted to stay and talk with the mom. So my sister decides she wants to go back to the room. And now it's just 7 year old me and some 40 year old woman. It should have set off some creepy alarms, but it didn't. So she starts talking about going and walking on the beach. It's like 10pm. She wants to go walk on the beach and get shells. I thought it was a great idea. I'd get to walk on the beach at night. I felt so free and like a big kid. I didn't need my sister or anything. So I run back to the room to tell my grandparents that I'm walking on the beach with Sue, or whatever her name was. I remember my grandmother reading her book, barely listening to what I said. She just shooed me off. So I start walking down the creepy motel corridor. I'm going through the stairwell, like something out of a movie. Too bad I've never seen this movie. So I'm walking through the stairwell. The mother was way at the bottom, telling me to hurry up and this and that. While walking through the stairs, the army dad comes running, hauling ass to where I'm at. He said to me, your mom is calling you. It's really important, we gotta go. He grabbed me by the wrist and led me back to our room. He knocked on the door and explained what had happened. I never thought much about it until about a year ago when it came back to me. This woman was leading me away to the beach alone at night, and this army guy got a terrible feeling in his gut, so he decided to intervene. When he said my mom was looking for me, as I don't live with my mom, it set off alarm bells in my head. That's when I realized something was up. I didn't resist going back to my family. As a kid, I knew since he was saying my mom wanted me, it was important. I just knew something was up because I don't live with my mom. I'm now 20 years old and I truly believe that mom 
was trying to lure me away. She was going to do God knows what. This army dad had a bad feeling and saved my life. I know now I would not have made it back from that beach trip. Thank you, army dad. Your gut feeling and having a watchful eye saved me from something terrible happening. That woman was creepy, and I never saw her kids. A few weeks ago, I was cuddled up with my three kids watching Merlin in the mid-morning. It was a weekday, so my significant other was at work, and we all had some gnarly colds. We always kept our door locked since we've had many instances of neighbor kids just walking into the house. Usually it's just little kids who don't know any better, but we've had a few times where it's just been a kid chasing one of mine trying to fight them. This has made our dog really territorial about not letting anyone in, so we locked the door for everyone's safety. This particular day, my significant other forgot to lock the door when he left. So we're all cuddled up, I'm nursing my baby. And suddenly my dog loses his shit, which is normal. We had maintenance guys in and out of the apartment across the way, and he spent several days barking at them until I could calm him. This time, though, he ran back into my room, clearly panicked by whatever he was wearing. So I get up and go check, and see if I can calm him down. I step over the baby gate in my bedroom doorway, and look down the hallway to see a guy I don't know standing there. I quickly shut my bedroom door behind me, thinking it was a maintenance guy who let himself into the wrong house. I immediately started telling him that he went to the wrong place. We had no notice that we'd be getting a visit from maintenance, and he should know better because of my dog. The guy just smiled at me, asked if I was yawning, and then started apologizing for having the wrong house, asking if I was sure this was the wrong house. He didn't turn to leave. Instead, he took a few steps further into my house, towards me. It was then that I realized he had a lit cigarette in his hand. He was actively smoking, standing in my living room, so he was clearly not maintenance. I told him he wasn't supposed to be here and he needed to leave right now. He laughed again and said this was the address he was given. Was I sure? I told him to go, that my dog would hurt him. He apologized and walked a few more steps towards me. I raised my voice and told him to get the fuck out. My dog will attack him. As I was yelling, my oldest son opened my bedroom door right there. The guy saw my dog standing in the doorway. He looked back at me, at the dog again, and left really quickly. It's possible he was just a super weird guy that had the wrong house, but I told him to leave at least five times. He made no moves to leave my house until my dog was free to come at him. What kind of person just walks into the home of someone they don't know, even taking the liberty to smoke a cigarette? I'm glad my dog is huge and scary sounding, because honestly he mostly just wanted to hide behind me. I don't think he would have been much help if the guy had been a little braver. Last summer, I lived in a house with my landlord and his three dogs. My room was separate from the house through the garage, but we shared amenities that were located in the main home, so it wasn't quite a full guest house. The place was located in a fairly secluded area with houses sparsely located around our property. When I was living there, we had a gardener that came regularly that also trimmed our trees. Anyway, one day after a night of heavy drinking, I was woken up by some noise. I noticed my landlord was gone and he had taken his dogs with him. This meant I was completely home alone. I look out my window and there was a bright red brand new looking SUV parked on the driveway. There was a man that had just gotten out of his vehicle and he was approaching the front door. My landlord had left the garage open. He was completely reckless which is partially why I don't live there anymore. Our property was also personally gated but my landlord never closed the gate either. I usually did, which is another reason why I couldn't live there anymore. So, I slip in through the garage and check to see what the man is doing. I notice he begins looking through the windows by the front door of the house before he tries to knock. Mind you, I immediately get this uneasy feeling. I just sense that something's completely off. Right as his hand's about to knock on the front door, 
I approach him from behind. I ask him, Excuse me, how can I help you? The man jumps and becomes so startled and replies, Oh my god, you scared me. I thought no one was here. Even the garage looked empty. I look at him suspiciously and still foggy brain from drinking too much the night before. And I repeat, Can I help you? He then asks, I'm running a tree trimming service and I was wondering if you'd like your trees trimmed. And I suspiciously reply, No thank you. We already have someone who does this work. He then replied, Really? Because I've been going to the other neighbor's homes and it seems like they needed a trimmer too. I then said, No, we do not need one. He thanked me and then began walking off. Then I realized how the hell did he get in here? It then clicked that my stupid landlord didn't close the gate again. Right as the tree trimmer was walking away, I then asked, Wait, this is private property. How did you get on this driveway? He replied, Oh, really? I didn't know. The gate was open, so I just drove through. I replied, Yeah, this is private property. You were never supposed to be here anyway. He then sped off. I immediately called my landlord and told him what happened. He was just a few minutes away from the house too, of course. He told me that there was nobody scheduled to come to the property, and that he sure as hell didn't need a tree trimmer. We called the cops and reported this man. Also, my landlord agreed to always leave one of his dogs with me, especially while he was out. Here's the ringer. I ended up looking up burglaries and crime in that area, and I found out that there was an uptick in burglaries and that the perpetrators specifically drove brand new car models that were usually rentals, so that their victims or witnesses wouldn't find them suspicious. I found it suspicious because his car was brand new looking. There weren't any signs of gardening or tree trimming equipment anywhere in the car. Also, when I lived in that secluded area, which was a private neighborhood as well, there weren't any solicitors at all, so this was a very unusual case. It definitely made the hairs on my neck stand up. The man was dressed in a polo, a baseball cap, and he had a phony clipboard. It all seemed really fake. I was living on a huge property that was quite a few acres. What if I never woke up from my drunken sleep? What was this man really planning on doing? If you have solicitors or maintenance men or anyone offering services knock on your door, I always ask for identification or a business card at the very least. You never know who you could be dealing with. We also talked with our neighbors a day or two after the incident. They confirmed that the same man came to their gated homes unannounced. They had reported him to the police as well. Be safe and always take as many precautions as you can. It's better to be safe than sorry. My dad's lifelong friend told us this story, and I think about it quite often. John worked at the prison where Charles Manson was being held. One day, John and another guard were told to move Manson. As John was taking Manson down a hallway, he stopped dead in his tracks, near a receptionist's desk. Manson looked at the receptionist, who John had never seen before. Manson turned back to John and said, She's the one. John was wildly creeped out and told him to keep walking. One thing led to another and John and that receptionist got married. She was the one. I see a lot of videos about people calling Charles Manson some crazy dude, pure evil or whatever. But that story has always stuck with me because there's no way that some random crazy dude would have been able to predict that. Manson really was something else. I'm a 22-year-old female, a shift shopper, and mostly work nights because it's when most orders are available. I generally only accept orders in the zone closest to my home. One night, I decided I wanted to do one last order with a delivery window between 10 and 11 p.m., but there weren't any available in my usual zones, so I figured I'd pick up one on the other side of town to close out my day. During my shop, there were lots of things on this customer's list that were out of stock. 
He had specified on his account that he'd like to be contacted in that situation. I was shopping for him for about 30 to 40 minutes. I sent him probably 10 different messages about things that needed substitutes. I didn't receive an answer until I was ready to check out and then reached out to him one last time, letting him know that's what was happening. He finally told me to just use my best judgment, to which I replied no problem. Fast forward to having all of his items bagged and in my car, I sent him a message letting him know I'm headed his way. I'd be there in about 15 minutes, which is what I do for all of my customers. I get to his street, and it already isn't in the best part of town. I'm thinking, okay, no problem. Just make it a quick drop-off and get back home. When I get to the house, the driveway is completely on the left side of the house. The porch is on the right side of the house that leads to the front door. I can see that there are multiple porch lights as well as lights around the house leading up to the front door, but none of them were turned on. Now mind you, I've told this person I was on my way, gave him my estimated timeline, and pressed a button in the ship app to notify I'd arrived. At this point, I'm feeling a knot in my stomach and my hair is standing up a bit. Before I got out of my car, I sent a message to my boyfriend, telling him I was feeling uncomfortable about the situation and that the house was creeping me out. If he didn't hear from me telling him I was on my way home, then something is wrong. This person ordered a lot of stuff and it was just me doing the delivery, so it took me three separate trips to the porch and back to my car to get everything out. I grabbed as much as I could for the first trip, went to the porch to set the groceries down by the door, and then went back to my car for the next load, without knocking and making minimal noise. When I got back to the porch to drop off my second load, I got up to the second step before looking up to make sure I could see where I was going in the dark and realized the front door was now open. There is now a man standing there staring at me. He also didn't turn any lights on in his house, aside from what looked like a single light fixture three rooms away, so there was just a faint glow in the background behind him. I could only see his silhouette. I couldn't see his face or even what he was wearing. Shocked, I just blurted out, Hello, how are you? And he stood there and said nothing. Didn't reach for the bags. He just looked at me. I dropped his bags off and went back to my car to get the last set of groceries. I didn't even make it up all the porch steps before dropping his groceries and turning around to run back to my car because he was still just standing in the doorway, looking at me. I didn't get tipped on that order but I'd like to consider the fact I made it home that night to be my tip. Needless to say, I haven't shopped in that area again since. This happened a few years ago in my old one-person flat. I had a strange feeling that something wasn't right for a few days. Like I was sure that food in the fridge was less than I put it back the last time. I found pillows from my couch on the floor. Stuff like that. I lived alone back then so there wasn't anyone else with access to my flat. Or so I thought. Well, one night I woke up around 1 in the morning, sweating and even though I didn't remember, I was sure I woke up from a nightmare. Since I was drenched in sweat, I decided to take a shower. So I put my phone up in the bathroom for music turned on my water and enjoyed my shower. A few minutes in, I heard the door move. I never close it, but it still never moves. I took a look at the shower curtain and saw a shadow against it, and a look at my phone confirmed someone was there. I could clearly see a reflection in my screen that showed someone standing next to the shower curtain. It took a lot for me not to scream and to keep acting like I didn't notice anything all while silently taking the shower off the holding and turning the water all the way to hot. I'm still kind of impressed of thinking that quickly. My water got really hot when you cranked it all the way, and a few seconds later, steam was racing. The water hurt my feet flowing to the drain. I turned around, ripped the shower curtain open, and held the shower head right at the person behind it. It was a woman. She screamed in pain. I whacked her in the face with the shower head and jumped out of the shower and ran to my door taking my key out of the lock and locking it close behind me. A little later she started to bang on the door, but it wouldn't give. I called the cops and went to the kitchen to get my big kitchen knife, just for safety. I felt like my throat was closing up when I saw it missing. 
I realized there was only one place where it could possibly be right now. The police came and arrested the woman, who turned out to have been the former person living in the flat. She was evicted after not paying rent. It seems she made a copy of the key and came into the flat when I was at work, and sometimes at night. It's possible what woke me up in the first place was her, and honestly, I don't even want to think about it. Ever since then, I always insist that locks are changed when I move into a new place. This happened several years ago, but so much of it is still fresh in my mind. My husband, son, and I were visiting a local park with a great playground and a long paved trail next to a lake. My husband would stay with my kid while he played, and I would walk the dog and listen to a podcast. The park was usually very busy, but this was early spring and the weather wasn't great. The sky was gray and the wind off the lake still had a nip to it. I didn't let that deter me. I had serious cabin fever and was ready to stretch my legs. Me and my pup baby set off. It had been 15 to 20 minutes when I noticed my dog acting strange. She was pulling on the leash a lot and seemed very anxious. At this point, I realized I was almost completely alone. Almost. I glanced back and there were two men walking behind me at a pretty quick clip. There was nothing outwardly strange about them. I shrugged off my unease and I told myself I was being paranoid. I slowed a bit and let them pass me which they did. I felt immediately better when they were well ahead of me. They were a ways away, but in my line of sight as I walked. Several minutes later, they stopped. One of the men leaned in and whispered something into the other man's ear. He nodded and started walking ahead, while the other man turned around and started walking back towards me. I found it weird, but explained it away in my head. As he passed, we made eye contact. As a reflex, I smiled and nodded at him. This smile I got back makes my skin crawl to this day. Looking back, I remember that my dog distinctly positioned herself between myself and him. I kept walking for a while. I knew at this point I probably should have turned back, but I didn't. For the next five minutes or so, everything was fine. Then I realized I couldn't see the man ahead of me anymore. There was a bathroom right next to the trail, so he was likely in there. As I'm processing this, my dog is pulling on the leash and looking behind us. The man who walked in the other direction is coming up fast. Not quite running, but speed walking. I decided to sit down on a bench and be on the phone with my husband while he passed. I put him on speaker and made sure to loudly say, Yeah, I'm turning back now. I should be back shortly. At that moment, my dog lunged at this man snarling and barking. She had never once done anything like this in the six plus years I've had her. The man sidestepped and scurried away. As soon as he was far enough away that I thought I wasn't going to get tackled from behind, I got up and booked it all the way to my husband. Maybe it was nothing. Maybe I was being paranoid and woke myself up over nothing. But I really believe if my dog doesn't like you, it is for a reason. I am now a 72 year old man. This happened long ago, but I remember it so well. The background was a series of events that placed me in a mountain cabin outside of Frederick, Maryland, circa 1969 or 1970. Just say my life at the time was in disarray. I had dropped out of college, my father had died very badly, and I was alienated. I needed to get my mind right. The opportunity to move to an isolated cabin to live in contemplation and solitude was welcome. I had some inheritance money to pay for it. To the best of my memory, I was there eight or nine months. No TV, but books and radio. I had a library card, and I can't remember if I had a phone. This story begins when a month into my stay, a female beagle showed up at my door. She was a lost dog, and I took her in. Never could train her to do anything, but I fed her. And she was a sweet, and if not the brightest dog. A few months in, I began to feel a presence around the isolated cabin. It's hard to describe, but I felt like someone was watching me. 
On many occasions, I thought someone might even be looking into my cabin window, watching us. The next phase was the shadowing or following. I knew the folks a half mile down the lane, woods all around, and would sometimes visit them at night. Someone, something, was waiting for me. It followed me closely in the woods, besides me in the darkness. You could hear it easily, footsteps in the woods. It picked up the pace as I did. This not only happened to me, but also to my younger brother who visited, and to friends. It spooked them big time. At night, it was out there, around the cabin. Here's the funny thing. I was never afraid, never felt threatened. Not at all. At least early on. There was no feeling of malevolence. I spent a good bit of time wandering the vast areas of woodlands around me. There was a state park just up the hill, and the Frederick Municipal Forest went on for mile after mile. The whole western Maryland was much more country than it is now. None of the development had set in yet. In our hikes, the dog and I, we came across evidence of campsites, recent ones, in the woods, traces of fires, old abandoned buildings that had corners that gave shelter and looked slept in, garbage, food and drink, paper, what have you. Perhaps hunters, but much of it didn't have the organized feel you'd get from experienced hunters. The last month of my stay there was when things intensified. Maybe he sensed I was preparing to leave. In the mornings, I would find small dead animals at the bottom of the front porch steps. The cabin had a small front porch, screened with a light door and four wooden steps to the ground. A spotlight would illuminate the long front yard, with woods close by either side. Dead animals began to appear at the bottom of the steps, many mornings. I remember small birds, then a squirrel, a rabbit, even a weasel one day like they were offerings. I had to grab them up before the dog ate them. This went on almost daily for several weeks. One night, very late, I was awoken by some sound. I lay in bed and heard something from the front porch. I hopped up and hit the lights, and I saw that hound dog, who never learned to sit or stay, standing at the front door, in a perfect point position. She was shaking in fear. She never barked. I heard the door slam and footsteps down the steps. I hit the spotlight but saw nothing. I went out. He had been on my porch at my front door, maybe trying to enter. After that, I stayed in at night more and more. The animal offerings got bigger and bigger. Larger birds, a possum, a woodchuck. It wasn't funny. The final two, gifts, were legs from either horses or cows, big and bloody. One was skinned. The last to second day, the dog left me. I could hear her in the woods howling on a trail, following a scent. I looked for her in every way I could. Came up in the following weeks, but to no avail. She left as she came. I moved back to the Maryland suburbs of D.C., got an apartment with a friend, got a job, and moved on with my life. One day not long after, I picked up the Washington Post. There was an article about recent encounters with the Sykesville monster. It described a tall, yeti-like creature, fur-covered, on two legs that would pick out a family or person and give them attention. I wasn't the only one. That attention, described in the article, was exactly what happened to me. Following you at night, looking inside the house, gifts, and so on. I was shocked. If I had turned on the spotlight and seen Bigfoot or Yeti, I might still be running, but I think I know who it was. Sykesville, Maryland, was the location of the Springfield Hospital Center, a large state psychiatric hospital. It was 20 miles or so east of Frederick. Back then, many folks knew how to live in the woods. They grew up that way, country folks. I think that monster was an escaped patient or just a free schizophrenic who lived outside. This is like all the homeless you see in cities now, probably off his meds, but somehow functional and lonely. He would pick people or families to adopt. The campsites in the woods could have been him. With nothing to do, he would make mischief. I think he liked me, but sensed I was leaving. I can't prove any of this, it's just my theory. My monster was very much of that time and place, 
and his behavior was what I noticed in nearly every case then. I don't think he could have survived until the 1980s. Deinstitutionalization of mental hospitals threw the mentally ill out onto the streets and took away the shelter of hospitals. Unprotected, the mentally ill die. I was driving home when I realized a truck had been following me for miles. Just to be precautious, I made an abrupt last second U-turn, and he did too. It was there at that moment I realized he was following me. While on the phone with 911, I made sharp turns and ran red lights to try to lose him. He wouldn't stop. He almost hit my car a couple of times as he sped up trying to catch up to me. The 911 operator instructed me to go to a local grocery store and wait for the police. I parked right in front of the store's entrance and waited. He decided to park his car at a distance and waited for me to get out of my car. All of a sudden I heard a hard knock at the window. I freaked out and it turned out to be the grocery manager. He let me know 911 just notified him of the situation. He asked if I wanted to go inside the store and he would protect me until the cops arrived. I honestly feared the worst and told him no. I was shaking, but I thought this maniac might have a gun. He could shoot me and everyone in there. The cops arrived and luckily cornered him in the back of the parking structure. I was shaking as they came to my car, my hand gripping the wheel very tightly. They arrested him soon after for a third DUI and police filed a report. I don't know who he was. Apparently, he lived a couple of miles away from me. Unfortunately, two months later I receive a letter to notify me that I may be subpoenaed. I call the DMV who issued the letter, and they notify me that not only is he free again, but that my information, including my address, were on the police report. They provided that police report to him and his attorney. I now live in fear he may come any day and hurt me. Here's one of my stories from when I lived off the grid in the forest of western North Carolina. Some friends and I all lived in these small shacks, essentially a shed with a loft that were all very close together. Living in such primal and close conditions breeds a kind of a deep trusting friendship that you can't get from living anywhere else. So naturally, we did almost everything together. By our little semicircle of houses, there was a railroad track that if you followed it south would lead to a waterfall. This waterfall in particular is where everyone would go to get high. It was a normal night, humid, sometime in early July. A group of about six friends and I decided to walk out to this waterfall in the dark. I was the only sober one in the group, so I felt a higher sense of responsibility for everyone and was therefore on edge and hyper aware of our surroundings. Others would walk faster or slower or stop altogether in the group, so it was natural and expected that we wouldn't be able to see everyone at the same time. Andy was in rare form though. When Laura had to stop to pee, he came out of the bushes and scared her, and then he ran off behind the rest of the group. This pissed off both me and Laura, since it was such a clear invasion of privacy and unnecessarily spooky in the already spooky night. Laura and I got to where we could see Andy again, but he was walking by himself. He then slipped back into the bushes without even looking at us. Dismissing it as just him being high, we kept moving forward. Still not back with the whole group yet, we realize that Andy is followed in behind us, just far enough away that we can only see a silhouette. Finally, we catch up with the rest of the group. We see that all of us are accounted for, even Andy. We asked him how he got ahead of us and beat us to the group when he'd been at least 15 yards behind us just minutes ago. Everyone was dead silent as Laura and I realized whoever scared her when she peed and followed us was not Andy or anyone else from our group for that matter. We never made it to the waterfall. So this encounter happened many years ago and I was very young. It was in 2001 or 2002. I was 11 or 12 at the time. My father, mother and myself decided to accompany him on Saturday to scope out the property. From our home, it was little more than a three-hour drive, but we all loved riding in the car, so while it was not going to be the most eventful road trip, we went just to get out of the house. 
Upon arrival, I remember being very underwhelmed by the place. There weren't any houses anywhere near. Hardly any signs of life at all, apart from a few birds. And the wooded area wasn't exactly what I would call picturesque. Still, we parked our car off the road to explore the woods a bit. My uncle was talking about buying the land for hunting, not really my cup of tea. As we walked through the woods, it was a very nice day, but still, something felt off. Everyone in our group remarked about the eerie feeling, but my dad and uncle seemed to laugh it off. My mom had goosebumps and kept looking over her shoulder, which made me on edge too. She was very insistent that it was weird, and she wanted to leave. She kept saying it felt like she was being watched. After a bit of hiking, I noticed there was a small red building. I've seen bigger storage sheds in the suburbs, but it looked well built. My uncle said there was nothing about it on the listing, so we went to peek inside. The door was open, and inside there were open cans of food, a ratty blanket on the floor, and it stunk unlike anything I've smelled before. Following this discovery, we all agreed it would be best to get back to the car if there was some crazy hermit living in the woods. We didn't want to be around to find him. Only issue, we had walked pretty far into the woods, and now we weren't exactly sure which direction was correct. The eerie feeling really amped up and we were all on edge. We ended up trekking another mile before we finally found the road, but we were further down from where we had parked. At least we could just follow the road now. Walking along the road, we came across a truly unsettling sight. Right in the middle of the asphalt was a dark grey cat, on fire. I have no idea why a cat was out in the middle of nowhere, or how it came to be killed and set alight. Obviously this just happened, but there was no one in sight. Naturally, we ran the rest of the way to the car. There was a huge scratch in the paint all down the side of it, from the hood to the trunk. Thankfully that was the only damage and my dad was able to start it without any trouble. We drove away as fast as we possibly could. My heart is sped up just recounting this moment. It's definitely one of the scariest in my life. Needless to say, my uncle didn't buy the land. I'll always remember this terrifying encounter, but like anything over time I sort of pushed it to the back of my mind. It just became one of those odd moments you occasionally relate at family get-togethers years later so much that it's almost just a funny story. The reason I'm sharing this is because I was reminded of it last night, while binge-watching some episodes of BuzzFeed Unsolved on YouTube, when they shared the story of a family that disappeared in the same area, while also looking at some land for sale. The Disappearance of the Jamison Family is the name of the mystery video if you're wondering. The family died in the same area we were searching, roughly seven years after we made our trip. There were many theories about their death including the allegations of some sort of cult in the area, complete with something about dead cats. Coincidence, probably, but the whole story gave me chills. So if my family narrowly avoided being killed by some witches or a cult or whatever, or maybe we just stumbled upon a hermit who didn't want us in his woods, I could give you a million times as a kid or a young adult I felt scared or paranoid playing in the woods. It's a beautiful place and I spent my entire childhood getting lost out there by myself or with friends. As kids, we never got too far out there, but you could actually see the progression of us venturing further and further out there as we got older, because we would leave forts and carvings as time went by. This one particular time, my friend and I just graduated from high school. It was our last summer of freedom, and we spent the entire summer camping and hiking out there. We had decided to try and find a new place to set up camp, and walked for what felt like a few miles before we came to a nice clearing. The area was relatively new to both of us. We got the camp set up and a fire going, and the plan was to wait until nightfall, smoke some weed, and play Monopoly. For some backstory on my friend and I, my buddy is a smaller, real goofy guy. But he comes from a family of foresters and always had a deep understanding of all trees and different plants he came across. He had no fear of camping and going out by himself. If I spent 10,000 hours in the woods, he probably spent 50,000. As for me, I'm a taller, sturdier guy. And as we got older, I spent more time worried about women and sports. And the woods became a place for small parties. I want to mention I never had the balls to camp out alone. In fact, older me wouldn't go far at all when I was alone, because I could never shake the feeling of being watched. That was just paranoia, but still an uneasy feeling. 
Anyway, camp is set up and the fire is going, but it is getting lower and needs wood. The sun is down and we're both cutting up and having a good time. My friend is sitting on this little chair he always brought, and loading up this makeshift bong, and I was crouched, breaking some excess limbs off logs we'd gathered. All of a sudden, this strong breeze cuts through the clearing. I couldn't tell you if it was the suddenness of it or what, but both my friend and I stopped immediately and looked at each other. The breeze just went long enough to flicker our fire down to a small flame. We both sat completely still in almost total darkness. Neither of us said a word. Across from us on the other side of the fire, we could hear footsteps. They sounded like somebody was running and would slow to a walk and then run again. Whatever it was, was definitely on two legs. By the sound of it, they were pacing back and forth over the same spot. Then just like it started, it stopped with a softer crunch on the underbrush. I knew by the sound of it, it had taken a crouch. I was still crouched and knew I was staring right at it in the dark. My friend grabbed my shoulder and said, Buddy. And when he did, I felt a surge of fear come over me. I could feel and hear it in him. I had been so fixed on the footsteps and rationalizing what I heard that I hadn't even considered being afraid. But this was true fear. It was raw and made me feel helpless. I could hear my friend after a while grab some leaves, and he dropped them onto the fire. For the split second the leaves covered the fire, we were in pure darkness. Then the fire sprang to life. We both quickly grabbed more leaves and brush and threw it on the fire. I got some sticks and logs on there and neither of us took our eyes off the spot or even moved much for over an hour. Finally, the leaves crunched and it slowly walked off. Whatever it was, it sat crouched watching us without moving far longer than any animal would. It wasn't until after the footsteps disappeared that I realized the smell had disappeared as well. It smelled like a paper mill. Spoiled eggs almost. For the rest of the night, besides whispered remarks, neither of us really moved or stopped looking at that spot. Nobody went into the tent, and I had very short, light sleeps sitting on the ground with my head rested on my hands. My friend never went to sleep. In the morning, we packed up and silently walked back home. To this day, we talk about it. In the seven to eight years since it happened, my forester friend has not camped out there by himself since. A few years ago, I moved to a relatively remote part of my town with my boyfriend. We owned a small section of land behind our home, which consisted of the woods, a creek, and general shrubbery. I take my dogs out there every day for walks and one day came across what looked like a campsite where a homeless person would live. There was a basket full of sticks and what I assumed was being used for firewood, also with a mattress, blankets, and tarps. It looked relatively kept, so I assumed someone must be actively staying there. I went off in a different direction and decided to stay away from that area. I told my boyfriend about what I would came across that day, and we were trying to figure out about what we should do to eventually remove this person. This was our land, and we didn't feel comfortable having someone else camping so close to our home. We sort of forgot about it for a few months, until one day I was walking past the area again with the dogs. Curiosity got the best of me, so I decided to have a snoop. Once again, I found the same layout, though it was much more unkept. There were some leftover food items and the remainder of a fire. I quickly left. The same night as I was waiting on my boyfriend to get home, I was in the kitchen cooking and facing the window that looked out towards the woods. I thought I'd seen someone standing next to a tree, but it was so dark and I have a horrible eyesight, so I didn't try to overthink it. But then I actually started thinking. Our home and property was fenced, and that little campsite I saw again today. I freaked myself out. Could it be the person that was staying there? I knew someone probably was, but I didn't think they'd want to show themselves, if that makes sense. I carried on cooking and thinking on it, hyping myself up in a bad way. I kept looking around but couldn't see anyone, so I hoped it was just anxiety and my overthinking. And then there was a knock at the back door. We had a curtain covering the window on the back door, so I couldn't see who was knocking, 
I wouldn't be able to see from the window where I was standing either. I went over to the door and moved the curtain. No one was there. The dogs had started barking at that point, which, if you have dogs, you know that when you feel anxious, their barking can freak you out even more. I had my Alexa playing music and turned her off to be able to hear better. The dogs were barking in the front room at the windows, but I couldn't see anything. I shut the curtains and then calmed the dogs down, but I was feeling very, very uneasy. Suddenly a noise came from the kitchen, like someone was jumping against the door. The dogs started going crazy again and then ran to the kitchen. I went after them. The door kept jittering and moving. Someone was trying to get in. The pole that was keeping the curtain up fell, and I saw a man wearing what looked like a white face mask. He kept pushing on the door. I was hyperventilating at that point. If I left out the front door, he could run and get to me in seconds. So I left the dogs downstairs and ran upstairs, locking myself in the bathroom. I felt so scared. I was scared for my dogs. I called the police as soon as I heard the back door being hit and the dogs barking so loudly. I remember how I wasn't even to tell the police my address before the noises stopped. I could just hear the barking, no more sounds of the door being hit. I was momentarily convinced he'd gotten in, but surely I'd be able to hear some sort of a struggle. My dogs were two large German shepherds, yet there was nothing I could hear. The police did arrive very soon. My back door was still intact. I spoke to them through the bathroom window as I was too scared to come down before they assessed the house from the outside. I also had to calm the dogs down before I let the police in. The dogs were really riled up then. I told the police about the homeless person who lived in the woods. They had a look in the area and couldn't seem to find anything or anyone suspicious. That was until a few weeks later, when myself, my partner along with the dogs, walked down to the campsite again to see if it had been abandoned or not, on the slim chance they didn't have anything to do with the break-in. We found the white mask that I spoke about before, how I couldn't tell what it was. It was hanging on the tree. Gloves and boots were hidden in a bag which we found by the creek, soaking wet. Apparently all this wasn't there when the police went down there that night, though the campsite, for the first time, definitely looked abandoned. We sent pictures to the police, who came down soon after, but even though they had all this evidence, safe to say nothing was ever done about it. Most likely as there was no successful break-in. We got everything removed from the campsite and taken away in a skip. Who knows what would have happened if the back door gave in. I still worry thinking about it. It's left me with a lot more unresolved anxiety than I already had. I've spent my life in Georgia and love hiking all over, but I must admit, North Carolina has the best mountains. For this reason, I frequently drive up there and hike and camp. This time I went up with my family in an RV. I stayed with them in Maggie Valley. The next day, however, I had them drop me off about 10 miles away at the Cold Mountain Trailhead, and I planned to hike up, spend the night, and be back down in the morning. I was by no means inexperienced at hiking or camping, but I had never camped alone. On top of that, I didn't bring a pistol, something I won't go without now. On the way up, the trail was surprisingly strenuous, not necessarily steep. I've hiked some steep stuff out west, but more like a ton of ups and downs and feeling like it wouldn't end. Eventually, it began to get darker, and I realized I needed to stop and set up while I still had light. So I stopped about a half mile short of the summit and figured I would continue in the morning. Nothing eventful happened. I set up camp in a good spot ate my food, and went into the tent. At this point I realized I hadn't run into a single other person my entire way up. This wasn't eerie at the time, but soon it would be. I have trouble sleeping and usually lay awake for up to an hour trying to sleep. During this time, I thought I heard someone lightly walking around the general area. Because of the rhythm of the steps, I brushed it off as my mind running wild, but I did pull my big old knife out of my bag and put it next to me in my sleeping bag. That morning, I woke up and ate oatmeal. As I ate, 
I look over at my tent and notice a strange bundle of dried twigs and berries, tied with a green cord propped against my tent. Initially I was pissing myself, and I packed up all my stuff and took off within five minutes. No way I bothered going up to the summit. I headed straight down. On the way down, I realized there was a pretty heavy fog. I ended up on a side trail that eventually ended and I was lost. I used a compass to eventually reorientate myself and found the trail again. I made it out with no other incident. However, I came to find out on that same morning a 27-year-old died on that same section of trail as me. It's possible I would have run into him had I not gotten lost and rejoined the trail later. The scariest part was knowing that someone knew where I was. They watched me, and I had no clue about them. Someone I loved very much passed away four years ago. I was devastated over their death. The graveyard he's in is beautiful and became my spot. Before he died, we actually used to walk his dog together. I would visit his grave for hours sometimes and read, listen to music, walk around, and that kind of thing. I would go at night a lot after I got off second shift around midnight as well. One night, I was really upset about something and wanted to visit him. I pulled in and drove over to his side, but something fell off. I got out of the car and immediately wanted to get back in. I have a really good intuition and tend to always listen to my gut, which has never lied to me. I drove back out, but you have to go all the way around the cemetery to get back to the entrance. As I got to the top of the hill before the gate, which is still pretty far in, I see a person walking fast, almost speed walking towards my car. I jumped a mile. I looked closer and an older woman was walking directly towards my car, very fast. She had a gigantic smile on her face. After seeing the creepypasta video, The Smiling Man, it became one of my irrational fears. It was pretty chill that night, and she looked like she was only wearing a long sleeve shirt and no pants, no parker or anything. The woman walked almost into my car, then turned around and walked off towards the woods on my right. I drove farther toward the gate and looked back. She was walking straight into the woods. It was 1am at this point. The cemetery is not in a good neighborhood, and was bizarre. I drove out of there as fast as I could. About five years ago, my wife and I went on a weekend camping trip with two of our closest friends, another married couple. The campsite is just outside of Yosemite, and absolutely beautiful. The beauty of it is that you take a dirt road for about an hour and a half off the main road to get to it. It's extremely secluded, but it never felt threatening. It's a really popular campsite, so there were always people around, especially in the summer when this occurred. The first day was awesome. I don't remember exactly what we did, but I do remember having a great time. The campsites are all fairly close together, and usually separated by various shrubs and stuff. I remember we were all pretty pumped about the site we got, as there were no neighbors on the one side of it. It was just forest, and there wasn't anyone occupying the site closest to us. This is uncommon, as these campgrounds stay fully booked throughout the summer. Day two started normally. We had breakfast, then headed to the lake for a couple of hours. The lake was about a 20-minute hike from the main campground. We got back around two-ish. We noticed that the site next to us now had a silver rental car parked on it. We didn't think much of it, and we went about making a fire to cook with. At some point, we noticed the occupant of the site next to us. Pretty average looking white dude, maybe early 40s. Honestly, he was so average looking that it's hard to even picture him. We all immediately caught on to the fact that he was constantly looking over at us. My friend Dave even made a comment under his breath. You notice this guy keeps looking over here, he said. I remember feeling a bit uncomfortable as we were all still in bathing suits from the lake, but we made a conscious effort to ignore it. It's worth mentioning that we were a bit drunk, not out of control or anything, just feeling pretty good. Throughout the afternoon and into the evening, we continued to notice the guy constantly looking over at us. In hindsight, Dave or I should have called him out. 
This story doesn't make us look great, but whatever. I had been stressed at work prior to the trip, and really didn't want to let some creepy guy throw me off my relaxed vibe. The alcohol, coupled with the fact that we honestly kind of felt bad for him, led us to not confront him. Yes, it was very creepy, but I told myself he was just an awkward, lonely guy. Aside from the staring, there were a couple of mildly weird incidents that occurred leading up to the very weird stuff. The first was that, at some point, he left his side to go do whatever. While he was gone, a girl, probably in her mid-twenties, walked by and snapped a picture of his license plate. I remember asking her if she needed anything, and she smiled awkwardly and kept walking. Dave and I both thought this was odd, but we were preoccupied with beer. Later into the evening, around seven, the camp host was doing her rounds checking in on people. She checked in on us and moved on to him. I remember us all eavesdropping intently to hear what they were saying, and I think we just wanted to hear what this creep sounded like. He kept asking questions about the bathhouse. We didn't know there was a bathhouse, or even what a bathhouse was, but he had like a hundred different questions about it. Where is it? How late is it open? Is it private? Maybe not that weird, but in context, definitely odd. The sun started to go down. We were all drunk, so we weren't concerned with this creepy guy anymore. At one point, we went for a walk and noticed him snooping around what we believed to be the bathhouse. We all laughed about it and talked about how creepy it was. Back at the site, we continued to drink and have a good time. At one point, the guy started eating beans aggressively out of a can in the light of his single lantern. He looked at us while doing it. Dave and I kind of snickered to each other at how weird it was. I don't think the girls noticed. Eventually, we decided to go to bed. I think the guy had left his side at this point. I kind of remember us making jokes like, I better not wake up to that guy looking in our window. My wife and I slept in our SUV with the seats folded down. Dave and Sarah slept in the camper shell of their truck. I remember feeling a little creeped out as I fell asleep, but I shrugged it off. At around 2.30 a.m., both my wife and I were jolted awake by what we thought was a woman's scream. We both looked at each other and asked if the other heard that. We came to the conclusion that it was probably people at some other site being loud, and we decided to go back to sleep. As I was trying to go back to sleep, I started feeling very unsettled. I decided to get out of the car and take a look around. I cracked my door, trying to be as quiet as possible. I had gotten about one leg out of my car when I heard faint but direct whispering coming from Dave and Sarah's camper shell about four feet away. I froze and then heard it again. I eventually realized that they were trying to tell me something. I whispered back, What? I then very clearly heard Dave say, Start your car. I instantly realized that something was wrong. So rather than ask questions, I climbed back into my car to start it. Right away, Dave and Sarah busted out of the back of the camper and frantically jumped into my car. They told me to drive. They were too freaked out to explain anything, so I kind of just drove aimlessly. Eventually I pulled over, figuring we were far enough away from whatever had freaked them out. Finally Sarah calmed down enough to tell us what had happened. As she put it, she was woken up by a light coming from the creepy guy's campsite. Apparently he had set up lanterns and flashlights to spotlight himself, completely naked, touching himself in the direction of our cars. It gets weirder. At some point he stopped, turned off the lights, and began using a flashlight to signal across a small ravine that the campsites backed up to. I'm talking like Morse code or something. Across the ravine, an old RV began using its headlights to signal back. Dave was awake by this point. I questioned them on this detail, and they both said it was very clear they were communicating. After that, he turned off his light. Keep in mind, it's absolutely pitch black out there at night. After a few minutes, they heard footsteps around their car, followed by a hard tap on their window. This is what caused Sarah to scream, hence waking me up. At this point, I decided we needed to call the police. The problem was, there was absolutely zero call service at the campsite. Furthermore, it was about an hour and a half up the service road from what was already a very remote part of the state, so leaving at night was not an option. We decided the best course of action was to alert the camp host. We drove around and eventually found the trailer she lived in. She was understandably confused to be woken up at 3.30 in the morning 
but she was responsive. She mentioned the guy was really weird when she checked in on him. She called the police on her satellite phone. Apparently, there was a massive wildfire burning that weekend. The police said they wouldn't be able to send anyone until sunrise. The camp host said there really wasn't anything she could do beyond calling the police. It really sucked hearing that. Basically, we were stuck in our car in the pitch blackness, while some crazy guy was out and about, not to mention whoever was in that RV. And one more really weird thing that happened was at around 4 a.m. We were still sitting in my car when a man in the hood walked right up to the window. The second I noticed him, I turned on my engine and headlights. He ran off into the trees. We all sat in my car until sunrise. Once it was light out, we went back to the site to pack up our things. His car was still there, with blankets hung in all the windows. The whole thing felt gross. We just wanted to get out of there. So we quickly packed up and left. A couple of hours after we left, I got a call from the police. They said they went to the campsite and questioned the guy. He said he was simply showering. The cop told me there was nothing he could do. It was a case of our word against his. He also questioned the people in the RV. They said they didn't know what he was talking about, but mentioned that, and I quote, a very rude camper screamed in the middle of the night. The whole experience with the police was frustrating. I tried following up. I even tried getting help from a family member who's a sheriff. But even he said there wasn't anything they could do. Unless that particular police chief really wanted to investigate that guy. So that's the story. I learned a lesson about being polite when someone's making you uncomfortable. Nowadays, I'm much more aggressive with creepy people. I also know it's easy to hear this story and wonder why Dave or myself didn't confront the guy. Especially when he's literally touching himself at the car you're sleeping in. I don't know. I wish we would have showed more courage. But honestly, it was really scary in the moment. I'm okay admitting that. Now, I think it's kind of funny. Just how stupid we were. And how bizarre the whole situation was. I also feel fortunate that no one was hurt. Clearly, we were dealing with a very fucked up individual. And he had accomplices. I can only imagine what their end goal was what they would have been capable of doing. I think they've done shit like this before. I just really wish the police could have done something. A few years ago, I was on a trail run after a good snow. I decided to do it about 20 miles in the opposite direction of where I would normally run. And this took me into a section of the trail I'd never seen before. The trail runs on top of a levee that's surrounded by flat farmland on one side and a river on the other. Then it turns right into a small semicircle-shaped wooded area with tons of skinny trees. While the trees are packed in, you can pretty much see all the way through them. There was a clearing at one spot with a random bench facing the river. It struck me as beautiful, so I stopped there for a few minutes to admire the view and snap a picture before running off. On my way back, I glanced at the spot again. I decided I wanted to take a picture of this spot once every season. I made the trek in the spring, a few times in the summer, and then twice in the fall. I wasn't happy with the original fall picture I took. I went back a week later when the leaf colors looked a bit better. The second fall trip was the last time I'd ever gone. Everything was normal as I ran into the clearing by the bench and pulled out my phone. I tried to frame the picture so it would be the same shot and then everything felt wrong. My heart started pounding, my hair stood up, my spine tingled. That was the worst fear I've ever felt. I started fumbling around with my phone, trying to put it back in my arm band. It felt like someone was in the woods behind me, watching me, but they weren't just watching me. I was being sized up, thought about, possibly chosen, and was dangerous. It felt like whoever was watching me wanted to hurt or snatch me. I turned around and scanned the entire area surrounding the bench, waiting to see some drug addict murderer pop out of a camouflaged area. Like I said, you could see clear through the trees. No one was there. In fact, everything was dead quiet. I hadn't noticed that everything was abnormally silent. I stood there staring and scanning waiting to see anything because my feeling felt so strong. I don't know why, 
but I strongly felt that if I just booked it, this person or thing would be triggered, but I needed to leave right there. I tried to swallow every ounce of terror I felt, pretend like everything was normal, and I ran at a medium pace back towards the levee. Once I was in the open on the levee, I took off. But here's the weirder part. I felt like I wasn't out of danger yet. My spine kept tingling like something was behind me. I needed to keep pushing forward as fast as I could. I know this sounds crazy, but I didn't feel like it was a person anymore. I felt it could pop up at any moment and snatch me. Even though I was getting farther away, I kept thinking it wanted to snatch me. I normally don't use that word, but that is the word that specifically popped into my mind. It wasn't until I was about two miles away I felt I was out of its zone. I felt like I was safe. It took me a long time to calm down after I got in my car and went home. I truly felt like I was in danger. I'm a 23-year-old female. I took my two dogs, a cane corso and a labradoodle, on a walk on a nature trail near my home. My car was the only car parked in the parking lot when I arrived, so no one else was on the trail. The trailhead has only one entrance, and the trail has thick forest on either side of it. My dogs and I started walking, and maybe three-fourths of a mile in, a man on a bike approached me from behind. I moved to the side with my dogs to let him pass, and when he does, my cane corso lunged toward him. I held her back, but that wasn't unusual behavior for her. Around five minutes after the biker passed me, he passed again going the other way toward the exit, and again my dog lunged at him. I thought it was extremely odd that he decided to turn around so quickly, since he couldn't have gone much more than a mile, and that seems like an extremely short bike ride. He was dressed in biking gear and had a professional bike. It just seemed like he turned around very quickly after he saw me. I decided to stop and let my dogs rest. I FaceTimed my boyfriend and told him about my odd encounter. My boyfriend agreed to stay on the phone with me while I walked back, because I felt unsafe. Then my dogs and I turned around and started heading back to my car. About half a mile into our trip back, both of my dogs lunged at something inside of the tree line off the side of the trail. They barked and growled and tugged on their leashes toward the area of the tree line. I didn't see anything there, but my dogs definitely sensed something. We moved on and made it to the parking lot. I saw one of the car there with that man's bike hanging on the bike rack of the trunk. Once I got closer to the car, I realized no one was inside. I have a bad feeling that man had very bad intentions. I think that he biked back to his car after seeing me, walked to that spot on the trail, hid to do God knows what, then had second thoughts because I was on the phone with my boyfriend and I had two big dogs with me. It makes me sick thinking about it. I want this just to be an innocent encounter, just a misunderstanding on my part, but it feels sinister, and I feel like my dog sensed his energy from the start. This situation made me realize that walking alone on a rural trail, even with two big dogs, is not safe for me. So I was a wildland firefighter back in the day in Arizona. I worked in a forest that was generally popular with a lot of recreation in the northern portion, but I worked on the southern portion of the forest that was really remote. It barely had any roads or campgrounds, so if you wanted to recreate there, you had to work for it. The fire crew I was on only had two duty stations, one in a small town where the rest of the forest employees worked out of, and one that was about two and a half hours away up a really windy mountainous road. The remote duty station had an old Forest Service ranger station and a newer double-wide trailer that was recently put in. When I worked at this place, it had no cell phone reception. When my crew and I weren't working, we were playing horseshoes and watching movies. They did eventually add a cell phone booster, which sadly made people play on their phones, but I digress. So, for my story, I want to keep it pretty simple. But my supervisor from that crew had experienced some weird things as well, working up there. There was one night and he told me he was cowboy camping, and he kept getting a weird, mucusy drop of liquid on his face. 
He kept looking around and even yelling, but no one was around him. He told me he wasn't below any trees, so it wasn't tree sap. He never slept outside there ever again, which leads me to believe he was telling me the truth. Now for what happened to me. I had other interesting experiences at that remote duty station, but this one was scary. It was the night of July 4th and we weren't on a fire, so the crew was playing horseshoes and having a good time. Everyone went to bed pretty early because we were going to have a PT hike the next day. I had my own small room in the double wide trailer and my bed was situated next to a big window. I started dozing off but felt awake still and I hear one of my co-workers outside my window asking me to come outside as I was laying on my side facing the window and I didn't look up. I felt their presence by the window. It felt as though something tall was looming over me from outside. They kept beckoning me and I said no. Pretty quickly, their voice started changing to a deeper, raspier, angrier voice. They started cursing at me. Get the fuck outside. I just froze. It was sort of a demonic voice. I lay frozen, not moving while they yelled at me. Eventually it stopped and I fell asleep. I woke up the next day and wanted to ask my coworker if he was standing outside my window, but I felt too weird. Perhaps this was a mild form of sleep paralysis, but it was still weird. So I live in a county that was pretty rural until the last 10 to 15 years. The biggest town in our county is pretty crowded now, overcrowded and I hate it. I moved from there to the countryside. I like where I live except it can be really creepy at night because for miles and miles it's dark and there's no streetlights. One thing about this county is that the main roads would always get backed up real quick, or if there's an accident or whatever, so it pays to go the back roads. The back roads, like any rural place, are less populated, dark and lots of trees, and there's no sidewalks. Anyway, a few years ago something happened that almost made me stop using them. I was driving home kinda late one night. I decided to take one particular back road that shaved off 10 minutes from my commute home. I was tired and had to get up early, so I was going fast, trying to get home soon. This road is a bit more populated than some, but it's really spooky in some stretches because huge trees are along the side of the road, and their branches and leaves make a tunnel of sorts. So, I'm zipping through and round a curve. Up ahead, I see what I thought was a giant garden flag. You know the flags that people put up in spring in their yards? Well, I thought it was a weird flag because it seemed like it was fairly tall and large, and it was in the middle of the road. As I get closer, my headlights hit it. It's not a flag, it's a person, a lady. She was wearing a red fez. I live in rural Maryland. You just don't see a fez every day. She had on a long flowy white dress and an orange reflective sash across her chest. A little strange because she's in the middle of the street, as I drove past her, it got weirder. As dark as it was, as I drove by, I could see she was about 60. She had glasses and I could see her bright blue eyes. She looked in my passenger window and started doing this weird bounce thing. I thought she was going to try and get into my car. Mind you, I'm going pretty fast. I don't know what it was about her, but she freaked me the fuck out. I didn't think she would rob me. I really thought she was just a soul snatcher or skinwalker. I honestly didn't think she was a human. I can't adequately describe how creepy she was. I sped past her as fast as I could. I kept glancing in my back seat to make sure she had not materialized in my car. I prayed, recited scripture, and kept watch in my rearview mirror. It was spring, so a bit warm, but I felt bone chillingly cold. I finally make it home and run to tell my mom the story. I got in just as my brother was telling my mom about this weird lady he saw as he was driving. And was the same lady, but he saw her at the intersection from the highway in the back road, whereas I saw her further down the road. We both had the same reaction. She also tried looking in his car. She was also bouncing around when he saw her. He said there was a car in front of him that sped off so fast when they drove past the lady. My brother was so freaked out that he won't travel that road anymore, even during the day. 
Eventually, I found out that the lady lives in the woods. Apparently, at one time, her family lived on that road. Her father was ill, and she tried to take him to the hospital. He died on the way there. She drove around with his body in her car for hours. I guess she has mental health issues, and I think she lost the house or got kicked out. I have friends that live off of that street, so when I was talking about it, they knew exactly who it was. I still use that road, but I haven't seen her since. I do hope she's okay, but I really do not want to run into her again. Back around 04 to 05, I was leaving a buddy's house headed home. He lived on Lake Ariel in Wayne County, Pennsylvania. I was a good 15 miles away, so I decided to take the back roads to save time and avoid the cops. As I crest the mountain road, I see a van off the side, doors open and lights on. It's well after midnight and there's no one on the road. I slowed my car a 1989 VW Ragtop, down to first gear. I was looking for a person or persons that may be hurt. Not a soul is around and the woods are quiet. The van off the road is not running, but all the lights are on. Even the driver's door is open. I remember thinking to myself, shit, I don't have cell service until the top of the mountain. I gotta call the cops. So I proceeded to go towards where I knew I had cell service maybe going 30 miles per hour tops. I knew this situation was fucky, but then it got worse. No more than three or so miles away, the brush thinned on the roadside. There, you had a better view of what's in the woods. I see movement, so I let off the gas, thinking I don't want to pace the deer. As I let off, this man, soaking in fresh blood, comes from the tree line and into the road. He's so covered in gore, I couldn't tell it was a man at first. He stumbled out in front of the car and waved me down. I was in my rag top, top down of course. He was yelling and grabbing at my door. I dropped it into first and took off. Another mile or so, I had cell service and called the cops. The guy was obviously hurt. His grab from my door scared me. There was a wide space on the mountain where I agreed to wait for the cops. They met me there in under 10 minutes. While I waited, I put the top up and then locked the doors. An officer took my statement and he looked over my car with the torch. The guy from the woods left a bloody smear down my door. Another officer found the van, but they couldn't locate the guy who came out of the woods. The cops let me go home and said they'd call if they needed anything further. Within a few days, I did get a call. They said the van was located and asked if I could describe the man. They never found him that night, and as far as I know, they never did. Apparently the van was stolen. The cops surmised this guy banged himself up and took off in a panic. As far as I know, they never did track him down. To this day, I keep a lookout for a bloody man running out of the woods. This experience is stuck with me, and it is 100% true. I worked in law enforcement for over 15 years, a small city that had seen better days and worse days. Once upon a time, I'm on patrol in the middle of a very quiet night. I see a kid walking through the redeveloping part of town, lots of abandoned and condemned buildings, and some active businesses and century-old buildings being restored. The kid is kind of tall and overweight, but couldn't have been more than 12 years old or so. He's wearing a zippered hoodie basketball shorts, and just socks on his feet. It's something that tends to pique the interest. So I turn around, catch up to the kid near the corner, and step out to have a talk with him. Another officer calls out that he's been waved down by a woman who's been driving around looking for her grandson. I advise that I'm probably out with him. The kid tries to ignore me and walk around, but I step into his path and tell him he's going to have to stop pretending I'm not there. He says he doesn't know why he has to talk to me, and I say because a 10-year-old walking in a ghost town business district at 4am is something police are supposed to check on. He corrects me that he's 11, then he says he's 16. 
He doesn't know his birthday and tells me his name is LeBron Jones. He said that he's on his way to play video games at a friend's house. And when asked what his friend's name is, he tells me that he lives over there and nods in a vague direction. The grandmother and little brother pull up. Grandma calls him by his real name. He tried to tell us that he doesn't know her and asks if we can bring him back to his dad's house, but he won't tell us where it is. The grandma gets out of the car, brings him his shoes, and says that his dad's stepdad, uncle, or whatever it was, shouldn't have to deal with this shit at 4 a.m., and neither should she or the police. The kid puts on his shoes, and after getting everyone's information, it turns out the story was that he was playing video games all night and was keeping his brother up. He got yelled at for it, and figured he wasn't going to live where he couldn't play Madden at all hours. Juvenile returned to the Guardian. Two paragraph report. No must, no fuss. The creepy part, you ask? Well, the other officer and I standing around the corner BSing for a minute or two, before clearing the call when we hear the faintest of noises. One of our local derelicts had stepped out from a recessed doorway, about 20 feet from our interaction with the runaway. He was there the whole time and almost escaped everyone's notice, even when walking away. We'll call him Eli. Eli was mentally ill and resisted all attempts to treat him. Thousand yard stare, split his nights between couch surfing with relatives and the streets. Frequent calls for him have involved exposing himself in public, urinating and defecating in public, staring at and or following people, standing in traffic, and attacking store employees and police when confronted for shoplifting. Eli says about a word per week on average. That night, he looked right at us and said, Hello guys, it's really nice out tonight. Eli didn't have any history of messing with kids specifically, but if we hadn't stopped the chubby kid, he would have turned down the street and right into Eli's path. The guy that erratic, playing Phantom of the Ghetto and doing an amazing job of it, it's rare that veteran cops get cold water, but we did that night. For some context, I was 16 at the time. This was about two years ago. We lived on a dimly lit road where crime often occurred. Well, my younger sister had thrown a small party for her 15th birthday in May. There were maybe six people, so as it gets around to be two in the morning, people either start leaving or stay the night. There was a girl there who we'll call Liz, but she didn't have a car to pick her up. My mom was already asleep, and none of us could drive yet. Being the mom friend, I decided I'd walk Liz home as she lived in the apartments near my trailer. I put a pocket knife in my jacket pocket, and Liz and I started our six-minute walk. Everything was going pretty good until after I dropped her off. I live on a dimly lit street, and I watch a lot of horror, so I was paranoid as is. That did not get any better when I noticed a blue car following me slowly, with its headlights off. I had a bad feeling, so I called my friend. While I'm on the phone with my friend, I start walking faster and telling her the situation. Well, the car got too close for my liking, so I started running. It picks up speed as well. Halfway down the road, I run into both of my younger sisters, and we walk home together. We get home and I ask why they came. It turns out, my mom woke up from a nightmare that I was hurt. She told them to come get me so I could be safe. I honestly don't know what would have happened to me had they not come, but I was so terrified. I went out to Walmart to grab a couple of things for my dog and two cats. My partner stayed at home, bathrobe clad and comfy as hell. It was close to closing time, so about 10.45pm. I grabbed what I needed and was headed home when I noticed the moon was enormous and blood red. I saw a small, well-lit parking lot overlooking a large field where the moon was in perfect position to photograph over my car. I stopped, got a few shots in. I noticed a white four-door sedan pull into the little side street connecting the parking lot I was in with several other parking lots. They were all fast food drive throughs Anyway, the sedan is bumping pop music from the sound of it. 
The car just stops on the road for a second, facing the parking lot I was in. The person proceeds to turn around, leaving the area. I live in a small, small town, where the most fun you can have on the weekend involves driving around with friends, and maybe popping over to grab some late night fast food, so I didn't think much of it. In the back of my mind, I knew being out, alone, and being a woman, I was bound to attract unwanted attention. Just as I was finishing up, the same damn white four-door sedan pulls into the little side street, pop music still blaring what sounds like the kind of song you'd hear on a kid's pop CD in the early 2000s. As soon as the car pulls into the parking lot and begins driving around to the end where I stood, I see that the car only has one occupant. A male driver who has a window all the way down, sticking his head out the window like a dog, smiling at me like a morbid game show host, showing me the prize behind door number one. I do not hesitate. I'm not in the mood to have a discussion with this person. I'm aware that he scoped me out and decided to come back for whatever reason. Maybe he was parked a little ways away watching me. Who knows? So I calmly walk to the car and get in. He drives past me and goes around again like he overshot his pitch or something. I drive away. He pursues me through a set of lights, turning on a main road. No big deal. There's only two main streets where I live, so there's not much choice. My heart speeds up when he begins flashing his lights at me, driving erratically and honking his horn like a moronic goose chasing a child who got too close to its young. I just drive the speed limit planning on driving straight to the police station in town. He decides to make a different move. This guy passes me, gets in front of me, and slams on his brakes. I was ready for him though. I had slowed way down when I saw him move over the line on the road. By the time he must have realized he wasn't slowing me down, because I was way behind him, he was hitting a bend in the road that leads to a stop sign where there are only two possible turns to make. I had decided to take a random right turn onto another country road that appears right before the bend that the stranger had just flown out of sight on. I made it home safe. It's a shame I didn't get to have a nice time taking pictures of my car. Why do men just show up and expect to talk to whoever they want whenever they want? Not to mention literally chase someone down after clearly being blown off. For a bit of backstory, this creepy encounter happened about a year ago. I had just turned 18. I'm 5 foot 3 but looked much younger than I was. I had just moved out of my parents' home that year and started flooding with some close friends. For reference, I live in a small town in New Zealand where there is almost no crime, and when it does occur, it's almost always something like a small burglary or something like that, so I felt pretty safe at the time. Anyway, on to the story. One afternoon, I was at my flat with three of my flatmates, when they said they were going to pick up a couple of our friends and come straight back, so I decided to stay home since there wasn't enough room in the car. Fast forward about an hour, and they still hadn't come back yet. I checked their snap maps and saw that they had driven to a bigger city about an hour away, and they didn't tell me. Naturally, I was upset and confused about why they had left me, so I tried to message them and got no reply. At that point I was upset about being ditched, and I decided to go for a long walk. So I started walking and decided to walk to my grandma's. She lives about 5 kilometers out of town with my sister. By the time I got there it was about 5pm, and I took a nap until my sister woke me up at about midnight. She asked if I wanted to ride home since she was going to bed. I checked my flatmates locations and could see they were on their way home, but I didn't want to go to the house by myself. I messaged one of my friends Tyler and asked if I could come over until they got back. He said I could. Once I got to Tyler's, we chilled out for a bit, until his mom said I had to leave. So I tried to call my friends to pick me up. They didn't answer. By now, it was 1am. Tyler said he would walk me home, so we started walking the five blocks to my house. After we were about three blocks away, I got a call from my flatmate Chelsea. She said they were back in town and could pick me up in five minutes after dropping someone off. I told her it was okay and that I was almost home. I know this was stupid, but I thought I was safe. I had lived in that town my whole life, 
Nothing like this had ever happened to me or anyone I knew. So I told Tyler he could go home and I would be okay for the rest of the walk by myself. He asked if I was sure. I said yes, so he turned back. We went our separate ways. I put in my earphones and pulled my hood up so nobody could see I was a girl walking alone at night. I was just about to play music when I heard a car coming up the road behind me. I pulled my hood closer around my face and prayed they would keep driving past. To my dismay, the car slowed down almost to a stop directly beside me. The car window rolled down to reveal a 25 to 30 year old man staring at me. The car windows were tinted and I couldn't see if anyone else was in the car. I kept walking, hoping he would leave, but he just drove along beside me and called out to me. Hey girl, what are you doing at this time? He asked me. Going for a walk, I replied, still walking. Do you want a ride? He asked. No thank you, I said. I sped up my walk. I expected him to drive away, but he just sped up his car to match my speed. Come on girl, get in the car. I'll give you a ride home, he insisted. I took a good look at him. There was something about him that gave me the creeps. At this point, I was getting a bit scared. No, my house is just up here, it's fine, I replied, pointing up the street. It wasn't, but I didn't want him to know I was at least two blocks from my house. After that, I put in my earphones again and ignored him. Finally, I heard the car drive away. I breathed a sigh of relief. It's fine. I'm just being paranoid. He was trying to make sure I got home safe. I tried to reassure myself. I watched as the car drove around the next corner. I got to the intersection the car had just gone around and started to cross it. I glanced down the road to see where the car had gone. The street was empty. That's weird, I thought. Being as the car had just gone around the corner, that's when I saw it. A car parked in a driveway about two houses down. I couldn't see what it looked like. There were other cars parked on the street and in other driveways. But I just got the worst feeling in my gut. I knew that it was the same car. I speed walked across the road. And just as I was walking out of sight, I glanced back. To my horror, the car turned on its headlights and was backing out onto the street. I could clearly see it now. It was the same car. I needed to do something. I pulled out my phone. It was on 1%. I rang Chelsea, praying she would answer and that my phone didn't die. She answered. There's a guy in a car following me. I frantically said while checking behind me to see the car turned around the corner, and it was slowly gaining on me. At this point I was preparing myself to either scream bloody murder, or bang on someone's door for help, or fight for my life in case someone got out of the car. What? Where are you? Chelsea screamed into the phone. She sounded more panicked than me. I don't know. I don't remember the street name, I said. At this point, the car was rolling to a stop beside me. All the windows were up. I couldn't see inside. Right at that moment, I saw a car coming through the intersection just ahead. I couldn't believe my eyes. It was Chelsea and my other friend David. I see you. I heard Chelsea yell into the phone just as my phone went flat. They did a U-turn and pulled up ahead of me. I sprinted over and jumped into the car. I was shaking uncontrollably and could barely speak. We drove away and I looked back to see the car do a U-turn. They sped off in the other direction. Later, Chelsea told me they had no idea where I was. They just happened to drive down that street when they did. About a month later, I told my parents what happened. They said that I was probably overreacting, that he was probably making sure I got home okay. That may have well been the case, but I've always had this feeling that the man or man, if there were more in the car, had bad intentions. I can't help but wonder what would have happened if my phone had died earlier, or if Chelsea and David hadn't happened to drive through that intersection when they did. Okay, so here's a very weird experience my ex-girlfriend and I had back in 2004 to 2005 in rural Louisiana. 
We were hanging out at her parents' house on a summer night watching movies. Nothing was out of the ordinary. We were around 16 to 17 at the time, so when 12.30 to 1 a.m. rolled around, it was time for me to head home. I didn't have a vehicle at this point, so she usually dropped me off. Keep in mind this is a rural area in Louisiana, and we lived on complete opposite sides of town. At this time of night, there were hardly any cars on the road. It was rather spooky driving through the wooded areas to get back to my place, which was secluded to say the least. We're about halfway to our destination, and in mid-conversation, she stops talking and asks me if I had noticed the headlights that had been behind us for quite some time. I replied no, I hadn't noticed, but I assured her there was nothing to worry about. We continue our conversation, but now I'm really paying attention to the headlights behind us. I notice they're getting closer. To get to my house, there were a lot of turns down roads that weren't main roads, and these headlights were staying with us. Now, at this point, panic starts to set in for the both of us as we try to come up with the worst case scenario plan. I thought of just pulling into the first driveway, but then I thought, well, what if no one's home? If they were, would they even help at this time of night? Scratch that idea. I had an old flip phone at the time and decided the best course of action was to call my house phone and I hoped my dad would answer. Between that point and us turning down the dead end road, I probably called eight or ten times with no answer. With the headlights still following us at every turn, I told my girlfriend just to pull into my driveway and lay on the horn. We pull in and do just that. The other vehicle pulls in right behind us. No one's coming out of my house, so she decides to cut across my front yard and try to get back on the road. I'm still calling. As we go to turn around, the other car cuts us off, and that's when I got a look at the man. He was probably 50 to 60 years old, large rimmed glasses and smoking a cigarette. Our eyes met, and he gave me the weirdest, creepiest grin. That's when I made my mind that I was going to get out and confront the man. Right as I was building up the courage to do so, my dad ran out the front door. The man in the car then sped away. Needless to say, we didn't get much sleep after that night. She stayed at my place and we reported the incident with the best description we could, but to no avail. So this was early last year or late last year. For some context, I live right across from a state park. My family has lived here our whole lives, and it's a very quaint, quiet road, mostly filled with grandparents and recently retired. The park is always filled with cute families and their dogs, taking a stroll. Basically nothing weird ever happens. Now with that being said, one night, around 9 to 10 p.m., my friend wants me to come over and hang out with her and discuss her wedding. She lived maybe two minutes away. I said, sounds like fun, I'm on my way. From my driveway, if you turn left it's pretty open, and the trees don't cover much of the road. However, if you turn right, there's a lot of trees on either side that make the road darker than it already is, since our road has no street lamps. To go to my friend's house, I have to turn right. As I'm going down the road, I notice the figure of a man, tall, slim, dark clothing in a backpack, possibly long hair, walking down the opposite side of the road. As I get closer, I notice he's walking backwards, just staring at me. Obviously, I slow down a bit because I don't want to possibly hit the man, but as I passed him, he kept complete, soul-piercing eye contact with me, whilst still walking backwards. I got immediate chills down my spine. My stomach turned into a bottomless pit. Once my neck couldn't turn anymore, I sped up and ran through the stop sign because I didn't want any possibility of him getting closer to me. I have never gotten such bad vibes from a human in my life. I didn't see him again on the way back home, and actually I have no idea if he wanted to hitch a ride or what. But why he was staring me down like prey, I'll never know. Two nights ago, my boyfriend and I were leaving a friend's house in the sketchy part of town at around 1.30 in the morning. I stopped at a stop sign at the end of the street, 
and while stopped, I noticed a man standing in the middle of the road. The man was approximately six foot tall, white, lean built, with a short haircut and wearing a zip-up hoodie and jeans. The man didn't move for a moment. He just stared intensely at my boyfriend who was sitting in the passenger seat. He appeared to be reaching for something in his pocket while grabbing his stomach. He started walking in front of my car while maintaining eye contact with my boyfriend who immediately felt uncomfortable and locked the doors. Out of nowhere, the man made a beeline for the passenger door and attempted to pull it open. My boyfriend screamed dry and I swerved around the man and drove off. For reference, I'm a 27-year-old female. This story takes place 10 years ago when I was 17. I had just started university and was excited about having a fresh new start since I'd always been a nerdy outcast in high school. I had never had a boyfriend before. I had never even been on a date. I was naive and optimistic about boys. My introverted and awkward personality hadn't magically changed since entering university. So it's safe to say I didn't meet any interesting guys at school. One late night, I was in my room working on an assignment on my laptop when I received a request on MSN Messenger. The email address was a boy's name with some numbers. The name was clearly ethnic and likely someone of the same origin as me. Intrigued, I accepted. We'll call this boy Ken. We got to chatting and I asked him how he'd gotten my email address. He dodged the question. I let it go, not thinking too much of it. This was from a time when it was normal to accept anyone and everyone as a friend on Facebook and other social media platforms. As Ken and I continued to talk, I learned that he lived in my city and apparently wasn't much older than me. As I'd guessed, our roots were in fact in the same country. I asked him why he didn't have a picture of himself on his display picture and this prompted him to suggest that we turn on our webcams because he wanted to see me too. I declined, but he insisted. Somehow he convinced me, and we both switched on our webcams. I was pleasantly surprised and somewhat relieved to see that Kevin was a good-looking young guy, chatting to me from the comfort of his bedroom, seemingly very normal. Our MSN chats carried on for a couple of weeks. They developed into tech, and we'd even had a few phone calls, after I'd agreed to give him my number, of course. I started to develop a crush on Ken. He'd asked me to go out with him a couple of times, but I was always pretty busy with school and our schedules weren't lining up. Finally, we did find one afternoon when we were both three, and we decided to schedule a lunch date. Ken had a car and offered to pick me up from my university after I was done for the day. I was a bit too dressed up for my C-plus programming class, but just right for the lunch date, we planned at a local vegetarian restaurant. Stupidly, I didn't tell any of my friends where I was going, or whom I'd be with, because I was embarrassed about going on my very first date, at almost the age of 18, with someone who had randomly added me on MSN. I waited outside my building when a black car with heavily tinted windows pulls up beside me. The passenger side window rolled down, and sure enough, there was Ken sitting in the driver's seat. I was happy to see that he was as cute in person as he was on webcam. However, what I was not expecting was the intense smell of weed floating out of the car. Not relevant, but part of the first impression. Admittedly, I was a bit taken aback and was concerned that he might be driving high. He unlocked the doors and motioned for me to get in, so I did without dispute. As I sat down in the passenger seat, he immediately put his hand on my thigh. I nervously shifted my leg away. So, I started. Do you know where the restaurant is? I can guide you if you want. He smirked at me, but didn't say anything. He just started driving. Okay. Kind of weird, I thought. Maybe he was just nervous or awkward, both of which I can sympathize with. So I let it be. I was about to try my hand at small talk which I'm no good at, when I noticed him heading towards the highway ramp. I started to worry because the restaurant was not far from my campus, and there was no reason for us to be getting the highway. You don't need to take the highway. The restaurant is really close by. I can guide you. I try to keep my voice steady, but I could hear my own nervousness. Ken finally spoke. 
for the first time since I'd gotten into that car. I thought maybe we could just go by my place instead. We can play Need for Speed and I can make lunch for you. I was 17, on my way to the house of a guy I'd just met for the first time, and I hadn't told anyone where I was going. My mind was racing. I knew this would be an utterly stupid thing to do, despite the clear red flags waving in my face. I decided that I didn't want to ruin our first date by rejecting his offer to make me lunch and play Need for Speed together, which I told him I liked playing. So, like an idiot, I reluctantly agreed to avoid being rude. We made it to his house, and it was apparently his family's home. It was situated in a sort of shady neighborhood. We stepped inside, and of course, no one was home except us. It was sparsely furnished and looked unkempt, which struck me as pretty odd for a family home. He informed me that his Xbox was in his bedroom. I hesitated in the doorway, but he sat at the foot of his bed in front of the TV and patted the empty space beside him for me to have a seat. There was literally nowhere else to sit in his room, so I cautiously sat down, keeping as much distance as I could between us. I started to relax as we played Need for Speed, and he made us a peanut butter and jelly sandwich to munch on. I was about to laugh at myself for being overly paranoid when Ken did something bizarre. He got up onto the bed and sat down directly behind me, his legs on either side of me. He tried to guide my hands on the controller. I started to ask him what he was doing, and as if this wasn't uncomfortable enough, his hands moved from the controller and slid up onto my shirt. That's when I really started to panic. I thought he was trying to touch my chest, but instead, he started squeezing and massaging my belly. I was more than a little chubby back then, so you can't imagine what it might have been like. I dropped the controller in pure shock and quickly stood up, fixing my shirt. I was at a loss for words, and he did nothing but smirk at me and tell me that he liked it. I felt completely disgusted and violated. I had had enough. I lied to him and told him that I had a group project to work on and needed to go. He asked where I lived so he can drop me off. Thankfully, I had the common sense not to tell him. I asked him to drop me back off at school instead. That was where I was supposedly meeting my classmates. He obliged. After our very uncomfortable first date, I decided I didn't want to talk to Ken anymore. I didn't block him on MSN or my phone. Our only two methods of communication but I rarely responded to his messages and I ignored all of his calls. Once, he messaged me on MSN at around 11pm, asking me to come over and telling me he would send a cab to bring me over to his place. Thoroughly annoyed, I responded, What do you take me for? Why do you even think I would want to do that? He replied, saying, No sex, I promise. I was bizarre. I was disgusted and didn't even respond. He continued trying to get in touch with me for months, and then suddenly vanished. I'd figured he'd finally gotten the point. Now, I wish the story ended here, but it doesn't. I last heard from Ken in late February. He had stopped trying to contact me shortly after Valentine's Day. In April, two nuclear family members and I went on holiday to visit another relative. We'll call her Anne, and she was living in the Caribbean at the time. Anne, whom I love dearly, was, and still is, a bit of an eccentric. She considers herself very spiritual, and is an active member of a large, well-known spiritual organization. She is deeply connected with the country of my roots, and goes back for frequent visits. While we stayed with her in the Caribbean, she told us about her most recent spiritual trip back home, where she met a wealthy and well-connected local woman through the organization. They quickly became very close friends. We'll call her Connie, the con artist. During our visit, Anne introduced us to Connie virtually over Skype. We chatted with her a couple of times throughout our vacation and got to know her a bit. Little did we know back then that Connie, who Anne had spontaneously met halfway across the world, would soon wreak utter havoc on our lives. Now that's a story that I'm just not and may never be ready to tell because of how many lives were affected and the severity of the damage that had been inflicted. What you need to know is that Connie was an outright criminal and con artist. She'd been targeting our family from long before Anne had actually met her. Their meeting was no coincidence. 
Not only did she manage to steal over a hundred thousand from our family, but she took away any peace of mind or sense of security we ever had. When we finally caught on and confronted her, she insisted that we were mistaken, but she disappeared into thin air once we forced her out of our lives. You are probably wondering what on earth this has to do with my story about Ken. Well, get this. The situation with Connie lasted many months. The whole thing is kind of a blur to me now, but we first spoke to her online in April, and I remember the whole ordeal lasting well into the fall. While she normally resided in the country of my roots, Anne had invited her to visit and stay with us where we presently live. That's when things really took a turn for the worse. Some of the things I clearly remember and are important to the story are. Number one, the whole time she was staying with us, she was trying to convince me to transfer schools to a very obscure school program in the US. She was actually getting very pushy about it. And number two, she had asked me if I was a virgin and told me to save myself for my husband. Disturbing, I know. During this time, I was so emotionally drained and stressed that I really didn't think anything of it. In fact, I had stopped socializing almost entirely, and even started habitually skipping classes. I had lost contact with my high school friends, and my university friends were too new to really care, so my strange behavior and new destructive habits went unnoticed. Fast forward to one day, after Connie's final disappearance in the fall, I was at home with my dad when my cell phone rang. I looked at the caller ID, and it was a number I didn't have saved so it was showing the contact information as whatever name the phone was registered under. My heart dropped into my stomach. My phone displayed a name. The first name was a man's name, and the last name was the same as Connie's. I started to panic and ran into my bedroom to answer the call. I had no idea what to expect. When I picked up the phone, I was greeted by a familiar voice. It was Ken. I honestly thought I was going to puke when I came to the sudden realization that he had been a part of this whole sick plot. Of course, I don't have hard evidence to prove he was connected to Connie, but let me explain. The timing of his appearance and reappearance into my life, the last name, which was a very unique one, and it originated from where Connie was from, and also the fact he contacted me out of the blue. I had no idea why or how. It's all just too bizarre to be a mere coincidence. Of course, I freaked out at Ken when he called. I told him to never call me again, and I told him I would call the police. His response was just a weird, dry half laugh. And then he said, Well, okay then, in the most creepy voice you can think of, and hung up. I knew in my gut that this was their last attempt to get back in touch, trying to slither their way back into my family's lives. Thankfully, I never heard from Ken again after that day. A while after this all ended, I was having a conversation with a family member. We were talking about the whole ordeal, and she told me she sent something extremely wrong when Connie was pushing to have me sent off to the US, to that obscure school. She had an unshakable feeling that Connie was involved in some sort of human trafficking scene, and that if I left, she never would have seen me again. The horrifying pieces came together for me at that time. I was just too damn naive to have seen it before. The memories flooded back to me when I heard that. How Ken had told me, no sex, I promise, when he invited me over, and how Connie was telling me to remain a virgin. As I said, I had never told a soul about Ken, nor about the weird V-card conversation with Connie. I strongly and firmly believed that Ken had been some sort of player in Connie's game, that he was just there to keep me away from guys and prevent me from having a boyfriend. For those who may be wondering, we never called the police on Connie or Ken because nothing illegal happened at face value. It's very hard to explain. I'll also mention that I tried to find Ken online many times after this all ended. I wasn't even able to find a sliver of information on him. Not by the name Ken, nor by the name on the caller ID. It was as if he didn't exist. I'm also awful at directions and didn't even remember his address or where his house was exactly. I hope this can serve as a warning to young people to never trust anyone, to do your thorough checks on people, especially those you meet online, and to be very aware and weary of people's intentions. Stay safe, everyone. And to Ken and Connie, rot in hell.
This happened years ago, but still affects me to this day. The summer after I graduated high school, I was still living at home. I was up late one night and was packing for a camping trip with my friends. It was unbelievably hot and I had the window open as I sat in folded clothes. It was around 2 in the morning and the next thing I knew, there was a hand coming through the gap in the screen of my window. I screamed and the hand flew back out. I was stunned, but there was a part of me that wondered if it was my younger brother pranking me. I got up and looked out the window and just saw the figure of a man staring back at me. I ran into my brother's bedroom and he was there playing video games. We called the police who came and searched the area. They didn't find anything. They warned my parents and I to lock the doors and windows and left. We were all still shaken up and my mom had a feeling he would come back. It turns out her mother's intuition was right. She went outside and waited on our back porch. After 20 minutes or so, she saw a man, dressed in black, slink into our backyard along the tree line, slowly working his way towards my window. My mother yelled something to him and he took off running. The police came back out and again, they found no trace of him. I never opened that window again, not even the curtains. My parents installed some motion detecting lights and that seemed to be the end of that. About six months later, my friend and I got an apartment downtown together. We were really excited as this was our first place on our own. The apartment wasn't exactly the best quality, but it was so fun to be living in the city. The downside was that it was street parking only, and after a few weeks, my car was broken into. Nothing was taken, but a single row sat on the passenger seat. It was creepy, but I found to be vigilant and safe. I always tried to park close to the entrance, near the lights, but often it was difficult to get close to those spots. I would often have to park farther away on darker streets. Things quickly began escalating at this point. My car was broken into at least once a week. Most of the time a flower was left, but once a pair of men's underwear was left, and even more creepily, once a bag of Tootsie Rolls as they were my favorite candy. This made me wonder if the person knew me personally, and I started to become suspicious of everyone. There was a laundry area in the basement of the apartment. One day I went down to get a load that finished drying. As I started to fold, I realized all of my undergarments, bras and panties, were all gone. Another week I had a male friend over from school. His tires got slashed during the visit. By the time the first letter arrived, I had already started making plans to move elsewhere. The letter described a love for me that had been going on for years. The person noted things that proved he'd been watching me closely. I was able to arrange for another friend to take over my lease. I moved in with another friend on the other side of the city. It was a secured building and had an underground parking garage that was only accessible to tenants. I felt much more secure and the extra money spent was well worth the peace of mind. Things were quiet for a few months and then my roommate got a boyfriend. Most of us were wary of Ashley's new boyfriend from the beginning. For one, they met on MySpace after he reached out to her. Another reason was that the new boyfriend, Matt, was extremely good looking. And while Ashley was a wonderful person, she just wasn't the type you would typically expect someone like him to date. Ashley was thrilled. She never had a boyfriend and really felt like he was her Prince Charming. Now, I thought he was weird and creepy from the beginning. Matt was on the quiet side and always seemed to be sporting an uncomfortable, leering smile. It was difficult to carry on any sort of conversation with him because he would always make it weird with some random facts that were completely unrelated to what we were talking about. I had to delete my MySpace when the initial stalking began, but I did create a dummy account to learn more about Matt. It didn't look like he really knew any of his friends in real life. There were only pictures of himself and the rest of the information was vague. My friends and I gently tried to discourage her from seeing Matt. He technically hadn't done anything wrong, but he was just so strange. She would immediately get defensive and would shut the conversation down. Matt started to spend more time at the apartment and I found myself finding any excuse I could to avoid coming home. One day I came home from work and found Matt on the couch, alone, drinking a beer. Ashley had been called into work and she told him he could just hang out. I was furious because I didn't want to spend any time with him, so I grabbed a beer and a snack and headed off to my room and shut the door. About 30 minutes or so, 
He knocked on my door and suggested we watch some TV and get to know each other better, because we both loved Ashley. I did not want to, but I decided that maybe I needed to give it a try. He put on a movie and I tried to just focus on it because I didn't want to talk. At one point, I glanced over to Matt. He was staring at me with a smile on his face. I snapped a what at him. He just continued smiling and said, I just can't believe it. Believe what? I asked. He said nothing and went back to watching the movie, still smiling. I had no idea what he was talking about, but the interaction had every hair standing up on my body. I excused myself and locked the door to my room. Another month or so went on, and I had managed to avoid being home for much beyond sleep and showering. Matt practically lived there. He even brought a bunch of his things into Ashley's room. I really didn't want to move again, but I was beginning to look for other options. On their six-month anniversary, I saw a huge bouquet of flowers on the table and an already open card propped up next to it. I rolled my eyes and was about to leave when I decided to see what that weirdo wrote to her. When I opened the card, my heart started beating through my chest. Without even reading the words he wrote, I was shaking. The handwriting was exactly the same as the note my stalker left me in my car. I had kept them as evidence and dug them out of my desk for comparison. The handwriting was unique and identical. Matt was the stalker. I called the police first. As they were on their way, I called Ashley and asked her to come over. She was at work but said she would be there when she could. I was terrified to tell her because I knew she would be shattered. The police took a statement from me and actually went to Ashley's work to get more information about her. They ended up breaking the news. Apparently Ashley called Matt and left a furious message, even though the cops told her not to say anything. He completely disappeared after that. There was no Matt or anyone matching his resemblance at the place he said he worked. Ashley had never been to his apartment because he said he'd been staying with friends while trying to save money for a trip to Europe. His family lived out of state and she had never met a friend of his because he said they had a falling out, because he was choosing to spend so much time with Ashley. It was all lies, and in the end, she was dating a stranger. We don't even know if Matt was his real name. The cherry on top of this whole thing was when we went through Matt's things. He had left everything when he disappeared. Ashley and I decided to go through everything. There was a duffel bag that was full of gym clothes, but in one of the compartments... There were about 10 pictures of me. All were taken from far away, with the exception of one, which was of me sleeping. The sheets were current, so I know it had to have been taken at the current apartment, before I started locking my bedroom door. A few pictures dated back before the incident at my parents' house, which made us think that was him as well. Two pairs of my missing underwear were there, and I shuddered to think what he did with the rest. There was a Starbucks lid with my red lipstick marks, a necklace I hadn't even noticed missing, and a few other random sick souvenirs. The police never tracked him down. I decided to accept an opportunity overseas that I'd been considering, but I got the hell out of there. Unfortunately, Ashley and I quickly drifted apart. She had a really hard time accepting that her first love was a complete psycho. I think I had some underlying anger for believing all of his lies and letting him into our lives. I don't know what his endgame was. Would he have tried to hurt me? Or was he simply content with being in my world? I'll never know. Being stalked changes you, even when I lived across the world. I looked over my shoulder everywhere I went. I still have no social media accounts attached to my real name. I am married with children and know that he moved on to torment some other poor woman. But every time I visit my hometown, I am tense and keep a low profile. Part of me will always worry that Matt will resurface again. I'm a 25-year-old female, and for some backstory, when I was about 15, I met this guy who would eventually become one of my best friends. We'll call him Dave. Dave and I had lots of mutual friends, so we saw each other a lot. Now, Dave is a gay man, but when we first met, he was so deep in the closet he could find Narnia. 
When I was 16, one of our mutual friends threw a Halloween party. Dave brought the guy who would eventually become my long-term boyfriend. We'll call him Alan. Him and Alan met in their sophomore year of high school and have been best friends ever since. Alan knew Dave was gay since the day they've met. I knew Dave was gay because of the stuff he was looking at on the internet. Yet it took another year and a half after Alan and I started dating for him to come out of the closet. We were happy he finally felt comfortable enough to come out. Not long after, that's when Dave met his first boyfriend. And that's where our story begins. I believe that Dave met this guy while on a camping trip. While this guy who we'll be calling Jimmy was a few years older than us, about 25 at the time. Dave and Alan were both 20 and I was 18. I had just graduated high school. The entire story takes place from May to July 2012. Dave and Jimmy had only been dating like two weeks before I got to meet him. Dave drove up to my parents' condo with Jimmy in the car to pick me up. We were going to have lunch together. Well, I wasn't ready yet, so I told them to come upstairs for a minute while I finished my makeup. Dave had been there plenty of times and knew which unit was my parents. They come in, I finish my makeup, and about ten minutes later we're off. Now lunch was good and Jimmy seemed nice. After lunch, Dave drops me back off home because I had somewhere else to be in the morning. I didn't want to be out late. About two hours later, I'm in my room watching TV with my dog when my mom pops her head in and asks if I know a guy named Jimmy. Turns out, Jimmy was at the front door asking for me. David dropped him off at the library, which was about two blocks away from my house because he wanted to check Facebook while Dave went and ran some errands. He'd gotten bored of that and walked to my house to see if I wanted to hang out. My mom lets him in and we went to my room. He then proceeds to lay across my bed like it's his and talks to me. So much for my TV show. I text Dave and tell him where Jimmy is, that he should come and get him because I have things to do tomorrow. I need to be asleep at a good time. It takes Dave about 45 minutes to show up. And during that time, Jimmy is laying across my bed asking me about myself. No red flags are going off at this point because I'm just annoyed. I was enjoying my evening watching TV. Eventually Dave shows up, but before Jimmy leaves, he asks for my cell phone number. I give it to him and he leaves. The next few days go by uneventful, but then I get a message from Jimmy. He states that he thinks I'm really cool and wants to hang out with me. I tell him that me and Alan hang out a lot with Dave, so he'll probably see a lot of me. He then states that he would like to hang out with it just being the two of us. He said, I would prefer us to hang out alone sometime, so we can get to know each other more. Now this is when red flags started to go off. He keeps getting more and more pushy, and eventually when I message one of my friends and tell her about what's going on, she then comes over and reads the messages. She starts sending him random shit from my phone to get him to leave me alone, which did work, but only for a while. Now I'm not sure how this happened, but Jimmy had lost his place to live and needed somewhere to go, so he moved in with Alan and his roommate at the time. Dave still lived at home, and he couldn't come out to his parents yet, so Jimmy couldn't move in with him. It's a small two-bedroom apartment, but they managed to fit a full second-sized mattress into Alan's room on the floor, and that's where Jimmy slept. Except Dave was constantly over there, so it was Alan, Jimmy, and Dave while sleeping in one room. Now his room was always occupied by Jimmy and Dave, so me and Alan never got much time to be alone together. Which was fine, they made good company, until Dave wasn't around. Jimmy was an absolute horrible roommate. He never cleaned up after himself, never contributed to food in the fridge. He didn't even have a car, so Dave drove him everywhere. It was a good thing that Alan's roommate was never home and didn't give two shits as long as nobody entered his room and that rent was paid on time. However, me and Alan were getting tired of his shit, but we put up with him because we both cared about Dave, and Dave was in love with this guy. After the whole text thing, I tried to ignore Jimmy, but every chance he got, he tried to talk to me. I tried to ignore it as politely as I could. I never did tell Dave or Alan about the texts. I didn't want to start drama. He would flirt with me and give me hugs that were too long, put his hands on my shoulders or legs while sitting down. I usually pushed him off and moved away from him. Not long after this started, he started asking me things like, how long have you and Alan been together? He seems kinda like an asshole. Are you happy with him? 
That made me more uncomfortable. Alan and I don't do public displays of affection because we think it's unnecessary and he treats me like a human being instead of a damn flower. So he's not up my ass, holding me every chance he gets. But then Jimmy took it a step too far. This was a few weeks after Jimmy moved in. I was sleeping in Alan's bed. We had finally gotten some alone time that afternoon. We did what most hormonal young adults do. Afterwards, I was tired and wanted a nap. So I put on a tank top and my underwear and curled up under the blankets. Alan decided to let me sleep for a while. And afternoon turned into evening. And now Jimmy was there. Alan was in the living room with his roommate. Jimmy decided it would be a good idea to spend some of that alone time with me while I was sleeping in my underwear. Now I had felt a warm body pressed up against my back. I was still out of it and figured it was Alan. A while later, I heard a loud, What the fuck are you doing? And then I woke up. It wasn't Alan spooning me as I slept. It was Jimmy. He had taken off his shirt lifted the blankets, and crawled into Alan's bed and cuddled with me while I was asleep. Alan was furious. Jimmy insisted that it was harmless and he wasn't doing anything wrong. I was mortified and creeped out beyond belief. Afterwards, I came forward to Alan and showed him the text. When he told Dave about it, Dave refused to believe that Jimmy would do something like this. Then I started getting texts from Jimmy again. He said he was sorry if I took his actions the wrong way. He sent me something like, You remind me of someone, like a girlfriend from a past life. I just want to be closer to you. After this, Jimmy got kicked out of the apartment. Dave was pissed at us, but Alan refused to put up with his shit anymore. Dave and Jimmy dated for about another month. After they broke up, he apologized to us, and now he doesn't talk about him except to call him a piece of shit. Me and Alan are still together to this day. And we're both still close to Dave. So close to the point his mother invites us over to family functions. Dave has moved on, came out to his parents, and has had a wonderful boyfriend for the last four years. This one also has never tried to spoon me. I had forgotten about all of this until last year when I went to Walmart with my dad one day. We were there to get something, but we had wanted to check on the price of ammo for his 9mm. Turns out... Jimmy now works in the sporting goods section at the local Walmart. He tried to make eye contact with me while he checked the prices of ammo for my dad. After leaving, my dad mentioned how he noticed the guy kept looking at me. I just called him a creep and left it at that. I've never been more thankful to leave a Walmart. So I've been on Grinder for about 10 years, and I've had plenty of fucked up experiences. This one in particular reminds me of when I was at a party without my car, and my phone was on 10%. But a decently hot Grinder guy said he would pick me up, that we could hang at his place before he drove me home. So of course I jumped on the opportunity. Anyway, we got to his place and he got me pretty drunk, but he never tried to make a move. I assumed he was going to wait and just convince me to stay the night later. Finally, my phone died like after two hours. I didn't even have to say anything before he noticed it was dead. He then stood up and said, Well, let's go to the car then. When I asked if he had a charger I could use, he just said no. After we got in the car, he got kind of quiet and less flirty. I spaced out, enjoying his music and looking out the window. I didn't even notice that he never asked me where I lived until I realized we'd been driving for over an hour, not even towards my town, but into the canyons. I asked where he was going and he just said, I thought we could just go for a drive. And my drunk ass was like, okay. So anyway, to make a long story shorter, he ended up taking us four or five miles down a dirt road with no signs or houses until it dead-ended into this cabin with no lights or cars outside. He parked and then turned the car off. That's when the dread started to creep in as I sobered up. I said I drank too much and should probably head home, but he didn't even respond. He just sat there, staring at the cabin, and he said, You said you like being kinky. You're pretty submissive, correct? I responded, Uh, sure, but I just meant like, normal rough kind of shit, nothing wild. He started sounding a little annoyed and his sentences seemed a little less carefully worded. 
kind of like he was just spitting out the bare minimum of each thought. He said something about how some of his favorite people are those who can find pleasure in pain. If someone goes into shock enough times, eventually it becomes like a drug and they crave more. Then something about how pushing a person into the deep end is the fastest way to teach them how to swim. At that point I was scared enough to assert myself and firmly said, Okay, well that sounds fun and all, but just not tonight. I just want to go home now. This place is creepy. He just sighed and gripped his keys tighter. Then right as I glanced at his phone sitting in the cup holder, right before it occurred to me to grab it, he snatched it up so fast and held it in his left hand kind of behind his head to make it clear he wasn't going to let me near it. I made this kind of, what, sound, and he just gave me this almost, I'm proud of you son, half smile like dads do when they pat you on the shoulder or something. And it was quiet and he kept looking me up and down for a minute or so. Then he got a little more gruff and said, let's go inside. I have these friends you'll really like once you meet them. You'll feel a lot better or something to that extent, but he wasn't even trying to sound genuine or comforting, like he'd been doing so well earlier in the night. Finally, I lied and spoke up a bit and told him. I told my roommates and my friend I was meeting up with you before you picked me up, and I sent screenshots of your face and some of the conversation. They're gonna freak out if I don't charge my phone and reply to them in the next few hours. I tried not to make it sound accusatory, more like I was just worried about my friends going crazy, but it was clear he knew what I was implying. At that point, he let out an exasperated, grunty sigh. He started the car and we drove away. Driving back, I got nervous about him stalking me and coming after me in the future, so I tried to apologize and tell him I'd be down to hang out another time, maybe. But tonight just wasn't great for me. Blah, blah, blah. He didn't say a single word the whole drive back. Didn't ask where I lived but he dropped me off at the McDonald's about 40 miles away from my apartment. When I was stepping out of the car, he suddenly leaned over and gave me a hard shove. I almost fell out the rest of the way. He grabbed my backpack off the floor and flung it out of his window across the parking lot. He peeled out with the passenger door still open. He broke my laptop and cracked my phone. I had to ask a stranger to use her charger and call an Uber, but at that point I was just so anxious to get home I didn't give a shit. What's so weird is how, while this was happening, even though I was terrified, I guess I wasn't thinking about exactly what he was planning on doing with me. I just knew I needed to get away. So it wasn't until I got home and got in the shower that I realized how messed up the situation was and what might have happened if I let him walk me into the cabin and all that stuff. I just remember being so shaken and smacked by the reality of it. It almost felt like a panic attack. So I sat down in the shower with my head between my knees. I cried till it ran cold and got out. I woke my roommate up to tell him about it, and he kind of calmed me down. So while I still have a grinder account, I just use it as an ego boost. I'm reluctant to meet up with anyone from it now. Anyway, girls and gays, I suppose the moral of the story is that we gotta be careful out there. This happened in 2011. I'd just gotten out of a rough relationship a few months prior to this happening. My friends encouraged me to try dating again, so I caved and made a profile on the website Plenty of Fish. I was very surprised with how many messages I'd received within the first few hours. Most were just people saying hi or asking to hook up. I wasn't looking for a hookup, so I ignored those messages. After about a week, a guy roughly an hour away from me messaged me. He was cute, so I messaged him back. The conversation was pretty casual at first. He asked if I'd like to go for a coffee sometime. And not thinking anything of it, I said sure. This is where it started to get weird. He started to get pushy and ask when we could grab a coffee. I told him I didn't have my own car, so I'd have to borrow my mom's car to meet up with him. He offered to come pick me up, but I wasn't comfortable with that idea. The next message made my blood run cold. It read, I'm sure your hometown isn't that big. If I knocked on a few doors, someone would be able to tell me where you lived. Are you crazy? I replied. I'm sorry, but that's kind of creepy. 
This just pissed him off. He messaged me a couple of times after this, saying, You know I have a big gun. I could shoot you and make you disappear. No one would look for you. You're nothing but a dirty slut. I could kill you. I'll throw you down a well and no one will ever find you. I was really scared at this point, so I asked him to please leave me alone. He replied with the following. I know where your hometown is. It's not a big town. I can find you. At this point I had enough and blocked him. I reported his account to Plenty of Fish and deleted my account. I was really on edge for the next few weeks after the fact. I was afraid he was actually going to come look for me. This took place a couple of years ago, but believe me when I tell you it's still relevant. A year ago, I met a guy at a bar. He called himself Joy. I wasn't looking for anything serious, and apparently, neither was he. We got along great and started hooking up until things started to get weird. He began being more intimate, telling me about his life, and specifically about his ex-girlfriend that killed herself not even a year ago. I honestly felt bad for him and tried to comfort him telling him it wasn't his fault and stuff. At some point, I don't really know when, we became exclusive. We weren't a proper couple, but we decided not to sleep with anyone else. Or so I thought. I found out he'd been seeing other women, and honestly, I was pissed. For me, honesty is a very important thing. He seemed to be toying around with me. I set my mind and ended it with him, to which he didn't seem to care. Now I was kind of sad and angry at myself since I felt played with, and I should have known better. That didn't last long though since he kept texting me like usual, asking me to hang out as normal. I told him I wasn't interested, and that I honestly didn't want to waste my time anymore. Then things got creepy. He accused me of seeing someone else, said I was dishonest, and even called me names like slut and that kind of thing. I wouldn't have it. I told him he was mental and he should stay away from me. He threatened to end himself. At this point, it was beyond clear to me that he was either on drugs or mentally unbalanced. Either way, and because I have a history with suicide, I was really triggered by that. The thought of someone I know dying and me not doing anything about it wouldn't let me sleep, even if it was just blackmail. So I text one of his friends and tell him to just check on him. A couple of days passed and he called me saying he was sorry that it had been a rough couple of weeks for him and that he really wanted to see me just to talk. I naively accepted. We decided to meet up at a bar we used to go to and we mostly sat in silence. I was still kind of hurt and in no way was I planning to get back with him. I guess I just wanted to know he was okay. The few words we exchanged were to order some drinks and some fries. It was almost as if he was ignoring me and I got tired pretty quick. I finished my beer, left my part of the money on the table, and told him to have a good life. As I was leaving, even more pissed than before, I heard someone running behind me. Tired, I turned to face someone who was probably him, and felt a cold shiver down my spine when I saw the look on his face. It was honestly like he was possessed. He caught up to me and shoved me to the wall with his hand on my throat. You are not going to leave me like that, he yelled squeezing his hand. Now never in my life had I been in a situation like this before, so the fear paralyzed me. But bless the waiter who ran after this maniac because he didn't pay the rest of his bill. I guess he had some experience with troublemakers, because in a few seconds he had him locked down under his arm. I rested against the wall, crying and coughing, while the waiter called for help. I thanked him, but left for home immediately. I only told my best friend what had happened and my fear turned to anger. I wanted to rip that guy apart, but I'm smarter than that. I'm 160 centimeters, and I didn't exactly exercise in any way. If someone was going to be ripped apart, it was me. So I let it pass, under the condition that if he contacted me again, I would find a way to end him. He never contacted me again. So why am I telling this story now, you ask? Well, about two months ago I saw it. Not in person, but on TV. He's being accused of the murders of three girls who were his girlfriends at the time. 
he's being classified as a serial killer, and the year where he was inactive between the last kill and the second to last was the year we went out. Why didn't I report it to the police? Well, I tried. However, they told me I was useless since I hadn't seen him in years. I'm not afraid anymore, but I am sad. I'm sad thousands of women, especially in my country, get killed every year and very few people take the time to find those responsible. Dear Joy, I'm not the insecure, weak girl I was back then. For your sake, let's not meet again. This took place 20 years ago when I was 12 years old. Almost all of the details were kept from me at the time due to my age, so I didn't find out until much later what actually took place. My mother, understandably, still doesn't really like talking about any of this, as it was a really traumatic experience. It's only with hindsight that I've realized how genuinely creepy and horrific this whole situation was. In early 2000, I had just started high school, we lived a little way from school, so my mother used to drop me off in the mornings and pick me up in the afternoons. On the 15th of February that year, I headed to meet my mom at the usual pickup point across the road from my school, but I was surprised to find my grandmother waiting for me there instead. My grandmother told me that my mom wasn't able to pick me up, so I went with her and we picked up my brother from his primary school. We went back to our grandparents' house and my nana and grandfather sat us down to tell us that something terrible had happened. Our mom's closest friend, Vivian, had died the previous day. They didn't go into any detail other than my mom was extremely upset. We were upset too. Vivian was a lovely lady and we'd spent a lot of time at her house over the years. It wasn't only because my mom and Vivian were close, but also because Vivian's husband, Andrew, was my brother's Cub Scout leader and one of their sons was my brother's friend. At that age, nobody I knew had ever died so it was quite difficult to process what had happened. We'd only just seen her the previous week. From my perspective as a naive 12-year-old, the following days passed mostly without incident, apart from my mother's obvious sadness. In hindsight, there was also an air of disquiet around her, but I didn't really clock it at the time. Around two weeks after Vivian's death, I was at home with my mother and brother while my stepfather was out for dinner with a client. It was early evening, perhaps 7 p.m., I believe my older sister was at her boyfriend's house, while my younger sister was at basketball practice. Our house had a large, open-plan L-shaped room which encompassed the kitchen, living room, and dining room areas. My brother was playing in his bedroom while I was sitting on the couch watching TV in the living room area with my mom. From that vantage point, I had a clear view of the front door. The security light on our front porch flickered on, and then there was a knock at the door. My mother got up to answer it and as she opened the door, she took a step backwards and visibly stiffened. It was Vivian's husband, Andrew. He was standing on our porch, asking to see my stepfather. I remember my mom explaining that my stepdad wasn't available to talk at the moment, and that if Andrew needed to speak to him, then it would be better to leave a message. Andrew clearly realized my stepdad wasn't home and insisted on waiting for him. My mom repeated that it would be better to call another time, but he easily sidestepped her into the house and strode into the living room area. And I can still picture my mother's forced cheeriness and frozen smile as he sat down on the couch opposite mine. He asked for a cup of tea while he waited. Mom, still with a strange smile plastered to her face, asked me to make the tea while she told V's husband that she'd call to find out what time my stepdad would be home. I made tea for all three of us and sat back down on the couch making awkward small talk with him while my mom repeatedly dialed my stepdad's mobile number. He wasn't answering. Andrew was talking to me, but I remember thinking it was rude that he didn't seem to be paying much attention to what I was saying. His eyes were constantly flickering over to my mom, who was standing at the phone in the kitchen area around five meters away from us. The whole thing felt very weird to me. She eventually got through to my stepdad and, still smiling, said something along the lines of, Darling, Andrew is here. Yes, here, in the living room. Yes. Yes. He said he's waiting for you. You won't be long, will you? 
My stepdad was home within 20 minutes and convinced Andrew to leave, with the promises they could speak on the phone the following day. I found out years later that my mother, stepfather, and the rest of their friends along with Vivian's parents and brothers all strongly suspected that Andrew had murdered Vivian. My siblings and I didn't attend the funeral, but I later discovered that a police presence was needed at Vivian's funeral. Vivian's brothers were so angry that there were concerns they may assault Andrew as they were convinced he had murdered her. That's how intensely people suspected him. My mom was utterly terrified when he showed up at our door that night, but she had been desperately trying both not to antagonize him, nor to frighten me. It transpired that he had been interviewed by the police earlier that day. It was clear they were building a case against him. He wanted legal advice and potential representation from my stepfather, who, may I add, refused. According to my mom, Vivian and Andrew had been having marital problems for a long time. Vivian had confided in my mom that she had felt increasingly uncomfortable around him, that his temper could be frightening for both her and their children. They were already sleeping in separate bedrooms, but he didn't seem to be accepting that the marriage was all but over. The previous weekend, she had told my mom and others that she was planning to officially leave him. She was going to be making it clear to him that it was over too. She was bludgeoned to death with a steel rod in her bedroom on Valentine's Day. She had just returned home from dropping her boys off at school, having supposedly interrupted a burglary, though the police immediately realized that this was obviously staged. The contents of the drawers from the bedside tables and chest of drawers had been emptied out into piles on the floor, but there was no indication that these piles had been sifted through. There were no signs of forced entry and nothing was stolen. My mom believes that she had potentially rejected some form of romantic gesture, and he snapped. However, there was blood on the piles of drawer contents, yet no blood on the floor underneath. That suggests that the burglary may have been staged before she even returned home that morning. Andrew tried to cover up his crime by deliberately driving to a series of shops and obtaining receipts for small purchases and making inquiries with cashiers, all to build an alibi. He also originally claimed that he had visited a large shopping mall on the day of the murder, that he walked around there for quite some time. But two weeks later, he changed his story. He said he'd actually been at a very popular local nature reserve, walking around and reading a book. Conveniently, there is no CCTV in any part of that nature reserve, and that includes the car park. He wasn't seen by any of the walkers in the area. He had come to our house that evening after admitting earlier that day that he had initially lied about his whereabouts to the police. He was arrested soon after. Andrew has never admitted to the murder and was found guilty on circumstantial evidence. He was sentenced to 21 years with a minimum term of 16 years, meaning he may already be out on parole. I can't find any information about that online, however, and I don't want to ask my mom about it as I don't want to drag up any awful memories for her. Oh, and a few years later, Andrew also went through the phase of writing letters to my younger brother from prison, protesting his innocence. My brother would have been around 11 to 12 years old at that stage. It was all just creepy. So in November of 2016, I went through a pretty bad breakup. In October of 2017, I finally felt comfortable enough to try to get back into the dating world, so like a moron, I got on Tinder. It wasn't my first rodeo on Tinder, but this was the strangest thing to happen to me. So towards the end of October, I met a guy named Dave on Tinder, and from the looks of it, he was an okay guy. He was funny and a gentleman, didn't ask for anything inappropriate, and it seemed fine. We talked for about two weeks and set up a time to go on a date. We decided to meet in the city where he'd recently moved to, which was about 35 minutes away from my house. I got to the bar to wait for him and he was about 15 minutes late. He walked in and looked relatively similar to his pictures, which I was happy about. And then he opened his mouth to talk, and he had a very strange voice, like he was always on the verge of crying. It was very weird. He had some tattoos on his arms, including the all-seeing eye Illuminati symbol. Trying to break the tension, I jokingly said, Illuminati confirmed, tell me your secrets. He says, 
What the hell are you talking about? Don't say that kind of stuff in public. I just kind of laughed it off and he was being weird. He then said, You know that people who pry are people who die. I just looked at him and I genuinely didn't know how to respond. Fast forward about 20 minutes and a couple of my friends came to the bar at my urging. I moved to sit on the same side as him so my friends could sit on the same side of the booth. The minute I sit down, he puts his hand on my knee and squeezes. And not like the, oh, I'm interested way, but a hard fucking squeeze. I looked at him to stop and he leans over and whispers, you have lovely kneecaps. By the time my friends left, he had had seven beers. It was a Tuesday. As I go to close my tap, he stands behind me. It was noticeable he was at full mass. I very quickly signed my receipt and stepped away. As I'm getting ready to say goodbye, it starts raining. He then informs me that he walked to the bar from his house and asks for a ride home. Reluctantly, I agreed. And on this very short drive to his house... He informs me that it's not actually his house. He's living in his sister's basement. When I finally park in front of his house, he leans over to kiss me. I try to give him the cheek, but he physically turned my head and puts his entire tongue in my mouth. I pulled away and this guy did it again. I finally managed to pull away and said, Get the fuck out of my car. He responds with, I am in love with you. I knew from the moment I saw your pictures. You have to come inside and meet my sister and her husband. I told him if he didn't get out of my car, I was calling the police. He started tearing up and got out of my car. When I was in high school, I lived in a really small town in Texas. It was a kind of place where everyone was either related to each other or hated each other. I had no family there, so yeah. But I did have a pretty blonde girlfriend and was pretty hated for that too. Nothing major, just petty harassment, occasional fights, but it had been escalating. So, that's why on Valentine's Day, my girlfriend and I decided to skip the school dance and just stay in and watch a movie at her house while her parents were out. It was just better to avoid trouble. We borrowed her dad's car, a little Honda hatchback, and we went to town. We stopped at the video store for a movie and went to the Dairy Queen for some ice cream, and then we headed home. Now, she lives in the complete boonies, out in the middle of the woods along a lonely road with no street lights. We're chatting, eating our blizzards when all of a sudden a car comes up behind us. No big deal. What was a very big deal was when the headlights flooded the interior of our car. I saw two hands on the back seat, and a head coming from the hatchback part of the car. As soon as the lights hit, the head and hands retreated back down. A solid chill ran through the entire length of my body. I slowly reached down and pulled out my pocket knife. She saw me and asked what was wrong. Loudly I said, Nothing. I just have to stop at a friend's house real quick. She knew that was bullshit. I didn't have any friends. I pulled over at the next house that came up and jumped out of the car yelling at her to jump out too. She jumped out in total confusion. I flipped the driver's seat forward and lunged into the back seat in full maniac mode. He popped up like a jack-in-the-box with empty hands waving. Hey, hey, hey. Hey, uh, what are you all up to tonight? It was some weird kid from our high school who we had never in our entire lives spoken to before. Ever. I said... What the holy fuck are you doing in our car? His reply was, I thought you guys were going to the dance and I was just hitching a ride. We sat there staring at him with our mouths wide open, wondering what to do. He tried to act real cool and obviously we were in the middle of nowhere, in some random person's driveway. So whatever he was planning was forgotten. We actually ended up driving him to the dance and dropping him off. The whole time he's telling us to come inside with him. Yeah, no. We dropped his ass off and noped out of there as soon as we could. As soon as he got out of the car, my girlfriend started crying and shaking. She was so freaked out. I have no idea what he was trying to do when the lights caught him crying out of the hatchback. I hated that high school.
I've been working at this small bank for almost a year. It'll be a year in July. Ever since the beginning, this customer has been obsessed with me and it recently escalated. Up until February of this year, he's been mildly harmless, mainly just asking my co-workers if I'm single or if I'm interested in him. Even after hearing I have a significant other, he did not let up. He would come in at least three to four times a week just to withdraw money from his account. At this time, I also had a second job at an animal shelter. I stupidly told him this. One day, after asking if we had a certain dog, he then gave me his number to send him pictures of the dogs we had there, which prompted me to tell him that we had a website. He just brushed that off and left. Needless to say, I never sent him any pictures, but he did keep asking until I told him it was against our policy to do so. Pretty harmless at this point, right? Well, around January, he spots my manager in a Walmart. He stops her and asks. Even though she's engaged, I see a connection in her eyes, and I know she knows we have a connection. Should I stop pursuing her? My manager told him he should stop. Mind you, he's been told by my other co-workers that I was not interested and engaged multiple times at this point, so I'm thinking it's all done. But comes Valentine's Day, I get a single rose with a small note saying, Hope your day is great. Secret admirer. He called about twice that day to see if I received the rose with the note. He was told that I did not. Then a week later, he walks in and hands me an envelope with the words, Do not bend. He said it was an engagement present, which I politely declined, but he insisted. It was a signed picture of some 49er. I'm not a football fan. For the next couple of months, he's pretty quiet about things, but he was still asking when I wasn't around. He would circle the building, I'm assuming to look for my car. I now have to park in a parking lot two streets over. Everything was quiet up until about two weeks ago. He comes in to get money, and I unfortunately have to help him. When I go to hand him his money, he grasps my hand as I'm handing it to him, and just smiles and leaves. I don't say anything due to just being in shock. Then last Friday was the breaking point. Just not by this point, we already know what his handwriting looks like. I come back from lunch to a bouquet of flowers with a note sitting on my desk. It was a pretty long note. It was creepy to say the least. Yesterday he walks in and I was told by our HR department that I needed to tell him to stop. But when he came in, I just couldn't. I didn't want to make him mad because I watched too much Dateline and Criminal Minds, but my manager did and he just said it wasn't him. He then goes home to tell his father, who then proceeded to yell at my manager. Needless to say, I think this will be the last time I see or hear from him, because they said they would be closing their accounts. It turned out they didn't come to the branch, nor did they call us to have their accounts closed. In the past two days, we've been gathering statements from the rest of my co-workers about what he said. I haven't gone to the police about this yet, because I don't believe him to be a danger just yet, but also I don't have substantial evidence that it's him. Although the handwriting is his, I never saw him physically write the note. It would eventually come down to his word against mine. Our HR department isn't entirely helpful for anything either, but at least my manager and the rest of the staff have my back. I haven't gotten much sleep since Friday, and last night I had a pretty mild panic attack. I cannot help but put some blame on myself for this, but I know I've done nothing to provoke him. I just can't shake that feeling. My father had been dating this girl for a while, and things were going great. She met us a few times and got along great with my sister and I. Eventually, my father asked her to move in with us. She drove seven hours to move in and brought her two cats. Things were great for the first two months, until she couldn't find a job. They had agreed that she was to apply for jobs and have one secured for an interview before she moved in. She moved in on July 2nd. She didn't have a job until late January. I, being fresh out of high school with no experience in a job setting, was able to get a job before her. This caused my father to have to cover her car payments and insurance. This set us back financially, but we were okay. 
Then October came with the discovery of a full year's worth of text messages between her and a friend of hers named Jared, all taking place after my father and her were dating, and all while she was still living in her hometown. These messages were laced with him coming over and giving her nighttime lovings, and followed with inappropriate pictures. My father confronted her about it, and she denied it, saying that we just didn't understand her friendships. My father lets it go as they haven't messaged each other in weeks. Small arguments pop up and she starts sneaking money out of my dad's wallet at night to go and buy cigarettes. This may only sound like a small amount, but it was a nightly occurrence. This set us back financially as well. These arguments mainly consist of her lying about something and not admitting it, or her doing something stupid and not apologizing. Things got worse as Christmas came. My father expressed that he didn't love her anymore, he didn't have any feelings towards her and that she needed to work to fix a relationship if she wanted to continue. This meant really trying to get a job and not lying about stupid shit. She agreed she would. I advised him against giving her the option. I was tired of her shit and wanted her out. She started lying more and more and causing more problems. We believed she started taking some sort of drug as she would come back from a drive all shaky and spazzing out spouting nothing but nonsense. She came after myself and a friend of mine during one of their arguments, to which my father responded, Pack your shit and get the fuck out. How dare you go after my kids, you bitch. Telling her to get out and leave was a regular occurrence in their fights, but she never took the hint. She was abusive emotionally to everyone in the household, and especially my father, reducing him to tears when he found out she'd been receiving $1,000 a month from her mother which would have had us staying up to date on rent payments. We have no idea what she did with the money. No matter the situation, she would try to twist it so she would be the victim, even calling my father asking second opinions the party of the persecuting Martha. Nothing is ever her fault, and it's always a misunderstanding. And she started smoking in the garage. The door from the garage into the house is right across from my bedroom door, which is always open because our cats like sleeping on my bed with me. I have asthma. I woke up coughing and smelling cigarettes multiple times in one night because of her. She drove recklessly with my little sister and I in the car before. I told my father what happened. When my father confronted her on it, she said I was over-exaggerating, that driving in the dark freaks her out, that my sister and I, in our, it's too early for this and I want to sleep and listen to my earbuds stink were stressing her out. A minor thing, but she endangered my sister and my own cats. We have two strictly indoor cats, and her two were outdoor cats until they moved here. Her cats have taught mine how to sneak out of the house when the front door isn't latched. She leaves the front door open constantly when she comes back in from smoking, and then my cats get out. We live right across the street from a huge lot of desert, and we hear coyotes every single night. She lets my cats get out at night. After she finally got a job, she did not want to contribute to her fair share of bills. My father asked her for half of her paychecks every two weeks. She claimed it should only be 25% because there are four people in the house. My sister and I are only there on the weekends as we go to school outside of town. We stay with other family during that time. She also apparently wasn't paying her car payments after she got her job as she received a repossession notice, which she hid from my father. Finally, after financially wrecking us, abusing my father emotionally and financially, endangering myself and my sister, doing drugs, taking money, stealing things from my room, endangering my cats and many other things, my father gave her two weeks to move out. She moved out yesterday, and all I have to say to her is, Let's not meet again, because I will not be nice like I had to be before. Lots of hate, the daughter of the man you broke. I am a big fan of tea and cookies, and the convenience store near my house sells them. On the way back from other stuff we were doing, I asked my mom to stop there so I can buy some. I'm a regular at the store, and by that, I mean I go there almost every day since 2017, and I had never seen this man before. 
I just walk past him, but he stops me and points to the entrance to this door, asking if that's the entrance. I tell him yes and keep walking towards it, but he keeps walking besides me and says something in another language. I thought it was Romanian since I kind of recognized some words in that language, but he told me it was Bulgarian. At this point, I'm already a bit creeped out by him, because I am generally scared of everyone, but in that moment, I just thought he needed help translating, so I was trying to calm myself down. As soon as we enter the store, he grabs my arm and pulls me closer to him. I am just screaming inside of my head, but I keep calm. I power walk inside and try to get rid of him, and when he asks me a question about bread, I just kind of try to understand what he said, since I'm still thinking he needs help. But at the same time, I'm scared. I just want to go back home. I try to lose him through the aisles of the store, but he keeps following me. I was scared of asking people for help because, like I said, I'm generally scared of everyone. He then grabs me and starts touching my face, saying, Beautiful. Very beautiful. Young. All in Italian. And then he tries to take off my mask. I just start running for my life at that point. I get my cookies and go home. I told my mom about it and she said I should have told her earlier so we could have confronted him. But honestly, I just wanted to go home. Tomorrow I'm bringing something with me to make me feel more secure. I'll go back there to tell whoever works there to keep an eye out for this guy, since I don't want this to happen to anyone else. You may think some of the things I did were dumb, and I completely agree with you, but I was very scared and I barely even look at strangers. This was a completely new experience to me. This incident happened about five years ago. This is a story that I never really tell anyone, because most people are either uncomfortable hearing it, or make well-meaning comments about what I should have done in the situation, without really understanding how differently your mind works when you're experiencing absolute panic. But you guys seem to get it. So here's my story. I was living in a relatively nice apartment in downtown Memphis, working as an ophthalmic technician. I arrived home from work at my usual time, around 4.30pm, unlocked my door and went inside. I set my phone, wallet and keys on the kitchen island, hearing my heavy metal front door swing shut loudly behind me, and I began taking care of some errands around the house. Having grown up in a small town, it was a habit for me not to lock my door during the day especially when I knew my husband would be home soon anyway. I've never forgotten to lock my door once in the five years since this day. I walked through the bathroom and into my large walk-in closet and began hanging up the laundry I'd started earlier in the day before work. My front door opened and I smiled with surprise. My husband was home a bit early and I happily called out to him. I'm in here, love. I was met with silence. I slowly began to feel the sinking feeling of Something is wrong, crawl up my spine. I tried to shake it off, thinking my husband simply hadn't heard me. I walked out into the living room kitchen area. Standing on the other side of my kitchen island was a complete stranger. He was a male, older than me. I would estimate 50s, but it's hard for me to recall exact facial features or details from this moment. He was just standing there, staring at me. No ski mask, no weapon. He was just watching me. I wondered if he maybe walked into the wrong apartment and was going to apologize and leave. But as he continued to stare, I realized I needed to do something other than just gape at this stranger in my house. I stood taller, puffed up my chest in an attempt to look more threatening, and used a loud, clear voice, telling him to get out of my apartment, that he had no business being here. He completely ignored me like I hadn't spoken. Then he began to pick up my things. My cell phone, my keys, my wallet. He picked them up methodically and put them in his own pockets. That's when it truly hit me that this person was dangerous. I was naive enough to believe this was all a mistake until that moment. I darted forward toward the only other device I had that would allow me to get help. My computer. I had to take a few steps closer to the intruder in order to reach it but I still had about 12 to 15 feet between us. I knew I could grab it and run before he could reach me. As I picked it up and turned to run, I saw him start to move after me. I sprinted back toward the bathroom because it was the only place I could go and put two locked doors between us, my bathroom door and the closet door. 
I slammed and locked the first door, and within seconds I could hear him messing with it, trying to open it. I ran into the closet and locked that door too, opening my computer and getting on Facebook Messenger to contact my husband. I sent message after message, pleading with him to call 911, telling him that there was an intruder in the apartment. He got the messages within minutes and assured me that he had a dispatcher on the phone, that he was leaving work himself to try and get to me if he could. I waited, and waited. The bathroom door opened. The intruder came inside. He moved to the closet door and started trying to break that door down too. Here's the part where people usually start giving me advice on how I should have acted, but all I can tell you is that I was frozen. With fear. With shock. I don't know, but I didn't scream or cry, or even search for a weapon in that dark closet. I didn't brace the door or try to hold it closed. I just kneeled on my chest and waited to die, because I just knew that's what was going to happen. People like to tell me that I lived in an apartment. Surely if I screamed, someone would have heard and come to help me. Surely that there was something heavy enough in my closet to use to defend myself. Hell, even the laptop would have heard if I swung it at someone. Why didn't I do anything? I don't really have an answer for that. But the closet door miraculously held. I heard frustrated footsteps go back out into the living area of my apartment. I heard things breaking, bottles shattering, my drawers and refrigerator and cabinets being flung open as things were torn out of them. I continued to sit in that closet, silently crying, wanting to leave but feeling that death was inevitable. I feel awful about my selfishness in that moment, but I messaged my mom who lived a 15 hours drive away, and told her what was happening. I desperately wanted comfort. I wanted to tell her how much I loved her. I'm not a parent, but I can only imagine the fear and helplessness I put her through, knowing her daughter was in danger and that there was nothing she could do to help. She messaged me constantly, begging me to keep replying. I told her I would as long as I could, but I also told her to tell my brothers I loved them to help my husband through whatever happened next if it ended badly for me. The intruder started messing with the closet door again, mumbling disjointed words that I couldn't really distinguish. I remember hoping that the police would get to the apartment before my husband, and he wouldn't be the one to find me in whatever state the invader left me in. The front door opened again, and it was my husband shouting for me. The intruder walked out toward the living room kitchen area. I opened the door, darted from the closet to find my husband on the ground with them, pinning him in place. The man kept mumbling and at times yelling, but he never really put up much resistance. This entire part is a blur for me. I remember feeling like the room was spinning, filled with fear, mostly for my husband at this point. Eventually the police found the apartment. It took them about 25 minutes to arrive, which still blows my mind. I know time seems to move slowly during scary situations, so I thought it was less than that. But from the time my husband dialed 911 to the time the officers arrived, it was 25 excruciating minutes. This isn't intended to bash them in any way, it just always seemed like this was an unusually long response time for a home invasion. They got my things back from the man and took him out of my apartment. I numbly went through the process of filing a police report, telling them what happened. One of the officers commented that I should really keep my door locked at all times. I remember feeling like he was being insensitive at the time, or blaming me for what happened, but later recognized his words were coming from experience. I'm sure he's seen this situation end differently for other women. Within 30 minutes, the scariest incident of my life was over, but I've carried the fear, the violation, the anxiety of having someone intrude into my space for years. It happened to me once. It could happen again. If this or something similar happened to you, and you're struggling with the aftermath of it, the sleepless nights, the laying awake listening for sounds of forced entry, the nightmares, the constant checking and rechecking your locks, this is what eventually helped me. A year after this took place, my husband and I moved to the Midwest for his job. We selected a safe town with a nice apartment complex. We chose a third floor apartment with only one point of entry. I looked up every statistic on crime for the neighborhood, finding that an isolated incident of car theft was the only thing reported in decades. I still couldn't sleep at night. 
It was definitely better than staying in the same apartment in Memphis, but my husband often worked night shifts now. I simply couldn't continue being terrified to sleep at night. I realized that my biggest fear was that something could happen again, but that if it did, I was just as unprepared now as I was then. I hadn't changed anything. I knew I would likely freeze up again and leave my life up to being able to hide well enough, or having a door hold long enough to save me. And that was unacceptable. I walked into a martial arts school with an excellent self-defense program. I introduced myself and started taking classes. At first, I was a bit quiet, hiding in the back of the room and generally keeping to myself. My instructor, who was both incredibly kind and incredibly insightful, slowly built up my confidence and brought me out of my bubble of fear. After several months of training, I finally shared my reason for taking classes with him. He's worked with me tirelessly to give me the ability to protect myself in any environment. I've been training for years now, and the difference it's made in every aspect of my life is unbelievable. That meek, quiet girl that waited to die in her closet doesn't exist. I am confident. I am strong. I am worthy of living and protecting myself in my home. I no longer am ashamed of how I handled the situation I was in, but I also understand what steps I can take to ensure I'm safe. It wasn't easy, and it didn't happen overnight, but it was worth it. I recognize this might not be an option or solution for everyone. Your experience is valid, and however you decide to cope with your own story is the right choice for you. This is how I happen to do it, and it's all worked out well for me. Thank you again for listening. Stay safe out there. For a bit of quick backstory, I work at a gas station on a main route. We see a lot of travelers passing through. Only one person works each shift, and it's a 24-hour store. We are short-staffed, so I agreed to an overnight. I'm a female, by the way. I work in a state that's always had self-serve gas stations. So this guy comes in, and I ask if he needed any help. He says no. He's getting gas at the pump, but needs to use the bathroom. I go back to work on whatever invoices we got yesterday. The guy uses the bathroom and then goes back outside. About five to seven minutes later, he comes back inside and tells me he's confused about the pump. He directly says, you might have to come outside to help me. Customers don't often say this. They usually complain that it's not working, so I'm already feeling weird about this guy. I shake it off because he looks like a nerd and I don't really feel afraid of him. I look at the register to see what error it came up with for his pump, and there's no errors. The register didn't even say it was in use. Even if someone tries to pay and nothing's wrong with their payment, it will at least say, payment or loyalty timed out, but it had no sign of him trying to use it before asking me for help. I ask him if he just wants to pay inside. He agrees. He goes to get his wallet out of his car and then pays $10. I give him his receipt and he says, can you help me? I don't understand the machine. I say, we aren't really allowed to leave the store during overnight shifts, as it's just me here and it's not safe to go outside. He proceeds to say, I don't understand what it's asking me. I need help. I'm not scary. I tell him again that I can't go outside. It's a store policy for the overnight shift. I say, it's not that you're scary. I just can't go outside. I would have to tell a little old lady asking for help at this hour the same thing. That is true. We can't even take out the trash during overnights. He starts to walk away from the register counter now, but then again stops at the door and asks me one last time to come outside and help him. I'm pretty annoyed at this point. I've said no twice now. I'm not going, so stop asking. I finally say in a super annoyed tone, Okay, all you need to do is one pick up the nozzle, two, select fuel grate button, and three, put it in your tank and squeeze the handle. I'm not going outside. And he finally goes back to the car and the register tells me he had no trouble pumping gas. His plates seem like they were from the state I work in. This kind of thing would make me suspicious usually, but the fact that he originally opted for me to go outside instead of bringing money inside at 3am is weird. 
along with how he didn't bother to use the pump before he came inside to ask for help, claiming it wasn't working and him not taking my first no for an answer. No means no. This wasn't an encounter with a person, but something I found with my kid in the woods. Hair. Like 20 inches of human hair in the campfire ring. I spotted it right away because it was so unusual to see. It wasn't burnt, but carefully put under three or four medium-sized rocks. I moved the rocks and used a big stick to investigate, hoping I wouldn't see scalp or skin included, hoping it was a wig and someone thought it would be funny. No. Blonde hair with a washed out blue dye about halfway through it. I tried to turn it over using the stick as much as I could, making sure it wasn't attached to scalp or worse. And it smelled rotten, like decay. It was the absolute creepiest shit I've come across in the woods. So unsettling that I did report it to the sheriff's department, because I felt someone with authority should know. I talked to a deputy and sent him the pictures we took, with the detailed instructions to get to the campsite. There's been no follow-up so far, but it totally ruined our Sunday drive. I don't know if someone was shaving their head and howling at the moon in the woods or what, but it was disturbing for sure. This happened to me a few years ago in springtime. I was geocaching by myself, as I usually do. I had chosen one that was along a long, abandoned and ripped up railway, near some residences and a converted factory. Basically this pathway ran between the two of them. It was still pretty wooded and you couldn't see the houses or much of the factory from the path. I found the cache and signed it, cleaned it up a bit and put it back. It was a pretty bright late spring day, maybe late April to early May. As I stepped from the brushy area the cache was in back onto the path. I looked to my right, where I had come from, and saw a man coming toward me. He was carrying a rifle and was about 200 feet away. Luckily he was looking off to the side and didn't see me, so I stepped back off the path and around a large bush that the cache was hidden behind. I was at this point about 15 to 20 feet away from the path. I waited and watched the area of the path I could see. He walked by looking from left to right, not fast or slow just walking. He held the rifle in his left hand. He didn't see me because I was somewhat behind the bush and back. I waited what I felt like was long enough to let him get a ways down the path before cautiously emerging. Looking in the direction he'd gone to assure he was no longer in sight, I ran in the opposite direction to my car. I know it definitely was not any type of hunting season because my ex was a hunter, so I know when they are, and it was far too close to the houses to shoot a firearm. But it hasn't stopped me from cashing alone, though. It was about 2000 or 2001. My best friend and I were 12 to 13 years old. We lived in a small town in rural Minnesota of about 2,000 people. Out of our friend group, her and I were the only two that lived out in the country so we understood the boredom that could ensue, but also the fun things that would come out of it. Exploring the woods, running around in the cornfields, creating forts, exploring the abandoned house on our property, that kind of thing. It was a really fun time for us. One day, we decided to take our bikes and ride down some gravel roads. Her little brother tagged along. We were riding along, laughing, probably picking on her brother, when we see an old shack in one of the cornfields. The corn wasn't fully grown, so we were able to see most of it. We decided to explore it, because why not? I'm now 33, so bear with my memory. I don't remember much about the outside, but I do remember what I saw inside, and it still gives me the creeps to this day. We peered inside, and the first thing I noticed were posters on the wall of the room. They were on every wall, there was a different person on every poster, and they looked angry. Some held guns pointed right at you. Some were pointing their finger, and it felt like they were pointing right at us, with their eyes trained on us. 
In the center of the floor was a perfectly painted red circle. My friend and I remembers a star in the middle, but her brother just remembers a circle. As we're staring at this creepy scene, I feel like we're being watched, and not by the posters. I look to my right across the gravel road and into the cornfield across from us. Standing in the middle of the field is a man. He's just watching us. He's not waving his arms or yelling at us, just watching. I alert my friends and we look at him together. I awkwardly wave and he continues to just stand there. He didn't wave back. We are sufficiently creeped out, so we just jump on our bikes to get away. We are on gravel, which isn't easy to bike on, so it's taking us a while to get going. We bike away and I repeatedly turn around to see if he's still there. And he still is, watching us. He barely moved and only turned his body slightly to angle in our direction so he could keep watching us. I still can't get over how he just appeared in the middle of a field like that. Recently I've been thinking of this, so my friend, her brother and I started a group chat. We all shared what we remembered, and they basically said everything I did. What I don't know was that they went back the next day, and everything was gone, even the red paint on the floor. A week later, whoever owned it donated it to the fire department to be burned down. I don't know what was going on in that shack. Some thoughts have been weird rituals, target practice for some weird militia guy, or just some weird creepy guy who has poor taste and decor. Whatever it was, it still haunts me to this day. This happened close to 20 years ago. I was visiting my parents at their house for a week sometime in the late spring to early summer. One morning, my mom woke me up and asked me to come out to the front yard to look at something. Her tone tipped me off to the fact that she was unnerved by whatever it was she found. She was standing at the end of our sidewalk when I joined her, where she pointed to something where the sidewalk abutted the driveway. Is that what I think it is? It was a trail of dried blood. I could see a few spatters of blood trailing out into the unpaved driveway, but they were hard to discern against the reddish clay and the sand of the driveway. I soon lost the trail. Although the general trajectory was toward the road in front of the house, the other end of the trail led down where the sidewalk turned to run toward the gate between the house and the garage. Enough blood had been lost for there to be large splotches visible on the liriope that borders the sidewalk, as well as on the small patch of lawn between the sidewalk and the north side of the house. The trail led to the holly hedge that grows next to the house. Some of the branches on one of the bushes were bent and broken. The leaves smeared with blood, as was the side of the house behind the holly bush, and there was a sizable stain on the soil beneath it. The ivy on the fence next to the bush was also spattered, with some leaves entirely coated with blood. For context, my parents' house is in a small town. The house and garage are separate structures, with an ivy-coated chain-link fence running between the house and garage to separate the front yard from the back. The lot faces the main north-south road through the town, while behind the lot is a street that runs north between their lot and the neighbor's house. Then it makes a sharp turn to the west, away from my parents' yard. Following that street leads you to another neighborhood on the right, while the left side of the street is bordered by a heavily wooded area that eventually connects with a large swathe of mostly unpopulated forest and swamp. For the amount of blood by the holly, we judged that someone had been hidden there for a while. Some of the ivy was pulled away from the fence between the house and garage, so it was clear this person had climbed over the fence. From there, the trail became much more clear as it went across the concrete patio between the house and garage. There's a window AC unit sticking out from the window just past the fence. And on the other side of it, there was much more blood drying in a pool on the patio, as well as more smears higher up on the wall of the house. Again, it looked like the person had hidden there for a while behind the AC unit. And by this point, we were certain that it was a person and not an animal, partly because of the sheer amount of blood and partly because the smears on the side of the house were higher up, as if a person had leaned against the house with blood on their hands or upper body. The trail then picked up again, but with smaller spatters as if they had managed to control the bleeding somewhat. 
The track went across the patio out into the backyard, where it was difficult to follow through the grass. At the far back fence, some of the honeysuckle vines that grew over the fence had been pulled, and the fence itself was bent, as if someone had climbed over it there. And again, there were some smears of blood on the vines. From there, the trail ran out into the street behind my parents' house, where it became nearly impossible to follow. It was pretty clear that someone had been injured and was trying to hide, which implied that someone else had caused the injury and was looking for them. Whatever the injury was, it must have been fairly serious because they lost quite a bit of blood in my parents' yard alone. They had come down the driveway from the main road, and they clearly knew they could cut through the yard to reach the back street in the neighborhood of the forest beyond. My dad asked the night security at the local school if he'd heard anything on the police scanners that night about anything weird going on but the guard hadn't heard anything. My mom told me a few days later that the neighbor who lives on the street behind them told her that he'd had insomnia that night. He heard someone running down the street at 3 a.m. He'd also seen a dark truck make several slow passes up and down the street. I'd asked my parents if they wanted to call the police to report whatever this was. They were both in their late 60s at the time, and I worried about them being alone while they were creepy things presumably that were involving violence, that were clearly going on right outside their house. My mom declined, not only because there was nothing the police could do, but also because she was worried the police might have been involved somehow with what happened. The local cops had a reputation for being corrupt, so she didn't want to have any sort of involvement. So, I took the hose and scrub brush and did my best to wash away any traces of whatever it was that had happened the previous night. Needless to say, I did not sleep well for the remainder of that trip home, nor on subsequent visits. It was kind of like being in a house in a slasher film. Not the house where actual violence takes place, but the one down the street where the hero or heroine of the movie runs and hides outside, whilst being pursued by the killer. We were the neighbors that found out the next morning, off screen, that something bad was happening just outside while they slept. Definitely a creepy feeling and much closer than I ever want to be to that kind of situation. I have two stories, so here's the first one. For some context, my boyfriend's family farms on both sides of Iowa and Missouri border, since they live fairly close to the state line. They have corn, soybeans, and beef cattle on pasture. I particularly love the cattle, because I love getting to jump in the ranger and ride around the pasture with my boyfriend to check on the cows. We do this almost every night in the spring, summer, and fall to make sure they are healthy, not injured, account for the calves, make sure they have enough grass, and look to see if there are any holes or breaks in the fences. In the wintertime, they get moved to a lot with a covered shed to protect them from the elements so they are not on the pasture and we have to feed them hay. Anyway, in the mid-2000s, my father-in-law was out in the wooded area of the cattle pasture. The trees are quite dense here, and it often serves as a great deer hunting spot in the late fall to winter once the cows have been moved into the winter lot. He was setting up trail cameras in the woods to watch deer in preparation for hunting season that fall. After some time, he came back out to get the cart out of the camera to see if there are any bucks roaming around. When he took a look at some of the pictures, he saw that there had been an unusual man back there. Trespassers aren't all that uncommon, and it's often just an annoyance rather than cause for concern. There was no way to tell who it was, so he just forgot about it. A few days later, he went back to hang the camera back up in the tree. When my father-in-law went back a second time, about a week later to get the camera to see the pictures, someone had dug three makeshift graves in the back corner of the pasture. At the head of each grave was a wooden cross with a first name on it. He unfortunately didn't catch the man on the trail camera, but he did alert the police about the situation. I think based on the names on the crosses, the police had an idea of who it could have been. The rural Midwest is smaller than you think for being so vast. My father-in-law wasn't really sure of what came of that, and he never asked much into it. But if he hadn't discovered those graves in the pasture and told the police... They might have been filled. And now on to the second story. 
My father-in-law had some farms in Missouri that were bordered by the Missouri River. The Missouri River flows down through the Dakotas, along the Iowa-Nebraska border, and then at Kansas City it takes a turn and divides the state of Missouri in two, until it reaches Mississippi. One spring in the late 1990s, he was out in a field next to the Missouri River, planting some corn. This was before all the current high-tech tools that farmers have at their disposal now. He thought that his planter was having some issues, so he jumped out to check to see if something was broken. When he got out of the tractor, he noticed a really strange smell. A bad smell. If you know anything about farming, planting season is fast-paced time to try to beat the weather, and he was more concerned about getting his crop planted than investigating. He just assumed it was a dead deer washed up in the river, and he continued on until he thought the planter was having problems again a few hours later. This time, he was on the end of the field closer to the river. The smell was stronger and unlike anything he had experienced before. They continued on that day working until one of the hired men asked if anyone noticed the bizarre smell coming from the river. My father-in-law said he had, and wondered to them if it was a dead deer, but usually deer didn't smell quite like this. One of the hired men wandered across the field to the edge of the river to get a closer look. At the bottom, he saw what he thought was an animal tangled in the branches washed up by the river. Looking closer, he realized it was a person. They immediately called the police. It turns out, it was a missing woman who was a known prostitute from Kansas City. She made it this far downstream. I cannot find the exact article or name. And I don't even know if the police ever told my father-in-law her name, even though they briefly questioned him. But I do know there are a few articles of a woman being found in the river east of Kansas City in the late 1990s. This took place when I was about 14 to 15 years old. I would stay over at my best friend's house constantly. She's an only child and her mom would let us do anything, including leave their place by ourselves at one or two in the morning. I am surprised we're alive, because we were very trusting. We were get into a car with a group of teenage boys we just met trusting. So one night, we were hanging out at a guy's house. The plan originally was that we were going to stay the night there. His grandma ended up getting angry at him and told everyone to leave. It was about 1am and we had no other option than to walk to our house. We decided to cut through a used car dealership. The security guy spotted us and said we were trespassing. He asked us why we were out so late and where were we going. After hearing about what happened, he said, If a cop stops you, they won't believe that. You'll probably just get into trouble. We didn't have cell phones yet, so we asked if we could use his phone to call someone. My friend's mom is going through a rough patch financially, and she didn't have phone service. My mother would have killed us if we tried to call her, so we told them we have no one. The security guy offers to pay for us to stay in a motel for the night. This man was probably 30 to 35 years old. My friend was 14 and I was 15. Stupidly, we accepted his offer. So we both get into the back seat of his car, when he says, One of you could sit up front. So my best friend promptly jumps in the back, leaving me to sit up front. We stop by his back, then he headed to the nearest motel. The entire drive there, he was telling us that he was a war vet and got injured on tour, telling us he would kill for a massage. He asked if any of us were any good at massaging people, and we said no, not really. We finally get to the motel. This guy parks and tells us to stay in the car but not before he takes his handgun out of the holster and puts it in the glove box directly in front of me and locks it. He then goes to the office to pay for the room. He ended up asking if he could come up with us and if we could give him a massage as a thank you. We said no and booked it up the stairs. We deadbolted the door the second we got in there. We definitely didn't sleep that night. We were too creeped out. As soon as the sun came up, we got out of there. We walked a good hour and a half back to my friend's place. Twelve years later, I'm 26 just browsing Facebook, and I saw a news article about an army vet being arrested for abducting and assaulting two teenage girls. It was the same bald-headed security guy that picked me and my friend up. 
It was a very unsettling feeling, thinking of what could have happened. I don't remember how old I was, just that I was small enough to fit in the front baby seat of a grocery cart. That had put us in the very late 90s or early 2000s. I was grocery shopping with my mom at Costco. For those who don't know the chain, it's basically a huge warehouse where everything is sold in bulk. Food, clothes, books. It's basically a Walmart. But if Walmart sold cereal boxes in counts of threes or frozen dinners by the dozen, my mom has a habit of pulling her grocery cart down the one side of the aisle in stores, and then walking the length of the shelves, picking what she wants, and then coming back to the cart, dumping whatever she has in the basket. I don't get why she does it, but hey, moms do weird things. So I may be four or five, sitting in the front basket playing with my Game Boy Color, when she pulls over next to a fruit display in Costco. She tells me she's going to look at the different deals and to sit tight. I wasn't a very fidgety kid, so I said okay. She is gone for a couple of minutes. I'm absorbed in Pokemon. I don't really notice her walk up until the cart starts moving. Being a kid, I instinctively trust that she's the one pushing the cart. I was wrong. After a moment or two, I catch out of the corner of my vision her red nails. This is a problem because my mom never paints her nails and never ever wears them long. I look up. The lady pushing the cart is a bit older than my mother. Same curly black hair, but it was pulled into a ponytail at the nape of her neck. I still remember she had tanned Italian-type skin with thick red lips, a heavy coat of eyeliner, and brown eyes. She was pretty skinny. Her teeth were yellow, and she smelled like, what I didn't realize until later, bad B.O. This wasn't my mom, and I said so very loudly. She laughed and looked around and pushed the cart a little faster. I said it again and she looked me dead in the eyes and said, Oh sweetie, what game are you playing? I am your mom. So the way Costco is set up, at least ours, is that in the produce area instead of the aisles, they're more like islands. There are large square setups that you can see the entire length of the produce section if you walk in that area. So of course I can see my actual mother a few displays away. As loud as I could, I remember yelling, Mom, and watching her head whip around to look at me, right as this lady is trying to cover my mouth with her hand. I don't know if she decided then I wasn't worth it, because I was so noisy, or if it was looking at my mother charging from a few displays over, but this woman squeezed her hand around my little face once and then booked it. My mom comes running up to me and starts asking me a million questions at once. My little brain thinks all of a sudden that I'm in trouble for using my outdoor voice inside. She looks mad, but I start to cry. By the time she calmed me down, the lady was already gone, and reporting her to the head of security did shit. The store never found her inside, and the security cam footage showed her leaving, but never with anyone else. I don't know why she picked me, or what it would have been for. But I'm just glad my real mom ended up scaring her away and that nothing became of it. This night took place a few years ago. All my father and I were living in a small rural town in Alberta. I was fairly new in this town and didn't know anybody but my dad and co-workers. I had found a job as a key holder in a liquor store that closed every night at 2am. My store was located in between a pharmacy and a grocery store, a place well lit where I felt safe most nights, not knowing yet that this town was actually known for its drug problems and random creeps. This particular night, my coworker and I had been working late. We needed to finish unloading the pallets of liquor since we had another shipment coming in the next morning. At the end of the night, around 3.30am, I told my co-worker that she could leave and that I was going to take care of closing down the store. That meant counting the till and cleaning up, as she was exhausted and that I had the keys for the store anyway. After she left, I quickly finished my tasks, took all my stuff and called my father. At the time, I didn't have a car, and my dad would come pick me up every night and bring me back home. 
which was maybe about five to ten minutes drive to my workplace, I have an amazing father. In return, I always made sure to be ready and wait outside the store for his arrival. I didn't want him to have to wait for me, because I knew he didn't have much time left to sleep since he had work in the morning. I got ready to get out of the store, set out the security system and locked the door behind me. Now you have to understand that I wasn't supposed to finish this late at night, and that once the alarm system was on, I couldn't go back inside because the regional manager would receive a security call if I opened the door, and the alarm would automatically start to ring. I didn't have the code to shut it off since I never worked the morning shift yet. The store policy mentioned that if you forgot something inside, you'd have to wait until the next day to get it back. As I was waiting for my dad, standing in front of the store, I heard some noises coming from my left. It sounded like someone was breathing loudly. The pharmacy that was right next to my store I had these big red columns in the front of the entrance. I thought the noise was coming from around these columns. I looked to my left but didn't see anything, so I brushed it off thinking it was probably the wind or just my very tired self imagining stuff. It was almost 4am after all. I had worked really hard that evening. After a few minutes, I heard the noise again. I started getting nervous. It was definitely coming from my left. And this time, I knew that it was not in my head. At that moment, I noticed movement. I realized I was not alone. A few meters away, on my left, someone was crouched down behind one of the columns. I could not see his face, only his hands holding one side of the column while he was slowly moving his head to look in my direction. I was terrified, completely paralyzed with fear. I knew my father couldn't be very far away from the store at this point, so I grabbed my phone to call him. My dad answered and I told him to hurry up. I explained someone was hiding next to me and that I was petrified. My dad told me he was going as fast as he could and told me to grab the keys and get inside the store. I was trying to find them inside my bag, but I was panicking too much. My hands were shaking and I just couldn't find the keys for the life of me. I felt completely horrified when I realized that the man had stood up, still hiding behind one of the columns, only a few meters away from me. My voice filled with fear. I asked my dad where he was. He shouted that he was almost there. I started to slowly move towards the grocery store that was on my right, never turning my back to him. The very tall and imposing man looked at me again, but this time, he got out of his hiding spot and started to walk in my direction with the biggest smile on his face. I can still recall thinking that this was it. I was going to die. I was trying to decide if I should start running for my life or if it was better to face and fight him if need be. But suddenly, I heard a big noise coming from my right. I turned around and saw my dad driving as fast as he possibly could into the parking lot, honking and turning on his high beams. I believed to startle the man. My feet finally decided to move. I ran as fast as I could and jumped inside of my dad's pickup. Tears were coming out of my eyes. I watched this man looking straight up at us and slowly waving at my father for what felt like an eternity. But in reality, it was a few seconds. The creepy man started walking closer to us. And as he got closer, my father finally got a good look at the man and said, Oh my god, girl. I guess you haven't met Peter yet. I didn't understand. My dad started laughing, tears coming out of his eyes while I looked at him, still in complete shock. To me, there was absolutely nothing funny at that moment. A few seconds before, I thought my dad wouldn't get there fast enough, that I was going to be murdered right there in front of my workplace. My father waved back at him and we drove off slowly. On our way home, he explained that Peter was a very nice man, but he had a cognitive disability. He said that Peter lived in town, and that every morning he would sit inside the Tim Hortons that was located in the same parking lot as my store. He would ask people if they wanted a hug. He apparently did that every day, and everybody in our small town knew him. My dad told me I should give him a big hug the next time I want to get a coffee at Timmy's, since I probably scared the poor man to death. Hey guys, I hope you enjoyed that one. 
Do me a favor and like and comment. Let me know what you thought of the stories. Subscribe if you haven't and turn on notifications. I'd like to give a shout out to my YouTube members and patrons for supporting the channel. So a huge thanks to Sue, Absinthe Alice, Rochelle, Astara Ray, Carol, Blazed Goddess, Monique, Cal, Monica Levelace, Spider's Web, Emma, Sean Gorman, Misanthropia, Fluby, Ryan, Brenda, Rudy, Christina De La Rosa, Noosh, Lulu Rogers, Fire 05, Shan, Jody, Sarah P, Kathleen Fenton, James Gargano, Gemma Allen, Alex, and Courtney Maxwell. If you fancy checking out my Patreon, YouTube memberships, Reddit, or Twitter, all my links are in the description. Thanks for watching, guys. I hope you're all doing well. I'll see you in the next one.